2020 meeting of the Santa Barbara City Council. And we'll uh, start with our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call, please, Ms. Clerk. Certainly, Councilmember Jordan. Here. Councilmember Alejandro Gutierrez. Mayor Pro Tem Sneddon. Here. Councilmember Friedman. Here. Councilmember Harmon. Councilmember Here. Oscar Gutierrez. Present. Mayor Murillo. Here. Thank you. Mr. Casey, are there any changes to the agenda? No, Madam Mayor. We will go to public comment. These are this time period is for items that are not on the official agenda. So anything that's not on the agenda, we're here to hear what you have to say. We we'll have 30 minutes. Uh, people have three minutes. Ms. Clerk, is anyone raising their hand for Vox Populi? Yes, Madam Mayor, so far we have two people. We have Marge Caffarelli and Anna Marie Gott. If anyone else would like to speak on public comment, please raise your hand within the app and you can also um, send a message to me through the questions in the GoToWebinar and let me know you wish to speak on public comment. And I see Thanks, a couple Senator. more people raising, raising your hands. We will start with Marge Caffarelli. Thanks, and I'll invite my council members to come onto the screen. Thanks. Ms. Caffarelli. Marge Caffarelli, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mayor Murillo and members of the council and members of Santa Barbara City staff, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I wanted to just uh, reiterate how important uh, the closure of State Street and actually of our half block West Victoria has been not only for the businesses, but for the residents of Santa Barbara. I see now so many families downtown walking their dogs, kids uh, walking with their parents, uh, families, you know, strollers. It's, it's really a beautiful sight to see, and it's not something that you see happening just on the sidewalks. So I, I really think it has been incredibly powerful. And I think that this is a unique opportunity for each of you as council members and for city staff to look at how we can now reimagine downtown, not only with the street closure, uh, how we reimagine the streets, uh, bike lanes, et cetera, but also how do we reimagine the downtown? And I think using Paseo Nuevo as part of that equation, that's a 35 year old mall. It is, it is uh, completely outdated. And I believe that there are ways for you to really think in a, a very creative way to reimagine our downtown, not only for the residents of Santa Barbara, but also for people that come to visit us. And, um, you know, it's just a, a really unique opportunity that you have. I think that city staff can participate in this reimagination, but I also think that, that it's important to hire people that have done this in other communities, bring them in, Let's really think outside the box on this because I think you have a unique opportunity that will last the next 40 years. So thank you again for your time. Thank you. Some of your comments touched on uh, item nine, which is an, the update on the city's economic development efforts, but we'll, we're happy to hear you. It's, a, it's such a broad topic that um, that's fine, Ms. Caffarelli. Thank you for your, thank you for your input. Thank next you. speaker, please. Our next speaker is Anna Marie Gott. After Anna Marie Gott, Clay Holdren, Brett Folger, Mary O'Connor, and Laura Knight. Anna Marie Gott, please go ahead. 
Yesterday, I attended or virtually attended uh, the subcommittee for State Street. And I was horrified to learn during the meeting that we're going to be using Measure C funds for temporary string lights on State Street. We're also going to be using them for potted plants at the entry for intersections and to paint some green striping on the um, uh, on State Street. These are all temporary things. It doesn't appear when people voted for Measure C funding that they were going to actually be authorizing the use of the funds for items which are temporary in nature. And let me tell you how temporary these things are. Rob Dayton in the meeting said that the lighting that is going to be put up on State Street that they anticipate buying with $200,000 worth of Measure C funds will actually not be acceptable to the HLC. So whatever they approve today is going to be have to have to be replaced tomorrow. In a time period in which we have to worry about every single dollar and how it is spent, it is completely horrifying to hear about the mismanagement by our own city council who has decided that this money is perfectly fine um, to be used in this way. We are literally ripping up and burning up the money that we are collecting that is supposed to be used for capital improvements. Now, I want to remind you what we were supposed to be using this for is because the city had a lack of funding for streets and sidewalks and storm drains and other street related infrastructure. You know, this was supposed to be for critical systems of the community that, that we rely upon on a daily basis. We don't rely upon string lights on State Street. We do need lighting, but we have sufficient lighting. We also have lighting that we already have purchased that we wrap around trees for the holiday that provides additional lighting. That could simply be used all year round if you are that worried about lighting. I also want to remind you that that money is supposed to be used for a police station and a lot of other capital projects. I don't believe we should be using this money for these items. It, and you really need to go back and rethink this entire use of this money. And if we're going to be throwing it away on temporary projects that people don't even want versus sidewalks and streets. Thank you. Very good. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Clay Holdren, then Brett Folger, Mary O'Connor, then Laura Knight. Clay Holdren, please go ahead. Clay Holdren, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Thanks, you guys. I just want to talk about the promenade for a minute and how great it's been for everybody down there. Um, I've been in this town for my whole life we've been in the location we're in for 17 years and this decision to make a promenade has revitalized downtown um it's nice to see locals coming downtown again if you would have talked to me a year ago our block would have been a ghost town and i think the only thing that i've heard has been positive from everybody who's come to visit us. And uh, we haven't had any complaints. There's been a few random bikers, but other than that, everyone loves it. It's really nice to see. It's really nice to see all the people with their families coming down. Um, the changes have been nothing but great. And I would like to see it become permanent, um, give us some rules. And uh, I think it's a great thing for our town. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Brett Folger, then Mary O'Connor, then Laura Knight. Brett Folger, please go ahead. Good afternoon, Council. Um, I wanted to speak to you guys today quickly about two things. Um, first, 
about extending the application uh, deadline for the community formation commission to December 4th. Sure, and that's that's an item that's coming up on our agenda. Just, it's the very next one after the consent calendar. So please hold on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. I look forward Thanks. to hearing it. Thanks. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Mary O'Connor and then Laura Knight. Ms. O'Connor has indicated she wished to speak on an item but did not respond back to my question. So we'll check in with Ms. O'Connor, see which item she wished to speak on. And then it's Ms. Knight. Mary O'Connor, please go ahead. Hi there. So um, I decided I'd just use this time to speak on items that uh, aren't in the agenda. Um, I do just want to piggyback on the first comment. It's so incredibly irresponsible to use funds on literal decorations for downtown. That's simply something that is sounds a lot to me like another Santa Barbara way of drawing in tourists. That really does nothing to help residents. Uh, you know, the speaker really clearly explained what those funds are supposed to be used for and string lights on State Street is just really disturbing to hear. Also, it is really a just general theme of Santa Barbara tax dollars being spent on making this town more aesthetically pleasing when there's so many actual tangible things that need fixing and need updating. And um, this all ties in with um, just the general um, Santa Barbara tourism, how hard they've been going to get out of town visitors to come here by literally using phrases like Santa Barbara is open in reference to other beach communities being restrictive during this time of pandemic. So any of these, um, any of these updates that have to do with making Santa Barbara look prettier to outsiders and look more enticing is very dangerous to the residents who live here who want a safe place to live that has sidewalks and streets without potholes. And when we're focusing on making this attractive to rich people from out of town, that is a really dangerous road to go down. Thank you. Very good. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Laura Knight. And after Laura Knight, we'll have Paul Parier. Laura Knight, please go ahead. Laura Knight, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Ms. Knight, go ahead. Ms. Knight, I think you may have muted yourself again. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. All right, I'm back. Um, first off, I want to say thank you so much to Mayor and City Council for moving so quickly to make some big decisions to um, close vehicular traffic downtown to enable restaurants and businesses to move outside and stay open in whatever way they can during COVID. Um, I've worked in the same four blocks of downtown State Street since 1977. And my first job was in Piccadilly Square. So I've seen things move up State Street, down State Street. I had my restaurant in Pisano Nuevo Mall for 26 years and recently moved in February down to the 500 block. And I know the decision to close State Street has been a topic for many, many years. It was kind of controversial with some people whether we should do it or not. And the decision was made because of a pandemic. And I think everybody's been pleasantly surprised at what a great decision it was. Um, I'm actually amazed at the fact that people that have not been coming downtown for years are now coming downtown. And it's not just college kids. It's not just young people. It's all ages. It's senior citizens. It's everybody in between. 
and it's been all positive feedback. People feel comfortable outside. It's fresh air. It's entertaining. People watching. Um, a lot of people have said it's a European feel. And the only thing I can say is we say, you know, if it's not broken, don't fix it. And downtown has been broken for many years and struggling and it's fixed now. So I hope we can keep it fixed. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Paul Poirier. Paul Poirier. Paul Poirier, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Paul Poirier, local architect. And I just wanted to thank you city council and mayor for being so creative and bold in taking the action to close State Street. And I'd like to support the continued support of the core of our downtown. Um, I don't own a business downtown, but I do work with a lot of small local businesses. And without your support to have creative solutions to help them stay in business and serve our community, um, I don't think they would be doing as well as they are in surviving this pandemic. Recently, we had a event where we were meeting with people from different cities around California and we had representation from the planning department um, at this learning from the pandemic event. And, uh, you know, it just really showed how Santa Barbara has stepped up to help local businesses to be creative with not charging for par parking during the pandemic, closing down State Street um, and balancing things out so that the businesses and local companies that we love to do business with are able to stay in business. So I just really wanted to thank you for having a creative mind and coming up with some super creative solutions and um, being bold enough to implement those on a uh, on a platform where some people aren't going to like that because it's not the status quo, but we're living in different times. And I just really wanted to express my appreciation because I love the local businesses we have in town. Thank you. Thank you. Another, another speaker? Yes, we have Andrew Avalasi. Aval One moment, please. Mr. Avalasi, please go ahead. Mr. Avalasi, please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm sorry. I'm on my uh, brother's computer. I really wanted to quickly go over the promenade. Um, I was there last weekend on the car drive and I noticed that while it did look successful for small businesses, it did not look regulated. It did not look as there was social distancing. And I feel like it's very important right now during the pandemic to consider that though it is successful and though it is getting Santa Barbara attention, it is not a vacation town and there's still the pandemic. I mean, the U.S. just passed 200,000 deaths, and I don't think we're helping by reinforcing people to come over to take a vacation in Santa Barbara. I personally know someone who went to a restaurant downtown and then got COVID. So I'm not sure if it was from there. I'm not sure if it was from someone around the promenade. Additionally, my I have family in Los Angeles that have frequented visiting Santa Barbara because of how pretty it is, because of the promenade, because we are opening up. If we keep opening up and inviting more people, then we're just going to propagate the spread of the, the virus. I just don't think it's the right moment to be focusing on how many people we have. And the success of small businesses are important, but I mean, there's a pandemic right now. That's all. <laughs> Ma'am, what is your name for the record? I'm taking notes. Yeah, of course. I'm going to type in my name. Okay, thanks. Ms. That, that's for Ms. Gorman. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Next speaker. Madam Mayor and Council, I believe those are, yes, those are, all, those are all of our public comments for items not on the agenda. Okay, we'll close open public comment and let me find my agenda. Uh, we go to this consent calendar. Um, council members, let me know if you want to pull an item. And I'll ask Ms. Gorman if any members of the public are raising their hand, if they want to say something about any of the items that are on the consent calendar. Oh, and Ms. Gorman, you have if you have items to read, let's let's start there. Thanks. 
Very good. Item one, adoption of CEQA guidelines ordinance. Recommendation the council adopt by reading of title only an ordinance of the council of the city of Santa Barbara amending title 22 of the Santa Barbara municipal code by the addition of chapter 22.100 relating to environmental review. And item two, adoption of a resolution delegating authority to the city administrator to make dis determinations of disability status for CalPERS disability retirement. Recommendation the council adopt by reading of title only a resolution of the council of the city of Santa Barbara delegating authority to the city administrator to make determinations regarding disability retirement and for the filing of employer originated disability applications to the California Public Employees Retirement System, CalPERS, and to make determinations on industrial disability retirement for safety employees either initiated by the safety employee or the city. And that is all the items to read. Thanks. Ms. Gorman, does anyone seem to be raising their hand that they wanna speak on one of the items? I don't see any of my council members popping up. Madam Mayor, Marge Caffarelli has raised her hand so we can call on her for her public comment. Ms. Caffarelli, did you have something on one of the consent items? That's item one through six. Ms. Caffarelli, please go ahead. Ms. Caffarelli, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Okay, Madam Mayor, and I believe I will just check to confirm. Yes, those are all of the um, persons with hands raised for consent calendar. Mr. Gutierrez, did you wanna move our consent calendar forward? Yes, I'd like to make the motion, please. Okay. I'll Mr. second that, Madam Mayor. And a second from Mr. Jordan. If there's no other discussion, we'll take a roll call vote. Thanks. This is a motion for the entirety of the consent calendar. A motion by Councilmember Oscar Gutierrez, seconded by Councilmember Jordan. Councilmember Jordan. Aye. Councilmember Alejandro Gutierrez. Aye. Mayor Potem Sneddon. Yes. Councilmember Friedman. Yes. Councilmember Harmon. Yes. Councilmember Oscar Gutierrez. Aye. And Mayor Murillo. Aye. The consent calendar is approved unanimously. We'll move to our first. Hmm. I think the ordinance committee meeting, the ordinance committee met today. Mr. Gutierrez, do you have a, a report? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, we voted to move the staff recommendations of the accessory, accessory dwelling units forward to council. Thank you. Now we'll move on to our administrative agenda. Um, number seven, Ms. Clerk, if you would read that. And it might even be your item. If Go ahead. Yes, Madam Mayor, here's my item. Number seven, Community Formation Commission extension of application deadline. And Mayor and Council, we're here with a um, with a, simply a request to extend the dead the application deadline for our Community Formation Commission. It is currently set for October 30th. We are proposing extending it to December 4th. Uh, with a proposal for interviews to be held tentatively on January 12th with appointments at the regular meeting after that. And I'm available for, for questions. I'll start with a quick question. We got some emails that were supportive of um, extending the deadline. There was a couple of comments that uh, the city had missed a deadline to release the applications. Did, did we say we were gonna release it at a certain time and, and we were late? Ms. Gorman, if, if you could explain why we're getting that note. Uh, certainly, Mad Madam Mayor, uh, there was no um, promised deadline that I know of, but I do believe that there was an erroneous news report that had a uh, um, end of September deadline. Um, so we believe that might that might be the the source of the confusion. But at any rate, we would like to extend it out to give as much time as possible. 
Okay. Is there um, any other questions? And then we can check and see if there's public comment on this item. Well, we know that one fellow is waiting, so. I don't see any other questions, Ms. Gorman. So please go to public comment and I don't have his name written down, but we could start with okay. him. I, I should. <laughs> okay, and if people can, if we can ask members of the public that are interested or speaking on this item, please raise your hand within the app. And if you don't see how to do that, um, uh, please go ahead and send me a question through the app. And I will start listing names here. We have, and I'm going to write them down as we do this. Pardon me for my multitasking. We have Crystal Sieghart. And Matt Lowe to start. And Mr. Lowe, I am going to, let's see, I don't see you logged. I do see you logged in. Mr. Lowe, I am unmuting you now so that you can unmute yourself and be ready to speak when we when we get to you, but we'll call on Crystal Seacard first. Crystal Seacard, please go ahead. Crystal Seacard, please go ahead. You can unmute yourself. How do I? Uh, oh, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Hello, Crystal Seagart here. Once again, wanting to remind the council members, the mayor, and folks that frequent these spaces, the constant struggles, obstacles, and barriers marginalized and vulnerable folks experience when participating in these governing spaces. These meetings are inaccessible times, and I understand we are currently going through a global pandemic but we cannot assume everyone has access to a computer, Wi-Fi, or is able to navigate through this system in order to make a public comment or have their voices heard to speak on pressing matters. I am also concerned about the amount of times I've had to participate in these meetings only to have to address and uplift the same things over and over again that should have been handled and done already. I am calling to urge the council to extend the application deadline for the formation commission from October 30th to December 4th. This process has been daunting and Healing Justice SB has asked for transparency along the way. And several times, time and time again, promises were broken, meetings were canceled and emails were not responded to. Community needs to be involved in this work, especially those most impacted by policing. And in order for them to do so, the council must do all in their power to make sure these applications and processes are accessible to them. That includes BIPOC folks, LGBTQIA plus people, undocumented folks, folks with disabilities, and formerly incarcerated folks. And we don't want to see no more than 60% of one gender on this commission, formation commission or on the civilian review board. We do not want to see law enforcement on this commission nor involved. That is not only inappropriate, it defeats the entire purpose of forming the commission in the first place. The community has spoken and we have been very clear on what we would like. So please allow folks that are willing and wanting to do the work to participate in doing it because it honestly does not seem like most of you know what you are doing, what is going on, or even talk to the people you work with. We are trying to move towards a police free world, a prison free world, and a world where communities look out for each other because we protect us. And I don't have the email because I didn't have time to pull it up, but I do believe in the email it was stated to us that the applications would be ready by the 21st and they were not. I'm sorry I can't confirm this because I didn't have time and you called on me too soon. I wasn't expecting to be the first one to speak, um, but I'm sure later um, someone else will reference it. Again, extend the deadline, extend the application deadline and please stop leaving folks out of this work um, because we've been trying to be involved over time and time again and every time we come forward and ask you questions. It seems like nobody knows what anybody's doing and nobody's talking to each other. Um, so let the community be involved in the work and um, let's collaboratively work together so we can get through this. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker right. is Matt Lowe. All right. Matt Lowe, please go ahead. 
Hi, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, thank you for hearing this item today. Um, I would like to go back to the meeting where we first started talking about the Transition Commission. And I do believe um, when I was at that meeting, we did talk about the application process and the how rigorous it needed to be and the timeline in which we wanted that commission to be as voiced by the community. So I think the extension is, is deeply needed. Um, it was right now, it's merely just four weeks. Um, I don't think that is nearly enough time to get the input by the community and have the, um, the, the, the buy-in and the support um, by those that are in needed and all the voices that are to be included, the, um, the black and indigenous and all the communities of color that are a part of our community. Um, including LGBT and people with disabilities that are needed on this commission. Um, we need to hear the voices that have gone through the system of incarceration um, that, that is hurting our community. Our community has been historically impacted by the system of mass incarceration, and we need to hear those harms and what is going to move um, our community in a healing way forward, um, because this, this has gone on too long of um, police violence and how our community is um, being disparately impacted. You know, we went through a gang injunction and that was harmful to our community and people are still feeling that violence from that impact. And so this commission needs to be given full opportunity. Um, uh, if, if we're gonna really honor the transition commission for all that it is, we would like to see a civilian oversight sooner than one year, but um, the decision was made to have a transition commission. So please, um, honor that time and extend the application process so we can get full community participation in this. Thank you. Very good. Next speaker. Are there, are there more speakers, Ms. Gorman? Yes, Madam Mayor, there are. And our next list of speakers are Simone Reskamp, Marge Caffarelli, Isabel Fleury, Claudia Lopez, and Brett Folger. Simone Reskamp. One moment. Simone Rosecamp, please go ahead. Um, hi there, City Council. Um, I am expressing my support for delaying um, the closure of the application deadline. Um, just in reference to what Crystal mentioned, um, I have two different emails from people who are part of the City Council. And again, this is why I wish that you all would communicate with each other as people who work for the city together, who can really model what community work looks like. We were first told actually that these applications would be readily available the week of September 3rd third. Then we were told by September 21st, it went back and forth several times. And then I got a notice saying, oh, the applications are out today on the day that they were posted um, from one of the city staff. So again, um, to the mayor and to council members, it is incredibly disappointing that you still are not talking amongst each other, especially when you're talking about such important issues. Another reason to delay this is because some of the people where the people who were tasked with creating this formation committed commission talked about doing outreach at the different community centers. I haven't seen any plan for that. I haven't seen any dates where you all have actually put feet to these commitments, but I believe specifically like Alejandra mentioned that she was going to be doing outreach at the community centers for Spanish speaking people, for people that had disabilities to come if they needed a support staff and none of those dates have been released. So how can you then have an application deadline when you haven't made good on any of the promises that you made to make sure that it was an equitable process. Um, so again, I'm just really disappointed in this pattern of making commitments, not following them, this lack of this lack of communication, it's not acceptable in our city leadership. Um, and to then suggest that it was erroneous. No, we didn't come up with this date on our own. We were told this date. We were told that you all would be doing outreach in the community to help people apply for these applications. You all have not put out dates of when you're going to do that. Um, so I think that's something that you all need to admit and be truthful about. It's tiring to have to come here every single week and tell you all, just tell the truth. So push back the date, yes, and also tell the truth and do right by the communities that you represent. Very good. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Isabel Fleury, then Claudia Lopez, Brett Folger, Cressida Silver, Tanya Hyde, Athena Tan, and Dane Lopez. Isabel Fleury, please go ahead. 
Sorry, I just have a lot of noise outside. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, yes. So I really just want to reiterate, I think, what other folks are already saying, but I think um, even though it's a similar message, uh, to hear it again and again maybe makes it a little bit more clear. Um, I would like to support uh, extending the application deadline from October 30th to December 4th. I'd also like to endorse more transparency and more community engagement um, among council, council city members, uh, city council members, as well as um, with community members. Um, I also want to support the idea that the commission must center those that are closest to the pain that this commission's membership must include most impacted folks, most marginalized folks, and that includes black, indigenous, and people of color, um, LGBTQIA plus people, undocumented people, folks with disabilities, formerly incarcerated people, and no more than 60% of one gender should be represented in this commission. It is also not appropriate for law enforcement to try to design their own systems of oversight, considering you're trying to redesign a system. Um, it just doesn't make sense to have police officers and law enforcement um, be the ones leading that. So again, I'm just endorsing trusting the community um, and what they're asking of you. And that's it. Thanks. More, next speaker. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Claudia Lopez, then Brett Folger, Cressida Silver, Tanya Hyde, Athena Tan, Dane Lopez, Thomas Gomez. Claudia Lopez. Claudia Lopez, please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you. My apologies. Um, I wasn't able to unmute. I was trying to, but it said that the meeting organizer had me muted. Apologies. Um, I am I've not been, I think, as involved as some of the other folks who are calling in, um, but I have had, um, I was born in Santa Barbara, love Santa Barbara, um, and I've seen how policing has negatively impacted the people around me, specifically black people, specifically brown people, specifically anybody who deviates from whiteness, I guess, uh, is the best way I can put it. Um, and I'm just calling in because I support um, this call to extend the application deadlines as somebody who cares about the issues of underrepresented people um, and the ways that policing impacts the lives of people who aren't um, typically represented in government. Um, I, I think it's important um, to echo what folks are asking for and ex extending these deadlines. I'm somebody who considers myself somewhat plugged in. Um, I, I don't feel so plugged into this right now. And I feel like there might be a lot of people in the community who have no idea that this commission um, is even being put together, that they could have their voices involved. I'm a very privileged person. I was, I was able to go to university, I, I'm able to have, you know, access to the internet and I, I have so many ways to plug in and it is very frustrating um, to recognize that, you know, we're, uh, I don't know, three or four weeks away from when uh, these applications might be due. People are worried about the election. People are worried about how to get food on the table. Um, people are worried about having lost their jobs. Like there, there's a lot happening and this could very easily get lost. And so I, I full heartedly endorse uh, moving the date to December after the election is over when people have maybe a little bit more time to actually be involved. It would give people more of an opportunity to actually um, learn how they might be effective on the commission. Um, so I think just as somebody who learned about this, um, you know, this morning on Instagram, um, I, I think it's a good idea to make sure that we can reach um, communities of people who might be involved who aren't me, you know, who better represent um, the communities that are most impacted by policing. Because I can uh, say for myself that my cloaks of privilege mean that I right now don't get harassed as much as when I was six years old, but it happened when I was six, you know. Um, so please, um, <laughs> please do uh, take this into consideration and please do that outreach um, because there are community members who are hurting and who 
you know, don't have the opportunity to be on this call right now. And we shouldn't be hubristic and assume that we know best for them. Thank you. Thanks. Next speaker. Our next speakers are Brett Folger, Cressida Silvers, Tanya Hyde, Athena Tan, Dane Lopez. Brett Folger, please go ahead. Good afternoon, Council. Um, thank you for hearing this today. Um, I'm lucky that my employer has allowed me to take some time to um, be here today. Uh, I would like to speak in support, of course, of the extension of the deadline to December 4th. Um, I think you guys, you know, I don't have to tell you this, but the way this functions is when a when a part of the government doesn't seem to be working as well, it needs to be changed and it needs to be there needs to be oversight. And that's what this is about. And if the if the process of building that group is flawed, if people don't have access to it, if there isn't appropriate time, then the whole process is flawed. And we cannot have that here. This is a critical time and and it's very important that this is done correctly. Um, secondly, a lot of the people who have spoken today are the same people who have been leading this movement and leading protests around Santa Barbara and organizing and bringing people together to fight against injustice. I know you all know their names because you've heard them, they've confronted you. They are our voice. They are, they are, they are taking the voice of all of the thousands of people who believe in these things and who know that they are right and they are bringing them to you. And it is incredibly important to all of us that you understand that their voices are not only their own, that they are representing a huge number of Santa Barbans. I couldn't tell you how many, but they are, they are the people who are putting in the work while the rest of us get to continue with our jobs or our schooling or our families, et cetera. So please understand that their cries weekly, monthly, over and over again for these things are not just their own voices that they represent many Santa Barbans and many of your constituents. Thank you. Welcome. Next speaker. Next speaker is Cressida Silvers, then Tanya Hyde, Athena Tan, Dane Lopez, Thomas Gomez, Anna Marie Gott, Dylan Griffith, and Margaret Burke. Cressida Silvers, please go ahead. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. After the police department and individual officers met peaceful mourners with riot gear and taunting jeers, after the police department chose to prioritize mental health by recruiting one of its own officers for the intervention response team, thus continuing to treat mental health crises as criminal, after the police officers association declined until 2022 to even discuss the mere feasibility of moving parking enforcement to the parking division, after neglecting to inform Healing Justice Santa Barbara about the Finance Committee agenda that specifically named Healing Justice, that was the first public response to ongoing conversations with Healing Justice regarding police reforms, and of which the police department was not only informed, but even presenting on Healing Justice's requests. And after a council member then suggested that Healing Justice should expect to be informed of city agendas that directly involve them through press releases from the police department's public outreach person. After all of these indignities, the process for selecting members of the commission to form a citizens review board must not be further jeopardized by mistrust and misdeeds. Please uphold the integrity of this process in its intentions as well as its outcomes. Please extend the application period until December 4th to allow for the full timeline as promised and insist that the formation commission comprise only those who are policed and their experiences, including members of our marginalized and vulnerable communities, and that it does not include members employed by or associated with law enforcement. And if you have to question why the integrity and the basic functioning of this commission and the review board after that depend on these criteria being met, then you either do not really understand its purpose or you choose to intentionally undermine it. Neither of these is acceptable. Thank you. 
Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Tanya Hyde, then Athena Tan, Dane Lopez, Thomas, Lop Thomas Gomez, Anna Marie Gott, Dylan Griffith, and Margaret Burke. Tanya Hyde. Tanya Hyde, please go ahead. Ah, there you go, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, council. And I echo almost everything said by the preceding callers. I also uh, request the extension of the deadline and think that makes the best sense. I think it's clear to everyone everywhere right now why the police uh, require oversight and increased accountability. And I thank Santa Barbara for at least starting to move in the right direction by creating a, uh, a civilian police oversight uh, system and in, uh, in empowering the CFC to do this work. I think it's extremely important that the people who are most impacted by the abuses of um, law enforcement are the most well represented um, on this commission. And in order to give everybody an opportunity to apply and make sure we have the most um, capable and well um, impacted people on the on the commission, I think it's really important that we extend these deadlines um, to ensure this representation. Um, the, as far as we can tell, it was only about two weeks ago that there was an announcement. So we really need more time uh, to find the kind of people that need to come forward. And I would agree that we really don't want anyone with uh, direct ties to the law enforcement should be, should not be on the commission. That's the, the old hen and the, the fox in the hen house story. And likewise, I would like to make sure that we exclude any of our privileged community members who you constantly see like on the neighborhood um, uh, communication things saying that if you don't commit crimes, you're not gonna have any problem with the police. I'd like to make sure those are not the people that are represented on this commission either. Thank you. Thanks. Next speaker. Next speaker is Athena Tan, then Dane Lopez, Thomas Gomez, Anna Marie Gott, Dylan Griffith, Margaret Burke. Athena Tan. Athena Tan, please go ahead. Hi, um, city council members. So I'm glad that you have this item on the agenda to extend the deadline for the Community Formation Commission application. And I strongly encourage you to vote yes on it for the reasons stated by um, Crystal Seacard and Simone Ruskamp about your communication about when the application would be available. I also wanna draw attention to the fact that for some reason, when you were discussing this application last month, after public comment closed, you decided to remove the word oversight from the position. So it was the Community Oversight Formation Commission, which makes sense because it's the commission to form a community oversight board. Now it's just the Community Formation Commission. So it sounds like the commission to form community, which doesn't mean anything in particular. And that's how it's being advertised in the link on the city homepage and in the in your Facebook post about this, I would strongly encourage you to make sure that in the in the main links and the headers of any posts you make, it is clear what this is, that it is to form a community oversight board for SVPD, um, not have that in the fine print and the description that people might not even read if they're not sure what this is about to begin with. Um, and I've also looked through the materials you have up on the website and I see that they are not consistently translated into Spanish. So you have a table with um, the various details about this position, but that is only in English, even though the general description for the position is in Spanish. So the part about how there is a, um, uh, a payment, sorry, just blanked on the word, for people who participate, that isn't available in Spanish, and that's really important to uh, have in both languages, I think. Um, other than that, I really just echo what other speakers have said, especially about your communication with Healing Justice Santa Barbara. I really love to hear in the future that you've been communicating in a clear and consistent way, coordinating amongst yourselves, sticking to the commitments you make, and if you're not able to, letting the organizers know ahead of time um, or actually apologizing and making commitments to do better in the future. Uh, so thank you for your time. 
Thanks, Ms. Tan. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Dane Lopez. Dane Lopez, please go ahead. Hi. Um, I would like to say that, um, as is stated in the call for applications for this commission, uh, it is extremely important that this commission has, quote, the confidence and trust of the community. So if this is going to happen, I urge the council to extend the deadline for application to December 4th so that the people who are most impacted by the harm uh, done by law enforcement have plenty of time to find out about this commission to submit an application. Uh, and I would also like to um, add on to, or rather echo what others have said, that members of law enforcement should not be sought to uh, serve on this commission. I think that's goes completely contrary to the whole point of this. And lastly, I'd like to echo what others have said regarding transparency and uh, constant, consistent communication regarding the formation of this commission with uh, healing justice and members of the community. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Thomas Gomez, then Anna Marie Gott, Dylan Griffith, Margaret Burke, Chelsea Lancaster, Michaela Ravasio. Thomas Gomez, please go ahead. Okay, hello. 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 Can you hear me? Hey, um, Haku, hello. First off, um, yeah, my name is Thomas. I'm a member of the Saiyan S Band of Chumash Indians. And um, support of my brothers here on the coast. And um, I'm just calling in support of extending this application deadline from October 30th to December 4th. And um, I'd also like to reiterate, as everybody else said, uh, a couple others said, and the, form the formation commission must center the closest to the pain, those closest to the pain. This commission's membership must include most impacted folks, including people of color, LGBTQ, undocumented people, folks with disabilities, formerly incarcerated people, and no more than 60% of one gender. It is not appropriate for law enforcement to try and design their own systems of oversight. And one, one way is try and beat this is just out of respect and love is uh, how everybody tries to want to beat it. And one of the hardest things to see is um, some of the signs and stuff of disrespect to people that are still here that were here long ago. So once again, just reiterate um, and extending this application deadline for many other issues. But um, as you know, I'm in support of the, the name change. Um, that is all I have to say as of now. I appreciate it all. Talking to us. Thanks. Thank, thanks. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Anna Marie Gott. After Anna Marie Gott, Dylan Griffith. Margaret Burke, Chelsea Lancaster, and Michaela Ravazio. Anna Marie Gott, please go ahead. Good, good afternoon, council member. I think you know by now, after commenter after commenter has basically reamed you for the lack of accountability, the lack of transparency, the lack of communication, that you have a problem. I think you know that I have been at these city council meetings almost every single day since 2015. Every time you had a council meeting, virtually I was there. <laughs> and I have been talking about the same thing, a lack of accountability, not just with your staff members, but with what council members are actually doing and how they're communicating with our, um, our residents. I think that having this particular item here today in the middle of the agenda is, is perfect. However, I don't think that any of you really communicated with any of the speakers today that you were all ready before this meeting even started going to make the decision to postpone the meet, this particular deadline until December the 4th. None of you communi communicated to any of the individuals that are talking today that you typically and almost invariably always accept staff reports for any extensions. 
there was been absolutely no reason for you to deny this. And you've had a lot of people in the middle of their workday participate in a meeting that they really didn't need to. However, the reason I'm going to say that they should have uh, participated today was so that you could hear the frustration from this community. And this frustration is echoed across the entire community because we have a lack of access to information. We have a lack of, of accountability, not just with staff, but with you, and a lack of communication with staff and with you. Your report that you received regarding the planning commission could be echoed with how people perceive the city council. So I want you to sit with that because I hear on a daily basis the problems and the interpretation that people have from the lack of actually having our city council do anything that is for the community other than the business people. I also support the name change because yeah, you know what? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I do would like to say one more thing. Your time is up, Ms. Gorman. Thank you. Ms. Gorman, we'll move on to the next speaker. Thanks, we have a big agenda, thank you. Our next speakers are Dylan Griffith, Margaret Burke, Chelsea Lancaster, Michaela Ravazio, and Mary O'Connor. Dylan Griffith, please go ahead. Hi, City Council and Mayor. Uh, my name is Dylan Griffith. I'm here to voice support to extend the deadline to December 4th for the Community Formation Commission application. Uh, and just reiterate a lot of things that have been said. The commission needs to be filled with those closest to the impacts of policing, not to the institutions of policing. And I really want to make clear that the life experiences of those impacted by policing, they need to be valued, they need to be believed, uh, and it needs to be understood that these people have their own expertise on this subject that cannot be accessed or um, kind of gained otherwise. Uh, it can only be gained by those people who have been impacted by policing. Um, so there should be no law enforcement, whether active or inactive, uh, and no people that have familiar or other ties to law enforcement. Uh, other than providing the commission with educational or informational resources, law enforcement should have no part in the design or implementation processes for the system of oversight. Uh, I additionally wanna echo um, the various folks that have been named um, to be represented on the commission. And I also uh, just wanted to reiterate um, no more than 60% of one gender. I do not think there's a reason for the city to wait until 2030 to adhere to gender representation and inclusivity requirements uh, when that is absolutely possible and able to be done in 2020 here. Um, and, and just the last thing is reiterating that the police in quote unquote investigating the police is, is part of why this oversight is necessary in the first place. That system has proven to be ineffective and to create a lot of harm within the community here, particularly upon uh, black and brown folks, as we've heard through statistics that have been going around uh, for the past several months, several years, and several decades. So thank you for your time. Thanks. Next speaker. Next speaker is Margaret Burke, then Chelsea Lancaster, Michaela Ravazio, Mary O'Connor, and Carlos Jimenez. Margaret Burke. Please go ahead. Hi, um, I can't say anything better than that has already been said, but um, I think pushing the deadline back to December 4th is baseline just necessary. Um, folks have a lot going on and there's not been um, any sincere outreach done to ensure that the people whose voices or people, um, people's voices, those that are most affected by law enforcement and policing in our community, um, they have to be heard. And like in my professional setting, when I'm getting feedback like repeatedly about things that are not going well, um, those are things that if I wanna do my job well as an educator, I have to listen to my students' needs, um, take them seriously and work collaboratively like you know, this is the kind of learning that the state says we need to do, but let's do it your way. So like you're getting so much feedback and I think it's important that 
Um, people in positions of power and authority humble themselves and are honest and transparent, um, like kind of ego death. But anyway, yeah, December 4th extension deadline and representative of um, not the most affluent privileged people, but the folks that are actually going to be impacted by law enforcement. Thank you. Thanks. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Chelsea Lancaster. Chelsea Lancaster, please go ahead. Chelsea Lancaster, please. There you go. Y'all hear me? Um, so obviously echoing the demands and asks that have been made um, in terms of the formation of the commission, the pushing back of the deadline to make sure that the process is inclusive and centers those that are closest to the pain. I also want to name for y'all that a lot of work we've been doing, this is solidarity work. And I really wish that, that um, folks in political positions, especially folks who depended on communities of color and the people that are most impacted that we're talking about um, would really step up in this work and be in solidarity with the people that are trying to make this city better. A lot of us walked for y'all. We had people vote for the very first time in their entire lives for y'all. Um, we worked really hard to make sure that people had mirrors on council I was frustrated, frankly, to see the KEYT piece. Um, clearly, there are some people on council who are working with other uh, quote unquote representatives in our community uh, to think that the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce represents the Latino community, the people that are most impacted by the pain. Clearly, there's communication going on with other groups and still not with us. I appreciate the, cur the uh, reach out that has now been happening to name and acknowledge that the communication has not been there, that the truth has not been there, that the accountability has not been there. But frankly, it doesn't feel authentic. It feels like people are kind of trying to cover themselves at this point. So I'm really asking, I'm begging you all to make sure this is about real community safety. This is about real community safety. We care about our people. I also want to name that this has been a black centered and black femme led movement. So if you all really want to do this justice, I still don't have full confidence that you all are going to put people on that commission that have stood in solidarity with the black community that care about the black community. Um, we're here in solidarity with the Chumash community and with Latinx folks and folks with disabilities, LGBTQIA folks in our community. We're asking for a real change, and I'm asking you all to help us shepherd that process. As one of the other speakers said, we are here doing this work for free, working all the time to create unity and safety in our community and to show that people care about them. That message is not coming from the council yet in an authentic way, and I'm asking you to please be mindful and to please be mindful of the ways that you're talking about our youth because I'm concerned that you all are allowing, and Mike Jordan named the, putting a, a stick in the spokes of a youth, and an adult stabbed the youth in our community months ago, and nobody has talked about it. Be mindful, and let's do this right. Thank you. Next speaker. Next speaker is Michaela, excuse me, pull up the name. Michaela Ravazio. Michaela Ravazio, please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So I'm voicing solidarity also with the other specifically Black and Indigenous folk who have used their voice in this space with everything that they've said and also specifically to extend the deadline for the Community Formation Commission, definitely until December 4th. I think at that point, at this point, it's been clear that that's the absolute least you can do if you're actually listening to your community and doing your job, which at this point, from what we've observed, just know that your community is watching you and this whole experience since Black Lives Matter has started making their voice very prevalent in this space has been really concerning to see the consistent lack of communication, consistent lack of leadership, consistent lack of honesty, consistent lack of transparency from you. 
Mayor Kathy, specifically when this all started and you posted the video on Twitter that you were working with the Black Lives Matter movement and working with them when you hadn't responded to any of the leaders' calls for you to meet with them, that's when originally I was very concerned and I've continued to see over and over again reason not to trust and reason to question your intentions. So please listen to your community. Definitely extend the deadline for the Community Formation Commission. Reminder that you are employed by taxpayer dollars. You are here to serve the people, not the police. You are here to serve the people, not the police. You need to listen to your community. We need you to be actively reaching out to the marginalized and oppressed people of our community who do not have the basic rights to freedom and safety in their role in our community. You need to be actively reaching out to them to include the voices, their voices in this space, especially African-American people, especially indigenous people, especially the Chumash people. I want to voice solidarity for changing of the street name from Indio Muerto to listen to the chief of the Chumash tribes asks. I think that's the absolute least you can do. We need to be making reparations if you really want the community to heal and for everyone, including you, including me, who, by the way, I'm a woman of European descent. If you really want to make change and for all of us to feel safe here, then you need to be thinking about reparations. We need to abolish ICE. Santa Barbara needs to be a sanctuary county. And we need reparations for the attempted genocide that occurred on this land and still affects the daily lives, lived experience and safety of the people in our community. Reminder that if anyone here has not experienced police brutality or police violence, because you may not be of color or may have privilege, reminder that it is real. I have personally and directly experienced it. And the fact that your community needs to explain to you why it's not okay for anyone related to the police to be on the commission board is very concerning. Thank you so much. I hope you hear us and I hope you are well and have a great day. Very good, thanks. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Mary O'Connor, then Carlos Jimenez, Laura Mandel, and Sofia Zatorsky. Mary O'Connor, please go ahead. Hi there. So yeah, as far as the community outreach um, goes, as far as encouraging applicants, um, first of all, I'm wondering, is there anything any board member can tell us that they have specifically done themselves to do this? Um, from my own experience, I'll let you know that uh, 11 days ago, Councilman Oscar posted on the Santa Barbara subreddit, um, basically just the blurb about this position and this committee being formed. Uh, there was not one comment on this. Uh, there are also Santa Barbara subreddit is a notoriously horrifically racist place. And as farther than that, also the language of the post um, wasn't incredibly accessible for everyone. Um, it was definitely a little confusing to read. Um, and again, it did not have one comment. It had five likes, one of which was mine. Um, that was disturbing because clearly no one was seeing that and then going to apply. Um, also, I just want to say, doing a quick Google search, it is incredibly hard to find the information about this community commission. And I will let you know that when you search for it on Google, uh, three things come up. And it's one article from the Santa Barbara Independent with no guidance on further steps to take or telling you where you can go to apply. Another one was a new press article with even less information and less guidance of where to go. And I just want to read a quote that Councilman Oscar gave, um, or I'm sorry, this was a quote from the news press article. This was not Councilman Oscar, but the article said in quotes, the council also removed the term oversight from the title of the commission as it is a formation commission that will lead to an oversight mechanism. That makes no sense to me. That is incredibly confusing. If any of you could explain that, I would appreciate it. I also want to know if the community can be updated on how many applications they've received or still need. Um, I speak for myself when I say that 
I would, I want to do everything I can to help, including applying for this commission, but I do not want to apply for something that others are more qualified for. So like everyone else has said, I don't know what you need to do if it's going out into the actual streets and going up to people and letting them know about this opportunity, but the community has no idea that this exists. Thank you. Thanks. Next speaker. Next speaker is Carlos Jimenez, Lauren Mendel, Sofia Zatorski, and Hannah Kagan Moore. Carlos Jimenez. Carlos Jimenez, please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I would like to start off by saying thank you to Council Member Alejandra Gutierrez. She actually spent Saturday morning speaking to our Spanish speaking community about this formation review board at a local trailer park in her district. I am very grateful that finally someone has reached out to our Spanish speaking community, which has no doubt been left behind in all of this, especially about an issue as important as this one. And she has given us the opportunity to voice our opinions and experiences regarding the policing that goes on in our city. Council member Gutierrez personally encouraged me to apply and I will never have applied for anything like this, but because she has proven herself in the community and has shown us that she has our back and has shown us that if she got this far as being a, a person of color coming from the same background as many of us on the east side, then so can I. I'm going to go ahead and apply and I will encourage others in my neighborhood to do so also. I've heard comments that nobody had reached out to the community. She actually reached out to us and she reached out to a Spanish speaking community that has no doubt been left behind. Uh, I would also like to extend the time frame to December to allow me and others that were present that day when she spoke to us to continue informing and continue reaching out to others in our neighborhood, family, friends, and our neighbors. So thank you for your time. Very good. Next speaker. Next speaker is Lauren Mendel. Lauren Mendel, please go ahead. Hello. Um, thank you, Mayor and City Council. I'm here to uh, voice support for the asks put forward by Healing Justice, Black Lives Matter, Santa Barbara. Um, I support moving the deadline to December 4th for applying for seats on this um, this committee or this commission. I want to um, echo the point that um, police officers should not sit on this oversight board. Uh, people who are um, mixed up with the violent gangs that call themselves law enforcement in the United States of America uh, not sit on this board uh, members of ICE uh, not sit on this board and that people um, who have direct experience with the harassment, violence, and uh, discrimination um, that these law enforcement uh, groups uh, put on people, uh, these are the people who need to sit on the board, people who come from um, ethnic minorities, people who are economically um, not as well off. Uh, we, we don't want this board to mimic other uh, groups in the city who comprise of inherited wealth and uh, the, the professional donor class um, whose interests are at odds with the working class. Um, do not necessarily need a seat on this board. Um, I hear that some outreach was done uh, into communities um, who definitely need to be represented on this board, and that is fantastic. I applaud those efforts. That's great to hear. Please do more of that. Um, we should also definitely rename uh, that street uh, to the one that leaders from uh, the Chumash tribe have uh, have put forward 
um, if if there were a street, I'm Jewish, and if there was a street in town that said in Yiddish "dead Jews," um, I that that sign would have come down decades ago. So um, thank you for your time. Thanks. Next speaker. Next speaker is Sophia Zatorsky, then Hannah Kagan Moore, then Dan Viano. And I think he's our, our final. We'll double check. Sophia Zatorsky. Sophia Zatorsky, please go ahead. Hi, this is Sophia, Santa Barbara County resident. I'm just here in support with Healing Justice Santa Barbara today and the Black, Brown, and Indigenous voices of those who have spoken. Um, especially those who've been putting the work in in this movement. I just want to reiterate, even though it sounds like um, we are going to be extending that deadline, that you all are going to make that decision, I just want to stress how important it is that we are including those voices and centering those voices in this group that you all have decided to create. It seems like the communication is definitely lacking on your part and it's disappointing, um, but also yet not surprising to hear that. It's extremely important that these voices are heard and those that are directly affected by the police are heard rather than appointing police officers and those even closely related to the police. That seems like a direct conflict of interest and just expresses how unprofessional um, the county and state really is. Um, it's extremely disappointing and it's just not appropriate for law enforcement to try to design their own system of oversight. Um, I again also just want to stress my support um, the request from the Chumash Tribal Council to rename um, the street um, to Huta Street. So I really appreciate you taking the time to listen today and I yield my time. Thanks. Thanks. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Sofia Zatorsky. I'm sorry. Our next speaker is Hannah Kagan Moore and then Dan Viano. Hannah Kagan Moore. Hannah Kagan Moore, please go ahead. Hi. Um, thank you, City Council, for hearing us today. I'd like to take this moment to just reiterate that we're all voters. Um, you're hearing from engaged active members of your community and um, you know what you do now and the choices you make now, we're going to remember those. And so I urge you to, as you say you are, to listen to us because I know I've heard from many members of this council that you're here to listen, that you're here to understand our concerns. And I really, really wanna believe that you absolutely mean that 100%. And the way that we're gonna believe and know that is if you show it to us. And the way to show it to us now is by extending that deadline to December 4th. The way to show that to us now is by making sure that this is a committee that is as representative as humanly possible of Santa Barbara's communities of color and demographics, but especially black and indigenous communities. You can show us that by renaming that street to Hutash Street, which is the desire of the Santa Barbara Chumash and many other people in this community. We need to see that change because in order to feel heard, we don't just need to hear that you're listening. We need to see that action has been taken. And that's the other piece of that. And so I'm urging you to consider all of the things that you've heard this afternoon when making those decisions. Remember that that's how to make your constituents feel heard. Thank you. I see the rest of my time. Thanks. Next speaker. Next speaker is Dan Viano, then Ana Rosa Rizzo Santino. Dan Viano, please go ahead. Dan Viano, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Okay, we'll come back to Mr. Viano. Our next speaker is Ana Rosa Rizzo Santino. Please go ahead. Hello, every Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, I am board president of La Casa de la Raza. And I have to say that we do need more time to be able to outreach to the community 
uh, to be able to get applicants um, que hablan español um, and also that don't, um, because we need to make sure that everyone knows that this is even happening. Um, otherwise, we're not going to be able to get the candidates that we really need to be on here. Um, so please extend the deadline to December. We would really appreciate that. Y también, um, as board president, I wanted to uh, also voice our support for the renaming of uh, of um, that offensive name, which I'm not even going to say it, uh, to Hutash Street. Um, it's time for the city of Santa Barbara to stop its glorification of colonization, which killed indigenous people in several ways. The name of the street epitomizes the horrific harm that was done. We must get on the path to repair that harm of settler colonialism and respect our Chumash sisters and brothers. Thank you. Thanks. Did Mr. Viano come back? Ms. Clark? Let's check. Dan Viano, Hello. Dan, there you go. Okay. Oh, wonderful, council members. Hello. So I just, I'm from District 1. I, I always want to focus on my council member, Ms. Gutierrez. But uh, when when I was listening to the meeting today, I noticed everybody was speaking about things that I was surprised. Uh, the, 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 for instance, the police commission. I guess you're 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 planning, you're going forward with a a review board, and I just want to say, you know, the police are doing a, a good job. Uh, if as you go to a review board, do not point, do not put, do not put people that are anarchists or against the law. You know, we see what it's doing to our country. We need to continue to be a law and order city. Uh, as far, I live on Indio Moreto Street between Indio Moreto and Cacique. I walk around the block every single day for a couple blocks. No one in my neighborhood has ever spoken badly of the name of that street. Uh, I think, and this is a very general comment. I, this is not about skin color. This is about thickness of our skins. I think many of the young people and, and I'm sure my parents felt the same way, young people, our skin, their skin is getting too thin. They, they seem to be disrupted by every little thing in life. Uh, and that's all I wanna say. I want, I wanna ask the council to, to, to you know, uh, keep their path, keep this city safe. And again, uh, try to listen to the people that don't speak to you. And that is very hard. I, I live in that neighborhood and, and I don't hear any of my neighbors uh, talking about that street. And again, I, I feel the police department responds and, and they, they hopefully will continue to ma maintain law and order. And when they see uh, something that they need to attend to, they should do it. And uh, I'm glad I got on today and, uh, and thank you all. Take care. Okay. Was that our final speaker, Ms. Clerk? We could take one or two more, but... Um... Yes, Madam Mayor, that's our final okay. uh, speaker on this item. Okay, we'll close uh, public comment for this item um, seven and go to Mr. Jordan, go ahead. Um, this Thank is the time for the council I, to give their deliberative comments. Thanks. I just have another couple questions after oh, question. uh, public okay. comment, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so one is, um, to Ms. Gorman, I think, and that's, um, do we have a comfort feeling internally that we have adequate or full contact information for everybody who is commenting on the, our inability to contact them or get information out? Uh, Council Member Jordan and uh, Madam Mayor and the Council, we do have um, contact information for healing justice representatives, and I would highly encourage any speakers who wish to receive communication, uh, be copied on press releases, any sort of outreach to email me at clerk at santabarbaraca.gov, and we'll make sure that we, we include them in communications. So I think obviously one of the takeaways from comment is that probably press or media releases isn't necessarily the best tool to get to everybody. I don't know what the best tool is for government when we're talking about underrepresented people because they're underrepresented for a reason and that's because government or whoever hasn't been good at finding ways to get them represented. So um, I guess one of the comments I have is part of the burden as it does in the rest of life fall on the organizers or the 
the people who know who the underrepresented are to either help us or function also as intermediaries um, rather than just uh, criticize. Um, the other question I have is, um, we, I share, I know, I know we've talked about upgrading the, the website and I kind of share some of the frustrations whenever I try and look for something in the search bar, not in Google, but in our website uh, search, you know, you get a thousand things while you're just looking for the one. But we have a recent um, web page that's up. I wanna say it's called Racial Justice and Equity Initiatives. And all that's on there is a, um, a link to sign up for notices, but the only news or information that's on there is about the resource allocation study. So then if you wanna find something out, which I spent 10 minutes sitting here doing this while listening to public comment, if you wanna find something else about what I'm sure we're gonna play with the title of this formation commission, you have to know to go to, you either have to know the title and search for it correctly, or you have to go to boards and commissions and drill down through that, which that was not my first choice, even having been inside the system for 15 years as a user. Um, and so I, I guess there's, I, I mean, I have a couple lessons taken away from this hour of public comment, and that's one, and that is that we have a, a racial equity website that does not include link or information to exactly what we're talking about today, the formation commission. So I think internally we could do a better job on for those who do navigate into our electronic media and can do that or are capable of doing that to even help them find these uh, crossways links from where we've decided to land something for one subject versus where we've decided to land something for another subject. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Council member Jordan and, and council. Absolutely. And we can, we'll certainly cross link and, and, merge those together. Okay, that's all I, just a couple couple questions and those comments. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay, thanks. Ms. Uh, Gutierrez and Ms. Snedden, are you still there for your commentary? Um, Ms. Gutierrez, go ahead, please. I would like some clarity. Uh, I think this message is for Mr. Um, City Attorney, Mr. Colon, um, if you can turn on his camera. I want to be very transparent and I also want this clarified. Do, by law, do we need to have law enforcement representative in this formation committee? I, I, I want to, if we don't, I want it to be clear. If we do, why, if there's, you know, a law that we have to obey, I just, I, I want this information out. There's no legal requirement to have law enforcement representatives. Okay, so as the council, we can choose to have or not to have. You can, where we have legal requirements is when the council wants to take action that affects the wages and working conditions for employees, including law enforcement. In some instances then, the city would be required to negotiate the consequences of those decisions. Okay. That was my only question. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Ms. Snedden. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm, I'm going to reiterate a few things that I know that you and I have talked about and some concerns that I continue to have that have come clear in public comment again today. Um, I think it's really clear that we need to have consistent communication and information. I'm very grateful to our city clerk, Ms. Gorman, who has now been sending out emails more regularly, but I myself had a lot of frustration when there were questions about, say, a deadline for when this would be open to, and, and I, I couldn't get an answer, a, a consistent, one clear, consistent answer. And so it's, it's not that we are nefarious. I do want to ask the callers to understand that it's not um, a lie that's happening. It's more that we just don't know and we don't have clear communication amongst ourselves. We have 
some Brown Act issues. We don't get together in a group and, and, and discuss things freely. And, and I do want to bring back to that when we did address originally um, the community demands and requests, we talked about having some type of a summit or coming together at a table together, which we can't do in COVID, but some, some type of mechanism or format for input. And um, what I'm seeing here is sort of a, a real danger of, of we could be doing all the responsive work and, and acting in good faith, but if we're not communicating what we're doing out, and if we also don't have a platform to be receiving input and guidance, then I think we're gonna constantly find ourselves in this loop at meetings where, where people feel that action has happened without them being informed. Then speakers come and speak to us. We sit and listen and then do this awkward staccato talking back. And we're not really having communication. That's not really community building. So um, I, I do wanna ask us to, to seriously look at how we could have some type of a summit or some format for discussion of input and guidance. Um, we could use that. It's not just um, being told what to do or or just, um, I mean, we, we've also heard from some community members that, you know, not to give in to certain demands. I, I think we need to move past all of that and just have open communication back and forth. And we don't currently have a format for that. I think individual council members, we're each having our own conversations. I, I think it's, it's just going sideways in ways that aren't unified. Um, so I would just like to reiterate that I think we need to have some proper format for that to, to invite input and guidance um, and also a way for us to communicate back out um, what is happening within the city. And for us to know, I, I will say myself that trying to find information, I, I couldn't get a clear idea. And I know I've talked to you about um, certain questions that I had, and um, I, I feel like I know some of the answers more now, but but not as many as I'd like to. Um, so I guess I wanna know in the future, what is our plan for that clear and consistent communication? I think um, Ms. Gorman has, has done tremendous work in helping us with that. Um, and then what is our plan for active outreach for this particular formation commission? I mean, we've, we've talked around it, but I think we need an actual plan, um, a list of where outreach will be occurring, to whom, how we are involved in that, how can we assist with that. Um, it's really clear, I think, that everything has to be translated, um, not just bits and pieces, but but all of it. Um, I agree that the title is misleading. Um, to be a, a community formation commission I, I could be forming any kind of community. I don't know what that means. It has no... Um, reference in the title to to the oversight. Um, and again, I, I do want to reiterate that this isn't an indictment of our police. This isn't um, a foregone conclusion of what an oversight committee will will look at. This is this is, I think, will bring about good conversations and transparency about things that are going well also. But we need to have those open clear communications. And I'm, I, I get frustrated when we have so much public comment. I know we all do. And I feel like these are things that we could easily answer if we had a format for communication in that way. So um, I think I, I clearly support extending the deadline. And I would like to know what is our plan for active outreach um, so that we're not just handing it to other people to outreach, but that we're also very involved in that. So I guess that's my questions and my comment. Thanks. I, I would jump in that we did make Sam Ramirez in the city administrator's office, the point person um, for healing justice and any other group that, that has questions about any of these processes. So he 
Mr. Ramirez would also let Healing Justice know, <clears throat> excuse me, when something was on the agenda or when there was something that that was of interest, you know, to them and to the cause. So um, we uh, could, uh, you know, you and I, I'm the mayor, you're the mayor pro tem, we could call for a meeting and and open that dialogue if there's if there's more to go back and forth today uh you know we, you, that's a good question i uh congratulate ms gutierrez for going to uh, the mobile uh, home park and and um looking for people and presenting this opportunity so uh that that is one thing that we can do as individuals we all have um our uh, community connections and uh, that's good. We'll, we'll have Ms. Gorman uh, talk a little bit more about the formal, about the formal outreach. Thank you. Ms. Gutierrez, go ahead. Oh. I would like to encourage my colleagues. Um, I was waiting for this day to, to get the extended, um, to have the this application get ex formally extended to December 4th. Um, to actually start my outreach, but I did start this weekend um, because at least in my district, the mobile home park areas have had good and bad experiences with the police. And um, I've been educating a lot um, about the services of City Hall and what we do. And I just thought it was a great opportunity to go back and have them apply and explain the process to them, they were very overwhelmed. A lot of them were like, this is not going to work. You know, it's, it's my time wasted because of those negative um, experience I've had with law enforcement. But I encouraged them to actually take action. Like this is your chance to, to create a difference in your community. I would love to partner up with any of my colleagues I plan to have a table out on the weekends um, at one of the local parts of my district. I do plan to reach out to the Spanish media and there's also a nonprofit that works with um, people with different types of disabilities and reaching out to them and with the information and how I can be a service. So if maybe as council members, we can team up uh, it's really nice, especially in my district, it, there's a lot of dynamics there. When I have colleagues from other districts come into my district and so they can actually see the difference between districts. I mean, we all represent the city at, at large, but Oscar and I have, sorry, council member um, Oscar Gutierrez and I have districts that are mainly working class um, and Spanish speaking community. Um, so I would really encourage some of my colleagues to kind of partner up. Um, it could be overwhelming um, to be the only council member in front of a lot of community members that don't understand the system and being that one person. So it'd be nice to have somebody else um, there to support. So I don't know if this is something my colleagues would like um, I've done outreaching uh, because I've, you know, the work that I've done in the community and the school district, but I, I would love to, to go and help other colleagues of mine in their districts or share some of my ideas. So this is really nice that we get to talk about this in public. Well, th before I go to Mr. Gutierrez, I would suggest Ms. Gutierrez, if you would come back that if you have a date, if you have a time frame that you will be tabling, let Mr. Ramirez know so he can let Healing Justice know. And also we can put that on the web page that we've created so that there's interest for people who have an interest in these issues. And would you like to make the motion, Ms. Gutierrez, to move this forward? Because it seems like we are supportive of the extension to December 4th. Yes, I would like to make the motion to extend the application to December 4th. Thank you. I'll second. Okay. And your comments then, Mr. Gutierrez, go ahead, thank please. You, Madam Mayor. Yes, I'd like to just uh, um, thank uh, uh, Council Member Alejandra Gutierrez and, and tell her that I'd, I'd be glad to help her out with that outreach. And, and I'd like to just 
apologize to the community and to the members of Healing Justice for the lack of communication that we've done on our part. And you know, we heard you, and we're hearing you, and we're we're going to be doing better. I have been making an effort to post as much of this information on as many social media platforms. I'm not necessarily aware of of some of the um, followers on these platforms. I was just encouraged by people in the community to post there. So um, I hope that's not misinterpreted in any way, but I'll, I'll do better to get more followers. It's just, it's, it's hard to try to convince people to follow you on social media. So um, hopefully if you all share my posts and more people would start to follow us on social media so they can see that what we're posting and how we can post it better and, and it be more informative. Um, and yeah, with that, I'll support the, the motion. Thanks. Any other comments from the council? We have a motion on the floor to extend the application deadline uh, to December 4th. The applications are available now. I believe they've been available since September 17th. Um, and I'm glad to hear from the representative from Casa de la Raza that she and her group that they're doing outreach and recruiting people to apply to. So uh, good, that's good news. Okay, well, let's have a roll call vote and I will be voting for the motion as well. Thanks. Very good. And this is a motion for the staff recommendation motion by council member Alejandra Gutierrez seconded by Councilmember Oscar Gutierrez. Councilmember Alejandro Gutierrez. Yes. Mayor Pratem Sneddon. Yes. Councilmember Friedman. Yes. Councilmember Harmon. Yes. Councilmember Oscar Gutierrez. Yes. Councilmember Jordan. Yes. And Mayor Maria. Aye. Okay, so that was unanimous. Thank you uh, to everyone who participated in this item. Let's go ahead and start the next item, but we will take a break in the middle of that, depending on the number of public comment uh, speakers. Um, we try to always take a break two hours after uh, we start our meeting to give our interpreters uh, a break. So Ms. Clerk, item number... Eight, please. Item eight, request from the Barbarano Tumash Tribal Council to rename India Muerto Street to Hutash Street. Recommendation of the Council A, consider the request from the Barbarano Tumash Tribal Council to rename India Muerto Street to Hutash Street and B, adopt by reading of title only, a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara renaming all of India Muerto Street between South Salina Street and South Milpa Street to Hutash Street. Okay. Mr. Four, are you our presenter? Once he's unmuted, okay. yes, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Matt Four, I'm the Senior Assistant to the City Administrator. I'm here with a couple of folks. I'm here with Adam Hindle, who's the Principal uh, Engineer with uh, Public Works Department, and also Angela Oslin, the Facilities Manager, who happens to also be the Staff Liaison to the Neighborhood Advisory Council. So this will be uh, I'll give the presentation handoff part of it to Mr. Hendel, and then we'll all be here for questions and answers if you need us. Uh, we're here today to uh, bring an item to you related to a request the city administrator received, um, and let me get my slides going here, to rename uh, Indio Muerto Street in its entirety uh, to Hutosh Street. And Indio Muerto is uh, a word that means dead Indian, and the Barbarano Chumash Tribal Council, the proponents of this um, request have requested that Indio Muerto be renamed to Hutosh Street, which means Earth Mother. This slide shows uh, the physical boundaries of what we are uh, talking about. The, the blue line is the, or the limit lines showing that Indio Muerto to the north would be renamed from South Salina Street all the way to South Milpa Street, south of the US 101 freeway. The yellow circles that you see there are 
the address points of homes and businesses along Indio Muerto Street. And so the what you can see from this slide is that um, south of the freeway between the US 101 and Milpas, it's primarily commercial and industrial, and the yellow rings north of the freeway to South Salinas is a mix of single family homes and multi-unit properties. The municipal code chapter 22.48 outlines the process for renaming a city facility. It's fairly straightforward. It says that first a person, uh, and that can be a, a individual or a group, um, submits a request to the city administrator. In this case, the Barbarano Chumash Tribal Council in June of this year submitted a request to the city administrator to rename Indio Muerto Street. The city administrator then referred the request to, a, to the Neighborhood Advisory Council, which in this case was the designated city advisory group, to consider the request, review it in light of the municipal code, and then make a recommendation to council. Uh, and then what we're here today for is for city council to also consider the request. And if council chooses to do so, you could adopt the resolution that's part of this packet uh, that would formalize the renaming. The municipal code also uh, outlines several principles, policies, and priorities. I'm not gonna go through all of these, they're fairly numerous, but I'm gonna call out a couple of them. And the first is uh, item A, that the existing name is found to be inappropriate. This is really the crux of the request by the Barbarano Chumash Tribal Council that the name of Indio Muerto Street is indeed inappropriate. Um, by way of background, and it's in your staff report, um, Neil Grappi, the local historian, uh, describes that um, Indio Muerto Street was given its name during the Haley survey of the mid 1800s when a deceased Native American was found during that survey uh, and the, the name was, uh, the street was subsequently named. The other principal policy and priority I'd uh, call your attention to is item F, and that's the regarding the proliferation of names for different parts of the same facility. Now, in this case, facility means street. And so um, in this case, it, it, uh, the, the request does align with the municipal code because all of Indio Muerto Street from South Salinas to South Milpas would be named. So there would be no subdivision or no multitude of, of names. Related to the, the name change, so if city council does approve this name change, a couple of things would happen. That, uh, one of those would be updated street signs. And so uh, we, we, the city, the public works department would procure new street signs. And for some time, we would likely have both the old name and the new name up to, for, way, for wayfinding, sorry, wayfinding uh, assistance so that people uh, visitors, tourists, locals even uh, would understand the old name of the new name. The cost to uh, procure those new signs and install them is not that much. Our estimate is about $1,500. And the second uh, step would be for the city to send an address letter to all the affected property owners along Indio Muerto Street. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Hendel, who's going to go into more detail about what the formal implementation might look like. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council, Adam Hindle, Principal Engineer in Public Works. Um, just a few things uh, to highlight here. As, as Matt said, once the City Council approves of this name change, there's some, some formalities that have to happen to get it done. Um, and it comes in the form of the, the street sign change and an address letter, which I'll go into a little bit more on the next slide. So in terms of uh, physically changing the address, there's some notifications that have to occur. Um, primarily the updates are about uh, updating land-based records, not, not your personal records, but things like um, the county assessor, the public utilities, updating our internal city maps, uh, the post office, county elections, things that, um, that run with the land. Um, so that address letter will go out to the property owners and the tenants 
and also notify all these uh, public public entities and public utilities. Next slide, please. So in terms of implementing the, the name change and the impact on the residents and businesses, from what we can tell, um, most of these properties just have the address number posted. There's no Indio Muerto posted on the buildings. So the physical cost to residents is minimal or, or none. They don't have to change their postings. Um, but there is an administrative burden that folks will have to go through both businesses and residences to update their, their business and legal records. Um, things that aren't land-based records. Um, an example would be uh, the DMV going, um, just like when you move, you can do an address change with the DMV online and then, and then carry the address change card in your wallet. And then the last bullet point here is um, property titles. So um, real property is defined by legal descriptions or maps. Uh, addresses are um, kind of an, 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 infor an informally known as a certain address. So when we send out this address letter, all of the properties addresses will change automatically and people will obtain title to their property. Next slide, please. So the post office, uh, city staff reached out to the post office about this. Um, they, they do not notify other agencies, um, the IRS, Social Security Office, et cetera. Those are, are personal uh, responsibilities of the different individuals, but they do forward mail. So when we set a date for this name change, the post office will forward mail for up to a year, uh, just like when you move an address. So if an address is uh, 1200 Indio Muerto Street um, and you haven't updated your record yet, um, the post office will forward that to 1200 Futash for up to a year. Next slide. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Matt to talk a little bit more about the public engagement on this. Thank you, Adam. Um, so in terms of public engagement, you know, in addition to very widespread media coverage on this, uh, the city did uh, get the word out through a number of social media outlets and, and uh, next door and things like that. The, one of the real uh, key things that we, we did was in relation to the Neighborhood Advisory Council meeting of August 10th. And so for that, uh, for that meeting, we took a couple of steps to, uh, to really make sure we engaged the community in the, in the realm of Spanish language translation. And so the entire agenda packet, the staff report, the request by the Barbareño Chumash Tribal Council, all of the supporting documentation was translated into Spanish. We also, for the first time since this COVID pandemic, we, we actually provided real-time Spanish translation over the GoToWebinar platform for that meeting. And then lastly, and this was real, this proved to be very effective. We set up a dedicated email address for this project, street naming at Santa Barbara CA.gov. We received several hundred um, uh, comments on this item. And we also use that to push out information and notice of today's meeting, for example. Uh, sorry. The, at that August 10th, uh, Neighborhood Advisory Council, the NAC, they did consider the request in light of the principles and policies and priorities that I reviewed earlier. And the NAC voted unanimously to recommend that City Council rename Indio Muerto Street in its entirety uh, in uh, from South Salinas all the way to South Milpa Street to Hutosh Street. So in terms of next steps, and this is if, if council were to uh, approve the street name change through the adoption of the resolution, then a couple things would happen, as Mr. Hendel said, the first would be procuring the new street signs. The second would be sending the address letter to all the affected property owners. And then thirdly would be for city staff to conduct an informational workshop in English and Spanish to assist residents and businesses to prepare for that change. So things like, um, you know, DMV uh, changing uh, driver's license addresses and things like that, the timing, uh, what the post office will do, what the post office won't do, the fact that the voter registration rolls 
and the county assessor information for property titles is automatically updated. But in order to give the residents and businesses time to prepare uh, to, and for us to procure and install those street signs, we have dated the resolution December 14th of 2020 for this change to take place. Uh, with us today, um, and, well, I'm sorry, so I'll finish this, but so our recommendation today is to consider the request from the Barbarano Chumash Tribal Council. And then if council chooses, you do have the option to adopt that resolution that would affect the name change. With us today are members of the Barbarano Chumash Tribal Council. Uh, they have a short presentation um, for council and uh, so we can we can do that now if you if Madam Mayor if you're up for that we can bring them online. That would be appropriate as part of the presentation. Okay, to give our a, council. Give us a few seconds to bring them on board here. So Madam Mayor, Mr. Marcus Lopez with the Chumash Tribal Council should be on. And as he speaks, uh, we will bring the rest of his, his folks on board. Mr. Lopez, are you, are you here? Yes, I am. Can you see me and hear me? We can hear you. Welcome, sir. And Mr. Ford, if you can start the, um, the uh, artistic um, presentation that I requested, that'll be really appropriate. Thank you very much. Hello, um, my name is Marcus Victor Lopez, Chairman of the Barbarino Chumash Tribal Council and Senior Captain of the Tumul, former Captain of the Tiat and Executive Producer of American Indian Airways, 90, uh, KPFK, also KZAALP and KLBP in Long Beach. I will now introduce a member of the Governing Council of the Barbarino Chumash Tribal Council. She is also daughter of Bob and Natalie Rivera Pastwood of the Santa Barbara, who was the only Chumash ever to visit a president of the United States, Starla Batiste. Thank you, Marcus. No one can deny that Indio Muerto is demeaning and horribly offensive to the Chumash community. It's very difficult to speak about our history once those from other lands came here but these people all viewed us as less than human. Our history filled with suffering through attempted physical and cultural genocide, slavery, having our land stolen, and discrimination. We carry this history in our hearts every day of our lives, and that cannot be changed. But we can make a small change today. I urge the city council to approve the street name change to Hutash, a name that will represent positivity to Chumash people. This is an opportunity to do a good thing for all to see. Do this for the sake of our children and future generations. I am hopeful that we all want our youth to be respectful, be respectful. and accepting of all colors of people, just as we want them to honor all life. We have the responsibility to be good role models for our youth, to set good examples. We are responsible for teaching our children to be good human beings. Teach them that we are all sacred beings who deserve to be respected and honored. Do this small thing to honor our Chumash ancestors. This is but a small gesture that will be observed by our youth. It will provide a sense of hope for what good can be accomplished into their futures when Stop. good people work together. Everyone benefits if this is approved. Our children are watching 
and learning from our words and actions. We are all related. Thank you. Next speaker is Stephen Villa, member of the Governing Council, the Bartolino Chumash Tribal Council. He's also a captain of the Tomo. He's the Smoish language director of the Bartolino Chumash Tribal Council. Stephen Villa. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Villa. Is Mr. V, are you there? Then next we'll go to uh, Marisa Sullivan. She is a chairwoman of the Coastal Band of the Chumash Nation. And Mr. Ford, can you continue the uh, artistic presentation in the background, please? Thank you very much. Now uh, I want to introduce Marisa Sullivan. Haku, Haku. Good afternoon, City Council and Madam Mayor. My name is Marisa Sullivan. I am Tribal Chair for the Coastal Band of the Chumash Nation. I'm here to represent the voices of Indigenous people who have always been offended by a street name that means dead Indian. It's hard to believe it's taken this long to address this. It's not hard to believe that it has taken recent heartbreaking events to make it happen. I understand it will be quite an undertaking that it involves more than just a swapping out of a street sign, but it will be worth it. I also want to lend my support to the majority of the voices you heard earlier today, asking you to include them into the Community Formation Commission. Thank you. Next, we have the uh, James Ramos. The assembly member of the James Ramos, he represents the 40th district, assembly district, which covers most of San Bernardino County and is the first California Native American elected to the state legislation. Assembly member Ramos is a longtime member of the Great Serrano and Cahuilla tribe and a long, lifelong resident of the San Manuel Reservation. Mr. James Ramos. We need to unmute the assembly member, please. Well, thank you. Can you hear me now? Well, thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Mayor Murillo and, and Chairman Lopez and to the Chumash people for allowing me to speak. We came aware of um, the situation in the state legislature and along with my colleagues, um, Senator Hannah Beth Jackson and assembly member Monique Lamont, we wrote a letter signed by um, several legislators in the state capitol that the, the name change um, is something that should move forward. And hopefully the council will adopt the resolution to move, move the, the name from what it currently is to the Hutesh honoring all Chumash people in the area and also honoring all California Indian people in the state of California. Some say, well, why does a name mean so much? It means so much because for the first time we'll be able to say that the horrid past and, and the atrocities genocide inflicted on Californian people is now being addressed by a local city council that would move forward to adopt this resolution to rightfully honor the Chumash people. And what makes this uh, a way to do that was it by including the Indian people in the discussion in general. Certainly, it's the things that we are moving forward on we did write a letter and the governor, the governor just on Friday announced um, to review the names of state parks and different facilities in the state. So now it's, it's a area from the state to the local areas that and jurisdictions to be able to look at um, these names. Certainly this takes a lot. And I know that when you look at the horrid past of the history of the state of California, it starts with going back to these types of issues, issues that have been overlooked for so long that now we could start the true impact of what has happened to the California people and start that healing process to start to move our people forward. Certainly you could see that with its impact on education, impact on high suicide rates, um, the different social ills that are there. This is a chance for this council and the surrounding Chumash people 
to come together to pave the way for other local jurisdictions to open up and hear the voice of the local Indian people in their own backyard of what they find offensive to make that change. I encourage the city council to adopt this resolution and to change this inappropriate name that has been there for so long. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ramos. Next is Fidel Rodriguez, QMAS historian and a member of our QMAS community. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Mayor and City Council. My name is Fidel Rodriguez. I was born and raised in Santa Barbara. For 25 years, I have analyzed American history and the genocide of Native Americans and Africans. Most of us have passed the New Marco Street, dead Indian, hundreds of times, completely unconscious of its subversive and overt meaning and completely unaware of the impact that it has had on Native Americans. The psychological effects of a symbol of white supremacy that represents a well-documented genocide has been socially and psychologically devastating and detrimental to people of Native American ancestry. Dead Indian Street is like a dehumanizing commercial broadcasting every day, a direct message that says, you don't exist and don't matter, right into your subconscious. And the reality is that everyone is subjected to this inhumane symbol that Indians' lives don't matter. Dead Indian Street was established in Santa Barbara when the city was being developed in 1851. During the mapping of the city, Captain Haley discovered the remains of a deceased Indian, hence he called the street Indian Muerto Street. Here are some of uh, other concrete examples of white supremacy and the barbaric effects of Native Americans in Santa Barbara and California. When the United States officially annexed California in 1848, the total number of Chumash was estimated at 1,150, a number that was approximately 8,000 at the beginning of the mission period in the 1780s. In 1848, an American settler described white superiority and the white man's burden when he said, quote, we desire only a white population in California. Even the Indians amongst us, as far as we have seen, are more of a nuisance than a benefit to the country. We would like to get rid of them. Between 1850 and 1861, some 3,456 militiamen enrolled in 24 volunteer militia expeditions and killed more than 1,342 California Indians. However, their impact was greater than these numbers suggest, hence Dead Indian Street. This is an important context to understand because it mirrors the political rhetoric of the time. In 1851, California Governor Peter Burnett stated the state address, set the stage for legally sanctioned genocidal crimes against Indians, where he stated, quote, that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct, end quote. This history is compounded and added to the millions of Native Americans who were killed in the 17th and 18th centuries. Here are some of the different ways they were murdered. They had been hacked apart with axes and swords, scalped for bounty, trampled under horses, hanged on meat hooks, hunted as game, fed to dogs, burned alive, thrown over the sides of ships at sea, worked to death, raped, starved to death during many forced marches, and deliberately infected with diseases. When you reflect on the historical facts and the political and racist rhetoric of the times, the concept of a dead Indian was not pulled out of thin air. It was white supremacy at its finest. It was a direct message to all Native Americans then and now that you are subhuman. When Captain Haley found a dead Indian during his survey, the culture was already in place that promoted the extermination of Indians. Dead Indian Street was simply a reflection of the cultural norms of the era. Yet, Dead Indian Street, Indio Muerto, is still, with us, is still with us in 2020. We humbly ask you to be respectful of our ancestors and us. We ask you to do what is right. We ask you to change the entire street, Indio Muerto, that which is clearly inappropriate to Hutash, known as Earth Mother. It is time to heal. We are all connected. We are all one. Love heals. Thank you. I'm going to call on next of the fourth grade student, Jasmine Dominguez. And um, because of time, I know she has to go home, but she's been waiting all this time. So I, so I hope the, uh, the council uh, excuses her and I wanted to talk for uh, a couple of minutes. Thank you. Uh, Jasmine Dominguez.
Hi, my name is Jasmine Brazil Dominguez. I am nine years old and I'm in fourth grade. I live in Ventura County. I just found out there's a street named Indiana Muerto. Since I speak Spanish, I know what it means. It means dead Indian. And I think that is really sad because there are still Native Americans alive and it's very offensive to them. Some people think all Chumash people are dead because in the past, people forced Chumash to not follow their culture, to forget their culture. It is painful to the Barbario Chumash because they live in Santa Barbara and to see the street name every day, it is just painful. We know that Chumash suffered a lot, so a big representation would help the Chumash to keep their culture alive. Representation matters to everyone because if it is about your community or you, you can feel proud and people can know about it if it is a big representation. It would be important to see Chumash monuments in Ventura County because I will see them and they too will see it. Others will hopefully be interested about the monuments and wonder why they made them. It would also help in learning a true story of the Chumash people and what happened. I don't know Santa Barbara too well, so I would put monuments in the most popular places in Santa Barbara so that everyone can see them. I would like to see the street name change to Hutosh in the future so that more people can be aware of a true good story of the Chumash people and their culture. Also, I would let not also I would like not only Santa Barbara to know the history, but for their stories to spread to other places like my county, Ventura County. The message that I would like to share to the city council is that it is important to change the street name from dead Indian or Indio Muerto to Hutosh so that they are not offended in my generation gets to learn about the people that originally lived here many years ago. It feels like we are still bullying them by keeping that street name. And I know that as a city, as a county, as good people, we can do better. If you put yourself in the Chumash shoes and saw that street name, I am sure you would feel sad and offended because after reading the sign, you would probably still feel like uh, if others don't care about you. They probably feel this every day with that street name as a reminder of the past when they were not wanted or liked. Instead, I want to see a street name that I can learn from, not one that I feel bad about. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Dominguez. Now, lastly, the Stephen Villa. Good, he came back, thanks. Stephen, you on? Mr. Villa, you can unmute yourself. Don't think you have a webcam, but there you go. We can hear you. Hapu, hapu. Speak up, speak louder. Stephen Via Kaki, eh, Sanakipnas Hill Ki Iu, Ki Ita Hill Ki Ak Aklu, Ki Kili Ushkal, Ki Chapman Hill Ki Ishnanish, Ki Akshwala Hill Lapanish Ki E Hill Shuk. Hil kuku hil ki akbuyu ieti iet la lishao. Pitinas hil chalayas hutash ki akinaliu tasho. Ki watnan. Thank you. Well, I couldn't, I, I could not hear him. So. I, I could the, barely hear him, but I, 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 I did could hear, him. hear him too. Yeah. So I did something. Um, we, uh, something went wrong. So we will go now. That will be the end of our a, our presentation, Madam Mayor and uh, the City Council members and staff. Uh, if there are any questions that you have for us, please, um, this is the time. Uh, we have a couple of people that can maybe some answer some other questions um, within this um, uh, historic discussion. Thank you, 
Uh, Mr. Lopez, uh, Madam Chair Sullivan, Assembly Member Ramos, uh, Mr. Rodriguez and Mr. Villa and Ms. Dominguez, Jasmine, thanks. Thanks. So um, Mr. Rodriguez, if you would um, hold tight for just a second, Sebastian Aldana, who chairs our um, Neighborhood Advisory Council is, uh, is, can make a comment at this point as that was the advisory body that uh, is making the recommendation today. Mr. Aldana, are you on the call and ready to uh, let the city council know what happened at your uh, meeting? Can you hear? Yes, I'm right okay. here. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, well, we, well uh, we, we heard the presentation and uh, and we understood and everybody uh, was in favor, you know. Uh, they did want the whole street, you know, from Milpas to uh, Salinas. <clears throat> so that was uh, agreed upon. Um, and let me see, the only, I, I did receive an email today. I, I forwarded it to you guys and did, did you receive it? From from uh, from the, the the business owners from Santa Barbara Chemical Corporation. Yes, we received that. Oh, okay. So I would just because uh, I know there was supposed to be some type of communication, and it looks like there wasn't. Uh, I would just ask that uh, that there be communication. But other than that, uh, it was unanimous. Uh, Where everybody was for it. And it's uh, long overdue. I, I would concur with the uh, Barbarino Shumash tribe. Representatives from that business may be in public comment. And I did leave a message for the business owner, Mr. Aldana. So thank you. And let's take questions from the city council at this point. I think after we have questions, we would take a short break and then do public comment because it's well past four o'clock. Mr. Jordan, would you like to start the questioning? Happy to. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think my question is for Mr. Four. So I'm, I'm trying to read through between the lines on the outreach and I'm confused. Do we not do a uh, postal mailing to um, each of the addresses that would be affected by this change? Councilman Jordan, Madam Mayor, we did not. Okay. And then um, how did we end up years ago making a decision on Salsa Cuetas and Cale Cesar Chavez to be split of a facility, so to speak? Mr. Jordan, before you move on to that question, Mr. Lopez might be able to tell us that they did go door to door. Uh, to some of the resident, I think all of the residences and uh, perhaps the businesses. Mr. Marcus Lopez, are you there uh, to, to speak to the question of outreach? Yes, we had outreach um, with a team that went up and down the street. Uh, we uh, we had also, I think, um, uh, uh, Barbara Savage, if you are um, on the line, if you hear us, uh, tell us about a little bit that addresses uh, uh, Councilman Jordan's um, part of his questions as far as outreach. Uh, could you share some of the information with us that you have? Um, yes, Marcus, my pleasure. So, and Barbara, first of all, Barbara Savage is the a member of, excuse me, is part of the uh, Tribal Trust Fund. Tribal Trust Foundation, yes. Okay. Founder and director. Um, and I do hope that the that the um, Madam Mayor and, and Council members that you have you received the petition that I submitted last week. It was um, 423 page petition that was signed by over 9,200 people. We were the Tribal Trust um, did the petition on Change.org, and we were just actually honestly surprised. At the response, we act, we actually closed down the petition after it, re, you know, it got to that number because we realized that that it could just go on and on. Um, but everyone that signed the petition believed that the name was disrespectful to Native peoples and it showed a disregard for the original inhabitants of this land. 
and they were they stand in, they were standing in solidarity with our indigenous brothers and sisters of the Santa Barbara region. Um, I think it's a although most of those I believe a lot of the, if not most of the signatures were from California, it it actually did reach you know the uh, U.S. and global as the internet is. And I I I what became aware of the fact that something like this, so it, it seems like it's a minor you know small. Um, very local issue, but in fact, it's not. It's like Black Lives Matters. It's really could, about. Could that. I just interrupt you for a second? I really just wanted information oh, on sorry. door to door outreach similar to a mailing to the owners and residents to be affected by the name change. Yes, we did. Yeah, thank you, Barbara. Yes, we, uh, uh, yes, we did. Uh, okay. We went door to door. And uh, we reached out to uh, uh, two businesses. One person we were supposed to talk to, but they, they were going to set up their Zoom account, but they never did. So um, we have we we know some of the issues. We talked about that issue, um, um, Council uh, Council Member Jordan, as far as the cost, and we try to make and reach out to those different businesses. It seems like two ships in the night passed each other. We want to continue that discussion and we want to make sure that the cost is minimal, even to people within the residence regarding some of the um, um, financial constraints they might have. And we want to, within this workshop, which is I thought was really timely, that the city establish a workshop in order to say, what is that going to mean? How is it going to reflect that? And we are even eager to work with the different businesses. There are approximately five businesses and 40 homes that are affected and that we want to work with each and uh, one uh, one of them in order to discuss, especially the businesses. First of all, the houses, individuals, what is it going to take? For example, the cost, and then in turn, the businesses, what particular businesses, what are they their constraints within that, what they're concerned with in that, and go from there. But we have reached out already, and in one instance is that we have um, um, that the business owner wanted to organize it, never got back to us. Okay, thank you, You're Mr. Far. Mr. Far, if you come back and answer a second question, that was how we ended up with split names on Cali Cesar Chavez and Salsa Cuevas. Uh, Councilmember Jordan, Madam Mayor, that was a name change several years ago to change part of South Cepeda's to Calle Cesar Chavez. It went through the same process that's outlined in the municipal code today. Um, so it followed the same code. And ultimately council decided to change that, that portion of the name. Do you know the reason that it didn't mash up with whatever that was, bullet F or whatever? I, I don't. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you. Um, anyone else with questions at this point for Mr. Four or for uh, Mr. Lopez or any of the other presenters? Okay. Well, Mr. Four, I, I, I do remember that the committee, the advisory board, so this is going back to Salsa Puedes. The advisory board couldn't find that Salsa Puedes was an inappropriate name, but they sent it to city council and city council made the, the name change anyway. I think that might be what Mr. Uh, for, or Mr. Jordan was uh, orbiting around. Ms. Gutierrez, questions? No, I'm just ready to, you know, put the motion in place, but when you're ready. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll go back to you uh, after public comment and after a short break. We need to give our interpreters a break and our uh, uh, technical people 10 minutes firm. Um, this meeting is in recess.
2020 meeting of the Santa Barbara City Council. We're on item number eight, the request from the Barbara New Chumas Tribal Council to rename Indio Muerto Street to Hutas Street. And we are starting in on our public comment. Thanks, Mr. Gutierrez and my other colleagues for coming onto the screen uh, during public comment. And Ms. Gorman, are people ready? Is anyone raising their hand? I assume we have people wanting to speak on this item. Yes, Madam Mayor, uh, we have a number of speakers on this item. We will have Michelle Sevilla, Neil Graffy, Brian Trotwine, Mark Alvarado, Matt Lowe, 
and Eric Cardenas as our first speakers. So Matt Lowe, you are number six. You may wish to unmute yourself. I will unmute you now and you can unmute yourself as we get to you. One moment, please, Mayor and Council. And I know that Assembly Member Monique Lamon had wanted to speak and she had to leave for um, a four o'clock uh, appointment that she couldn't break. So I know her staff person might have comments for us. And that's right. And uh, Michelle Sevilla is um, uh, Assembly Member Lamon's representative. So Michelle Sevilla, please go ahead. Good afternoon, City Council. Just confirming that you can hear me. Yes, perfect. perfect. Thank you so much. I know that uh, Monique was holding on to the call as much as she could, uh, but had to hop off, as you said, for another legislative matter. So I am honored to speak on her behalf. She would like to thank the coalition efforts of the multiple bands of Chumash that, uh, encover, uh, that encompass most of her district and for inviting her to present her thoughts to city council today. She grew up and lived on the east side for many, many decades. The discussion about changing this street name is past due. We live, work, and stand on what has been Chumash land for more than 10,000 years. She's grateful to the Chumash community for their historical and ongoing stewardship and leadership of the land. We must correct the street name, which is offensive. At a local, state, and national level, our communities are grappling with difficult discussions around race, justice, and equity. While we look inward as individuals and what each of those words mean to us, our friends, family, and neighbors, we must look forward and correct mistakes made in our history. She looks forward to honoring the Chumash and their historical and ongoing contributions to our community, as well as honoring Earth Mother in the proposed name of Hutash Street. Thank you very much. Thanks. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Neil Graffy, then Brian Trotwine, Mark Alvarado, Matt Lowe, Eric Cardenas, James Yi. Neil Graffy, please go ahead. I'm unmuted. We can hear you. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of council. Um, despite all the rhetoric that Indio Muerto reflects a racist, hateful name, it simply is not true. It has absolutely nothing to do with all the charges that have been wrapped around it. As with many of Santa Barbara's original street names, the name was given due to where the street led or passed through. In this case, during Salisbury Haley's survey to lay out the streets and blocks for Santa Barbara, a deceased Indian was found. There is no historic account of how he died or exactly when he died, but the body was intact enough it was identifiable as a male and an Indian. Most likely he passed away between February and May of 1851. Whatever happened, his death was significant enough for the community that the future street was named as it led to or near to where he was found. The street was not named by Salisbury Haley, as been stated earlier. It was named by Judge Joaquin Carrillo, Antonio Maria de la Guerra, and Eugene Lease. And I might mention that both Mr. Carrillo and Mr. de la Guerra were members of the city council and also served as mayor, both during the American periods and during the Mexican periods. And worth mentioning also is that 10 of the original 51 street names reflect the Chumash. The simple fact is for 169 years, Indio Muerto Street is the only monument to the burial place of an unknown Native American who died alone in the empty fields of Santa Barbara. I've done a lot of research on this street and I'm fairly certain he was buried where he was found. To rename this street is to remove his headstone and any memory of his existence. Uh, I'm on city council, street, so I'm not, I don't have one to talk. Um, the street is like the tomb of the unknown soldier, and more than that, a reminder that he is not alone. There are thousands of like thousands of others like him throughout California. And Muerto should be seen as a memorial to them all. I do have a few clues I've uncovered that may lead to the identity of this man due to COVID-19 closures and travel problems, I've not had access to the needed material to prove my findings. If this street is to ever be renamed, it should bear the name of the man who actually died there 169 years ago. 
I'd like to add that this name change does not have the support of all Chumash people. As one of my Chumash friends wrote, quote, Indio Muerto does not celebrate death. Rather, it commemorates an actual event tied to a place. It is not offensive to the Chumash people, and to remove the name is to erase our history, end quote. Thank you all very much. Thanks. Next any questions, I'll help out. Yeah, Madam Mayor, would, would you mind if I ask a question? Mr. Graffi, are you still there? I'm still here, thank you. Mr. Gutierrez, go ahead. Mr. Graffi, you said that 10 of the original 50 streets were related or honoring the Chumash, is that correct? That is correct. Can you tell me which ones they are? Um, not off the like, top of my head, we'll just shoot through it. Uh, well, Yananale Street, Valerio Street, Pito Street, Cacique Street, uh, Carpinteria Street, and quite a few more. It's actually on the talk that I did for the Historical Museum a few weeks ago. I sent you all the link to that. I mentioned all the 10 streets. Uh, I appreciate that. So are those the original, is that the original dialect in which you would pronounce that? Or is that the Spanish version of the Chumash word? Of what, like Isle or Yananale, and oh, Anacapa and Anapamu are two that are in the Chumash language as a Yananale. So there are three streets. Isle Street is also an Indian word. There, it's not positive it is a if it is a Chumash word or not, but it was a essential food for the Chumash people. So, uh, so we do have three names that are actually in the Chumash language, and we would never pronounce them as the Chumash originally would have. They are. Uh, a good learning experience and to try to spell them would be another interesting feat. Okay, thank you. Now, just from my understanding that they're, they're not actually pronounced correctly. Oh, they're definitely not pr pronounced correctly. Uh, I've talked to John Johnson about that and to many Chumash speakers and it's just the way that the newcomers heard these words and wrote them down and it got translated into what we hear as Anacapa, Anapamu, but something like Anacapa is like Anyapak, and I'm not even coming close to it, but it's similar to that. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. Thank you. We'll move to the next speaker, please. Next speaker is Brian Trotwine, then Mark Alvarado, then Matt Lowe, Eric Cardenas, James Yee, Lauren Mindell. Brian Trotwine. Brian Trotwine, please go ahead. Good afternoon, Mayor Murillo and City Council members. I'm Brian Troutwine, Environmental Analyst and Watershed Program Coordinator with the Environmental Defense Center. EDC strongly supports the proposed name change to Hutash Street. We believe this is an important step towards healing racial divides in our community and bringing people and cultures together. It is a way to begin to correct a serious cultural wrong in Santa Barbara's past in the naming and retention of the current street name, which EDC chooses not to speak aloud because it is so offensive. I and EDC remember when this name change was first proposed many years ago. It is long overdue. It is a way to honor, respect, restore, and begin to recover Chumash culture, which was nearly extinguished by European colonization and conquest in the Americas. EDC stands firm with our progressive friends in the black, indigenous, and people of color community. EDC believes this city council should immediately change the name to Hutash Street, which means Earth Goddess, today, and take down all of the offensive street signs today. Thank you very much for your time, your work, and your attention to EDC's comments. Very good. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Mark Alvarado. Mark Alvarado, please go ahead. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, thank you for um, hearing this item. You know, as an eighth generation Santa Barbara, and um, my family goes way back with the Chumash peoples here locally. Um, I myself am not Chumash by blood, but um, but indigenous through other uh, Mexican roots, but uh, we've married into the Armenta family. 
here, um, specifically up in the San Inez band. And so um, this speaks to a lot of us Mexican-Americans, Chicanos. Uh, our skin is not brown by chance. There's a reason why we look the way we do. And it's because of our indigenous roots that are scattered throughout Mexico and throughout North America, so to speak. So this speaks to us as well. So I just wanted to mention that. And I also wanted to mention, you know, that you are gonna get some pushback from other groups um, that are feeling um, that they might not have been a part of this process um, and they're gonna speak out against what the Barbarinos are proposing. Um, you know, I think that's uh, something that's more of a, a within a family. And I think you're gonna get that sometimes, but I think that the merit of what is before you and what is meaningful before you is more paramount than anything else. So I appreciate the time and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Great. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Matt Lowe. Matt Lowe, please go ahead. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, Mayor Murillo and council members, uh, thank you for hearing this item today and I appreciate the um, neighborhood advisory council that moved this forward. Um, I believe this is very important for our times as we're moving in healing and repair. Um, I do transformative and restorative justice work and we are in the process, the early stages of a reparative and healing process right now. The phase is called the re-education and demonumentalizing. Right now we're taking down a monument of colonization. Um, the newcomers, the quote unquote newcomers, the settler, settler colonialist um, that did this work that um, saw um, and named this street um, is what we are healing from because this is a monument to white supremacy and colonialism. And so this is what we are healing from and changing as a landmark in our community. We encountered a time of re-education today for us to reset our eyes um, and what would be a healing process so that way we cannot encounter harm in our community and that way we can start to move forward and hear the truths of the harms in our community in their full capacity. And so I encourage you to move forward um, with full force with the rename of the street in support of the Barbarino and Chumash um, community and how we move forward in the rest of this restorative process is up to the rest of the community. And we heard from an individual er earlier in previous comments on that he does not that he did not see harm in this name, um, and his fa his family had not seen harm in this name, and that it is not a bad thing. And I think this is the general opinion of our community, and this is why we need to address the harm because the fact that we do not see this harm as a harmful thing in our in in our community is the problem, and we need to do more reeducation in our community if we're really going to follow and move forward in the path of repair and healing that is called for to be a whole and healed community that is inclusive and loving for each person here. Thank you for moving forward on this street rename and I fully encourage this. Thank you. Very good. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Eric Cardenas, James Yee, Lauren Mendel, Simone Roskamp, Simon Clifford, Sam Cohen. Eric Cardenas, please go ahead. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Murillo and members of the City Council. Thank you so much for hearing this item today. I'd like to thank your staff as well. They've been uh, great in, in shepherding this process through. And I'd specifically like to thank the many community members who have brought this issue up to the point where finally it is actionable. Um, I think a lot of us have been waiting for this. My name is Eric Cardenas. I'm the Chief of Operations of LOACOM. We're a marketing agency on East Haley Street. Um, I, I co-own the company with my business partner, David Fortson. Um, I've lived and worked in downtown Santa Barbara for 20 years and uh, lived here for a little bit longer than that. If I could count the number of times that I told myself to contact my city council representatives, um, about this name and, and the idea of a name change. And if I could count the number of times that I've complained about it to my friends, I feel like I'd be a very rich man. Um, and I kick myself because I never did that. I never contacted you, I never contacted your predecessors. Um, and, I, and I do fault myself for that. And so I want to re-appreciate the people that have brought this up um, and brought it to us today. Um, 
in spite of the fact that I did not take personal action, here we are and here I am. And the time is now to take the recommendations of your neighborhood advisory council who took the recommendation themselves of the Chumash represent representatives and their native and non-native allies to rename the street in question to Hutach Street in its entirety. The current name of the street in question embodies a vestige of an anti-American America and of an anti-American Santa Barbara in my belief. It is hurtful and offensive not only to the original caretakers of this Native American land, but to anyone who just considers themselves a decent person. How this street name has lived on for so long is astonishing and I believe that it's unforgivable. So now is your moment to right this wrong, your opportunity to correct this wrong. Please take this small but decisive action today to seed a new street and a new street name in downtown Santa Barbara. A seed that is rooted in the earth, in respect, in culture, and in place, Hutosh Street. Thank you for your time today. I appreciate your work. Thanks. Next speaker. Our next speaker is James Yee. James Yee, please go ahead. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. I'm a member of the Barbarunga Band of Chumash Indians, the BBCI. No one else, to my disappointment, has mentioned or introduced their ancestors today, but I will. My father's mother was Mary Yee, last native speaker of the Barbarino Chumash language. My third great grandmother was Maria Ignacia. Yes, she had a creek named after her. I think there's at least two issues here. Is the present name appropriate? And is the proposed name appropriate? I'd like to address the second part. So I'm opposed to the name proposed for the following reasons. Um, first of all, naming a street after a Chumash god or deity may be disrespectful to my Chumash ancestors and to some of those who still practice the native religion. Native religion symbols are not something to be handled like a football to make political statements. Also, the petition states that Hutash means earth mother in the Chumash language. Which Chumash language? All Chumash languages are not a single language. It's disrespectful to our ancestors and to those who are learning those languages like me to clump them together as one language. Disregarding cultural kinship, geographical differences. Second, why Hutash? In the historical record, it's spelled sometimes with an H, sometimes with a U, sometimes with a Q. In December's Child, it's spelled with an X. I hope you know that book. If you don't, then I think you're rushing a little bit too fast. Also in the J.P. Harrington notes, it's spelled with a Q. My great-great-grandmother, Luisa Ignacia, referred to the word with um, a Q. So which meaning is it and whose meaning is it? There's a disturbing lack of research in the area. And finally, in spite of claims to the contrary, the local Barbara and the Chumash community was never widely consulted on this issue. The Barbara and the Chumash Tribal Council and Tribal Trust Foundation do not represent my interest nor the interest of the BBCI, the Barbara and the Band of Chumash Indians. And nor do they represent the greater Barbara and the Chumash community who are not members of any tribal group. To put forward this name change without reaching out to the greater Barbara and Chumash community and without more research is very disrespectful to the greater Chumash community of Santa Barbara, of which I am a part and of which my ancestors are a part as well. Thank you very much for listening. Very good. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Lauren Mendel, then Simone Roskamp, Simon Clifford, Sam Cohen, Gloria Sanchez, Ana Rosa Rizzo Santino. Lauren Mendel. I don't see Lauren Mendel, so we'll come back to Lauren Mendel. Next is Simone Roskamp. Simone Roskamp, please go ahead. 
Um, hi, City Council. Um, I shared um, quite a long letter that we as Healing Justice wrote in solidarity with our Chumash siblings at the Neighborhood Council. Um, and I'm here again really just to voice my incredible support for my Chumash siblings um, as they push for this street to be renamed. Um, I unfortunately do not have any flowers um, for you, City Council, because I think, as we've been reminded, um, this is something that is way overdue. I think if anything I've learned in Healing Justice is that the city moves only as quickly as it wants to. There were times when people told us things would take quite a long time when all that needed to happen was someone in power, one of you all, to say, I'm going to make sure this gets done. So I am extremely disappointed that our two match siblings have to make this presentation several different times in several different settings, repeating to us their pain, repeating to us that they are worthy of dignity and respect just for you all to make this change and then say it will not be done until December. Martin Luther King warned against moderate white folks who will tell other people to wait on their rights and dignity. And so you all suggesting that after all of these decades, they still need to wait until mid-December is heartbreaking. And, and honestly, I'm just in so much pain hearing this. The people who have called in with hate in their hearts, we cannot separate them from you. There was one person in particular who said none of his neighbors told him this street name was offensive. Here's the problem, y'all. You all are that person's neighbor because you have allowed this name to persist in our community for decades, while our two match siblings have said this has hurt them. The last thing I want to say is that I am so glad to see that the Chumash folks were given um, space to talk about the pain they have endured, but also space to present. And seeing that you all did this reminds me that you all have known how to respect Black organizers and have just refused to do so. Kathy Mario, you referred to these people as, sir, you have never used such kind words for us. We need to remember that we all belong to each other. So just as it is a requirement that I be here to stand up for our two Mac siblings, I would hope that you remember we show up for our entire, entire communities. Otherwise, you're just allowing pain to persist. So I have no gratitude only to say, do better. And don't have people going to all these different meetings just to say, recognize them as full, beautiful human beings who should never have had to see a street named, named after someone whose life mattered whose life mattered and is now disremembered for how they died by themselves and have people justify that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Next speaker is Simon Clifford, Sam Cohen, Gloria Sanchez, Ana Rosa Rizzo Santino, Anna Marie Gott, Mary McHale. Simon Clifford, please go ahead. Um, hi, can you hear me? Good. I'm, um, I'm, we have a property on the east side of by Milpas, 927 India on Muerto Street. We've had businesses there since uh, for 42 years. Um, we did speak at the community meeting. Um, I 1000% respect if the name is offensive, uh, it should go. We were always led to believe that the name was in celebration of the person that was found there. It was named after the person that re Indian remains. And um, But if it's offensive, hey, I've got no problem with that. The problem we have is we operate a business. We are a manufacturer of chemicals. We're a manufacturer of different products. We sell them all over the world. It's going to cost us tens of thousands of dollars to relabel everything because we are legally responsible and we have to have our address on the label. Uh, as you know, we've just gone through COVID. Business is down. We switched our production to hand sanitizer to help the national shortage. So we were about 25% production at that point. We're back to about 40% now, but we're just, it's not a good time for us to, it's never a good time for us to spend unnecessarily tens of thousands of dollars. We have a 100,000 plus labels, bottles printed. We have to change all of our uh, government documents. Everything has to be changed uh, because we legally have to have our physical address, especially with international sales. So there's a huge expense for us. Who pays for that? I mean, it's, it's, you know, we're not a big business with two families that make our living out of this property. So, um, Mr. Lopez, um, I have a different recollection of the conversation. I had a conversation with him three weeks ago. I said, well, we should definitely meet maybe virtually. He said, absolutely. I'm not available till after four because I teach. I said, well, okay, when can we do this? He said, I don't know. I said, what about if I set a Zoom meeting up at 4.30 on Friday? Great. I said, send me your email address and I will set you up and I'll set up a Zoom meeting. I do that because I teach martial arts in the evening on Zoom, so I don't have to do it. Never heard a word. 
I called him twice, left two messages for him, never got a call back. So we did try and communicate. We were never contacted by anybody in the city. We were never received anything written about this name change. And to be honest with you, it's just going to be an insanely expensive, difficult problem for us to do this. Uh, um, I just This just came to mind. What about if instead of a name change, there were some plaques put up in celebration of the uh, the person that was found that was found there who died alone on the street, something to memorialize the person, which is, I think, what the name street was originally meant to be, but it was very insensitive, I think, the way they did it, is my understanding. I might be wrong about the history. That was what we were led to believe. Um, I would like to say that um, uh, at this point, um, we would have very happily have supported this if someone can tell us how we're supposed to pay for all these changes, and it is going to be tens of thousands of dollars for us to, to change everything. If anybody's got any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank, thank you. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Sam Cohen, then Gloria Sanchez, Ana Rosa Rizzo Santino, Anna Marie Gott, Mary McHale, Athena Tan. Sam Cohen. Sam Cohen, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Excellent. Yes. I'm uh, good. E well, I was going to say good afternoon, but I'll say good evening. Uh, my name is Sam Cohen. I'm the government affairs and legal officer for the San Ynez Band of Chumash Indians. We are the only federally recognized Chumash tribe. Chairman Khan has a conflict today, but sends his regards to Mayor Murillo and the entire city council. The San Inez Band of Chumash Indians thanks the Santa Barbara City Council for addressing the name of Indio Muerto Street, which is a stain on the beauty of the city of Santa Barbara. We also understand the city has a process for renaming streets, and we appreciate the patience of the entire Native American community in going through this process. Now the city council has the ability to change the name of this street and the San Inez Band of Chumash Indians respectfully requests a unanimous decision to remove Indian Muerto forever. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Gloria Sanchez. Gloria Sanchez, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm calling in support of the renaming of the racist street, who I also will, I will not say out loud. It is a small step in being in right relationship with our shoe mash relatives. As many others have mentioned, the name is racist and contributes to the erasure of indigenous people. It does not celebrate or honor the land that we are on, shoe mash land. This small change would be but a small anti-colonial gesture and the beginning of healing and reconciliation. I also urge for a unanimous vote, yes. And also want to remind ourselves, like what, who are we talking about? We're talking about burden. We're talking about years of burden that no monetary value, that where there's no monetary value. Let's really think about this. Um, I, I hear our business, uh, folks, uh, and I think we could come up with solutions, but right now we're centering the voices of indigenous people and that's long overdue. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Ana Rosa Rizzo Santino. One moment, please. Ana Rosa Rizzo Santino, please go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so I already uh, read the statement that our board for La Casa de la Raza uh, created on um, at the neighborhood council meeting and also earlier today. So now I want to go ahead and bring in the voices of other organizations that also agree with this change, um, including Food and Water Action um, and Healing Justice and CLUE, Clergy and Lady United for Economic Justice, uh, where we just started uh, a racial justice working group. Um, and just to echo what Matt um, and my hermana Simone were saying earlier about this being a healing process. Um, I just think it's kind of 
surreal to have to explain time and time again why this has to happen and why the dehumanization of indigenous people is so normalized in Santa Barbara County and the endless number of tributes that we have to colonizers in Santa Barbara County. And as we are changing this street name, this should not be the only one. This should be the start of a complete decolonizing process of Santa Barbara County because this dehumanization cannot stand anymore. It is time for people to respect Black, Indigenous, and people of color in this community. And for this community to, yeah, just stop the glorification, the glamorization of colonization, there was nothing good about it. Um, this is the time that we can wake up from our slumber and see that we all belong to each other, as Simone said earlier, and that uh, we need to do better. And I believe that we can do better as long as we put our best foot forward and just make that commitment um, because that commitment is the first step to the action. And so this is a concrete action that will show that Santa Barbara City Council is no longer standing behind the dehumanization of indigenous people in our community. Thank you. Thanks. Next speaker. Next speaker is Anna Marie Gott, then Mary McHale, Athena Tan, Kim Paskowitz, Dylan Griffith, Lauren Mendel, Matthew Vestudo, Fabiana Hurst Dubin. Anna Marie Gott, please go ahead. Good, af good afternoon, Council. I would just like to note that there were a number of people that were not consulted today about the name change and what the name was actually going to be, let alone how it was spelled. I'd also like you to note that no one received a public notice um, to, their, uh, to their property. Um, regarding this particular name change. Uh, I would like to also say I do support the name change in the residential area, but I can't support a name change in the industrial area at this time. The name certainly needs to be retired, but I really would urge the city council and the city to work with the property owners on that street to determine an end date, an end date where that particular name will be retired forever and then something else will replace it. A gentleman earlier mentioned, we may be able to identify the, the gentleman who passed away. Now, wouldn't it be best to try to find out what his name was and then memorialize him in, in that street name for that one section of Indio Morto. Indio Morto right now is, has Highway 101 that comes right down the middle of it. It also um, has been uh, not a through street for a number of years. It does not appropriate to name a street with one name when you have an entire freeway that runs through the middle of it and you cannot transverse one into the other it, without going underneath an overpass and having to get onto Milta. It just doesn't make any sense. The businesses will have an extraordinary expense that they will have to pay out of their pocket in the middle of a pandemic and afterwards because of your decision today. They did not name the street. They have been there for decades. The city is not paying all of the costs that will be associated with their businesses to actually go ahead and make these changes. This is not a telephone bill. This is not a, a bill for, for internet. This is not four or five different people that you need to reach out to to have your address change. This is a chemical company. Think about it. The FDA, Homeland Security, banking, every customer, every shipper would have to be notified. It's thousands of individuals when you look at the total number. So again, I would urge you, buy, name them different remarks. streets and have it retired at a different date. Thank you. Thanks. Our next speaker is Mary McHale. Then Athena Tan, Kim Paskowitz, 
Dylan Griffith, Lauren Mandel, Matthew Vestudo, Mary McHale. Please go ahead. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. My name yes. is Michael McHale, um, and I am nine years old, and I'm in fourth grade. Changing the name to Indio Morito to Hutosh matters to me because indigenous people are still alive. Changing the name to Hutosh would honor the Chumash people because Hutosh was the person who made them. Every time they go to the street, it will remind them of the person who was very important to them. They tried to erase the Chumash culture. The Spanish wanted them out of their way. They tried killing them. It was painful to their culture because the, they, were, they were still alive. They wanted the, their traditions to, to the, because they changed the street name to honor them. Representation matters to me be, today because Pumash want their culture to stay alive. For people to learn the, about their culture, it would be important to see a Chumash monument in Ventura County because they were the first ones that were were here before the Spanish people took over their land. I would like to see a representation of the Chumash people in the beach in Santa Barbara along with the main street because that is where a lot of people visit. In summary, I would like to see the Chumash represented in Santa Barbara and Ventura County by changing the street name to Hutosh to put up a monument of the Chumash people. The message I would like to share with the Santa Barbara City Council. Chumash people have their rights to changing the street name to Hutosh. I believe everyone should have their rights and have their representation or represented, their culture represented. Thank you. Very good. Uh, next speaker. Next speaker is Athena Tan, Kim Paskowitz, Dylan Griffith, Lauren Mandel, Matthew Vestudo. Athena Tan. I don't see Athena Tan. We can, we will come back to her. Kim Paskowitz. Kim Paskowitz, please go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? Hi. Hello, Mayor and City. It sounds like a bad connection, Ms. Paskowitz. Can we come back to that speaker, Ms. Clark? Certainly, Ms. Paskowitz. Um, why don't you try logging off and logging back on, and then we'll come back to you. Our next speaker is Dylan Griffith, then Lauren Mendel, Matthew Vestudo, Fabiana hurst dubin Chelsea Lancaster, Eve Sanford, Mary O'Connor. Dylan Griffith, please go ahead. Hi, City Council and Mayor. I'm also here to support the request from the Barbarino Chumash Tribal Council to rename the street to Hutash Street. Uh, and I, one of the things that I also want to talk about is uh, the topic of where basically finances will come from and where money will be supplied from. Uh, I think there's been some valid comments about businesses, but I think we need to um, stop prioritizing the ahistorical and whitewashed colonial history of Santa Barbara and start prioritizing um, basically black and brown lives. And I think that's what renaming this street has the uh, capacity to be the starting point towards doing so and towards reparation of a kind. Um, and as far as uh, I don't have answers to any of the business financial matters, but I do believe that uh, the city should be uh, financially responsible for the vast majority of uh, financial matters uh, that are necessary to rename the streets. Um, it was good to hear that there's only $1,500 um, for the city in terms of street signage fees. As far as something that I think has been of concern is uh, people needing to renew their licenses as well. 
uh, with address changes. There's ways to get around that. One way that I've seen was through LA who renamed three streets that were originally named after Confederate generals. Um, and basically the city council there worked with state legislators to get fees waived or removed as is able to do so in other states outside of California. But based on that legislation, it was able to be done in California as well. So again, uh, we'd love to see city council work in these ways to um, alleviate financial burden from community members. And I support the name change entirely. Thanks for your time. Great. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Lauren Mendel and Matthew Vestudo, Fabiana Hurst-Dubin, Chelsea Lancaster, Eve Sanford, Mary O'Connor, Athena Tan, and Kim Paskowitz. Lauren Mendel. I believe Lauren Mendel may have left. We will come back to him. Let's see if he comes back. Matthew Vestudo. Matthew Vestudo, please go ahead. Matthew Vestudo, please go ahead. You may unmute yourself. Okay, we'll come back to Mr. Vestudo. Next, we have Faviana Hurst Dubin. Faviana Hurst Dubin, please go ahead. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good evening, Mayor Murillo and council members. My name is Dr. Faviana Hirsch Dubin, and I am in strong, strong support of the Barbarino Tumash Council's initiative, which has been tirelessly worked on for quite some time, as you all know, to change the name of Indio Muerto, which when it's said in English is really horrific. Some people don't speak Spanish, so I think that is part of why it's existed this long. But this is a great opportunity to actually change the name to Hutash, which represents Earth Mother and much more in terms of too much origin stories, too much culture, the history. It's really a gift, I think, to the city of Santa Barbara to have this name instead of one that the person who spoke earlier about the memorializing of the individual who unfortunately died in that spot is certainly no reason to keep that name. I concur with someone who called in an earlier segment. I'm of Jewish origin, and if the street had been named Dead Jew, I think there's no way it would have existed all this time. That speaks volumes to what people have referred to many times as a history of colonization in California. I know that the history cannot be erased, but the renaming is a real opportunity to take the right action at this time. And I just wanted to acknowledge as a person who's working very closely as a consultant with the students who called in and with the art that was presented in the Rio School District in Oxnard, California, they felt that they should have a voice and Marcus Lopez and the Barbarino Chumash Council welcomed them. And they felt that being in Oxnard didn't mean they didn't qualify to speak in Santa Barbara because all of this was too much land. And that is why they chose to contribute today. Thank you for your time and for moving in the right direction. Thanks. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Chelsea Lancaster, Eve Sanford, Mary O'Connor, Athena Tan, Kim Paskowitz, Lauren Mendel, Mendel, and Matthew Vestudo. Chelsea Lancaster, please go ahead. Hi, uh, City Council. Obviously calling um, to elevate and support um, the request to change uh, a violent street name to Hutash um, in solidarity on behalf of El Centro SB with our Chumash siblings. I also want to name that um, I really think we need to do a lot of work around acknowledging when we um, name that racism is a public health emergency, there needs to be a lot of actions and a lot of, I, I would say, learning, but really unlearning that comes with that. 
um, there are two original sins in America. One is chattel slavery and the other is the genocide of Native Americans. So when you're looking at these two, these two movements and these two issues, we really have to think about them in concert. Again, um, this is really about healing our community. There are a lot of people who have been very hurt for a very long time um, from the white supremacy in this community. And that looks like living in a predominantly white wealthy community where the voices of people of color, of indigenous people, of black people, of poor people are never centered in any of these dialogues or public decisions that are made. I wanna name that we celebrate colonialism every year in August with old Spanish days. I think we need to grapple with that as a community. I would love to see that celebration look different. I would love to not see a ton of white people dressed up as brown people all over Santa Barbara. Um, culture is not a costume. Um, it's again, this is a moment of reckoning. This is a moment um, where we can really center the people that are closest to the pain. And um, I've already um, communicated this to the family, but um, there's a lot of us that are willing to put in work to make this happen. But the city really needs to incur the financial costs of this. Um, and I think that needs to be a commitment. That can be one commitment that y'all can make that you're serious about racism as a public health emergency. It requires resources. It requires a real commitment. Thank you so much. Very good. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Eve Sanford. Eve Sanford, I don't, you don't have, ah, oh, there you are. Eve Sanford, go ahead. Eve Sanford, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Okay, Eve Sanford, Hi. oh, there you go. Sorry, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eve Sanford. I'm calling in to support changing the name of the street that's before us today. Um, I think this action is past due. Uh, words are power, and this current name is absolutely disrespectful. And I also was thinking, as I was listening to some of the comments, um, similar to a previous speaker, for anyone who doesn't take issue with the name as is, I ask you to imagine alternative names paying homage to dead something and to think of how quickly we would disband with such a name in our community. Um, I know others pay homage to the um, purported history of the name, and I just would remind everyone again that words are powerful and that what we're doing today is is we're writing history today and so we we um we're both students of history but we're also always currently participating in making history and today we have a perfect opportunity to uphold and pay respect to too much culture um so thank you thanks next speaker Next speaker is Mary O'Connor. And after Mary O'Connor, we have Athena Tan, Kim Paskowitz, Lauren Mendel, and Matthew Vestudo. Mary O'Connor, please go ahead. Hi, so I'd like to speak to a few of the people, business owners, as well as the, uh, I believe, historian who spoke and was arguing that there's already like five streets named in Santa Barbara to honor the Chumash. That is a disgusting argument. This is Chumash land. So to boil their entire history down to a few street names and think that is enough is quite scary to hear from someone who claimed to be a historian. Also, um, these business people I've been hearing over and over expense over lives um as one man said um why can't we just put up a few plaques that is incredibly offensive and really uh saving a thousand dollars couple of thousand dollars is nothing compared to the genocide and suffering of the chumash people that has not ended um, and it's also very clear from the people who have no problem saying this street name out loud over and over. Um, 
Then the woman who also did that, she actually said, we didn't kill anyone. We weren't around for that. The same exact thing is happening in this country with white supremacy, people saying we didn't own slaves, we aren't responsible. Yes, we are all responsible today for everything that has happened in the past. No amount of money could ever replace what the settlers took from the Chumash. And just repaying and trying to amend the damage that has been done is going to require sacrifice. The young people, the children who have spoken today have just such an incredible amount of wisdom and compassion than many of the adults I heard today. And that does give me hope in some ways because they're the future, but it's also very distressing. Um, Business owners caring more about money than the continuous suffering of others is something that I I understand is pretty universal, but um, in this instance, it is pretty deplorable to try to make any argument that saving money is more important than respecting all of the Chumash and descendants and ancestors who this really, really affects. Thank you. Thanks. Next speaker. Next speaker is Athena Tan, but I believe she has logged off. So next is Kim Paskowitz. Kim Paskowitz, please go ahead. Hello, Mayor and City Council. I think the fourth graders who presented today said it all, but I want to acknowledge that we indeed are on Chumash land, and I want to voice my full support for the unanimous vote by the Santa Barbara Ordinance Committee to honor the wishes of the Chumash Tribal Council of this long overdue initiative to change the name to Hutash. I ask each member of City Council to vote in favor of the street name change as first an acknowledgement of past violence and genocide inflicted on the Chumash and an acknowledgement of the ongoing settler colonial structures that continue to perpetuate racism and the whitewashing of indigenous voices. This name change is the lowest bar as a step in the right direction. Community input has been gathered and it's time to act. We ask that you rename the street in its entirety, not just a few blocks. As we heard, it's minimal cost and impact for the city. I ask each of you to adopt the resolution today and change the street name and lead this positive change in our community. Thank you. Thanks. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Lauren Mind Mindell. I believe Mr. Mindell has left our meeting. Okay. Next speaker is Matthew Vestudo and then James Navarro. Matthew Vestudo, please go ahead. I'm muted. Thank you very much, um, council members. My name is Matthew Vestudo. I'm a tribal member of the Barbara Radio Pedro Band of Mission Indians. I'm also the language program coordinator for our tribe. And um, this is a very disturbing proposal because um, there's a lot of misleading statements in the petition and just the form of the petition is uh, dis disturbing because you can only make comments if you sign it. There's really no change.org doesn't have a form where you can help correct some of the misunderstandings. I really appreciate the spirit of the BLM movement and correcting uh, and uncelebrating uh, dubious figures. And I'd hate to see that spirit in step. I think we need to reflect and consider that the Chumash populace has not been consulted with uh, adequately. The Tribal Trust Foundation, when I gave them my um, opinion, told me uh, that was very interesting to hear, but um, they've gathered so many signatures, they felt obliged to go through with it. Um, the misleading things in the petition written by Marcus Lopez, it's um, that he says it's 
long been long faced criticism, India Muerto's long faced criticism within the Santa Barbara community, and this is true, but he fails to share that the last time the name change was proposed, uh, prominent Chumash people rose up to oppose the idea and it was defeated, and that's why it's still called India Muerto. It is true, it is um, just a commemoration of an event that happened at a place. It does not celebrate the deaths of Chumash people resulting from Spanish contact and conquest to erase the name would erase our history. Um, and then furthermore, the naming of a street after our most sacred deity, correctly written uh, Hutash, X-U-T-A-S, S with a wedge, is totally demeaning. Um, you don't see any God boulevards or Jesus Court or Shiva Street or Buddha Way. And this serious, this is serious. She's a sacred deity to us. And I understand that it may seem like it honors us, but it doesn't. And um, further, I hope the council has read my letter and especially paragraph six, which I don't want to get into. And I'd like to offer to answer any questions if any of you have any. Thanks for your Thanks. remarks. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is James Navarro. I believe that's our next speaker. I'll check the list. James Navarro. James Navarro, please go ahead. James Navarro, please go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? We can, can hear you. Hear you? You, yes. you can hear me, okay. Uh, greetings, uh, city council members and uh, people of Santa Barbara. My name is uh, Jimmy Joe Navarro. I am a Chumash Indian. I grew up about four blocks away from uh, Indian Myrtle Street, uh, La Cadena. Uh, I too, at a youth, in my youth, I was angered at the sight of that. Uh, uh, luckily, I was able, unfortunately, I was able to translate Spanish to English at that moment. And uh, it, I was disheartened by it. And uh, a gentleman by the name of Rim Morello, uh, who was who is a true Barbareño man, uh, the, the last chief of Sin uh Juan Justo, uh, lived with him and his brother, a relative of them, uh, Chris Morello. I want you guys to remember these names. Chris Morello, Rim Morello, Paul Palmier. These are the historians. These are the ones that these are the ones that lived that life. They had relatives. Rim's mother was from Sinigitas. He told me the true story about Indian Murto Street, what its real meaning was. Haley found a dead drunken Indian on that site. He was a man that was from Sinigitas when the 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 Chumas from Sinigitas were displaced by Thomas Hope. It's a long story, but there was a reservation on the quarter of Modoc and Hollister, and the native people were bamboozled out from their land. A lot of them went to the hobo camp that was not too far from Indian Myrtle Street, and a lot of them became drunks and handled their depression in that way, hence they found a dead Indian there. Rim Morello told me, the moral of the story is don't be another dead Indian. He said, no matter how, how hard life gets, don't result to alcohol. Don't result to destroying yourself. All through Santa Barbara, the street names that commemorate Chumash history, Valerio Street, is not to steal. He was a thief. He was a Chumash thief. His story is not a good story. Uh, uh, Anapamu, Napaimu. It's named after a place called Napaimu, one of the surveyors on uh, uh, on the council on the survey. And that's why it was called Anapaimu. Now, on this on the Santa Barbara City Council website, it says it was named after a chief named Anapaimu. There's a lot of false history that is going around that's been romanticized, and and the true these true stories need to be told. You have not consulted. The Tribal Trust Foundation has not consulted real Chumash people. I'm going to speak the truth. I know because I, these people are my relatives. M they Mr. are my Navarro. relatives on my father's side. 
Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, one last thing. Thank if you, you decide to change the name, please change it to Morello. I sympathize and I empathize with Native Americans that Thanks. come into our town and see that sign your and get time, offended. Your, Thanks so much. Your time is up. And Ms. Gorman, is, is Mr. Navarro our final speaker? Yes, Madam Mayor and Council, uh, Mr. Navarro was our final speaker on this topic. Okay. We thank him. We thank everyone who came forward today to give us their opinion. And the recommendation is for us to consider uh, this request. We have a recommendation from our Neighborhood Advisory Council to uh, rename uh, Indian Muerto Street uh, uh, between South Salina Street and South Milpa Street to, to Hutosh Street. And uh, I guess I just want to say that I, I, I can be in touch. I am in touch with, I left a message for the business owner uh, to find a way to, to help. Uh, the city does not have funding uh, to help him, but there might be private monies and, and some of us when, can help uh, uh, look for that uh, kind of resource. So uh, Ms. Uh, Gutierrez or Mr. Gutierrez, you, you were up you were up first, so go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I was just wondering if the the representatives from the Chumash tribe were still on. I'd, I'd like to ask them a question. Marcus Lopez, sure. the Barbarano uh, Chumash tribal. Okay, Mr. Lopez, are you there? Yes. Uh, what was the question? Yes. My, my question is: so I, I've gotten we we've gotten some correspondence from some people claiming to be Chumash natives who are saying that they were not consulted or their opinions or, or um, thoughts weren't taken into consideration. Can you comment on that, please? Well, I think this issue in itself is, is larger than just one particular family or one particular set of history. There's different interpretations. And one of the reasons that we even chose the name of Hutas is because of the fact that we do want to create a situation that we want to honor the earth. That was the meaning behind it. Now, as far as consultation, there's certain people that um, have spoken that uh, do not represent our community. If they do, they're very finite members, and we have disagreements in our community. And every time we're trying to reach out, that um, they completely say and go into the doctrine of the missionization process of they know best. And so within this, we reached out as best as we can under this circumstances. About two and a half years ago, we did reach out. And then we had the Thomas fire and then the flood. So on this case, we did re reach out as best we can. And the only group that is the naysayers of this is the groups that they think that they are the only Chumash around. And that has been a problem with our community. And so within that, we reached out as best we can. And the consultation afterwards, especially when the city of Santa Barbara, after um, last year with Indigenous Peoples Day, we want to have this particular street changed and have a dialogue within our community, a real dialogue within the committee that we set up with the city of Santa Barbara in order not only to discuss just a, a name change, but yet where is our community going to go forward? In other words, the housing, the employment, the, the nature of the school system, who task is used already in the school system? People don't even know that. And that's what it, that whole the Rainbow Bridge story. At the same time, indigenous studies and the implementation of that is a dialogue within the state of California. Within the education, there also dialogues within ourselves about what do we agree with, what do we disagree with. Just like, for example, Congress, what you know, there's not a uniform voice in that. But consultation is something that I really appreciate for all the different groups, but yet. The naysayers are the, are the ones that always say, we're the only ones that count and not with their other two mash. This name, for example, that, that we chose, um, the, um, 
a story in, uh, for example, B Dr. Benjamin Madley suggested two things that were so important about this, and this is talking about consultation. But this two, two things is California Indian people suffered a dramatic demographic declines following a, a arrival of newcomers. A street named Injun Wato is not appropriate ways of commemorating these many thousands of lives, number one. The second thing is that this street name inflicts pain on some too much people today are urged you to listen very carefully to what they have about to say. And we address that at the neighbor advisory council. And then lastly, that we cannot go back to the dead natives, but yet we can treat each other with respect and dignity today. The consultation process, a, continue, a continuing process, whether it be in your muerto, change the name to Hutaj, what does that mean? At the same time, we wanted to change the name to Earth Mother, our very essence, and what are people are talking about with the climate change. So this consultation does not mean a fancy word to put for the naysayers, but this consultation is that they need to create a dialogue and we want to create a dialogue. And this is the, the background of all this. And um, I disagree with the methodology of uh, the, of the of certain individuals that are historians because of the fact that there's many different history is how, what lens you put on. And so it, it matters that um, their opinions need to be discussed but this dialogue and consultation means deeper than just one street name, and it's about a dialogue with our community. And that's all I can say at this point. We tried to, we attempted to reach out. At the same time, the individuals that are here in Santa Barbara, and that's why I, I mentioned, you know, I've reached out to San Inez Tribal, a tri San Inez Tribe. I reached out to the Coastal Band of Chumash Nation. I reached out to other individuals that we don't have time to mention at this point in time that have a valid points that are beyond the scope of this discussion. So I hope I, I, I answered some portions of that. And no. um, th at this point, that's all I can say on, on the matter. Okay, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. Um, I, I'll go into my, my deliberative statements now. I, I was born and raised here and I have always it's just it's just a bad name for a street any way you cut it even if i you know if i'm going to humor the the mindset that it was named in honor of an unnamed native american person that they felt it, it, you know I, I was raised a spanish speaker uh spanish is one of the most romantic languages in the world you look you look at some of the streets that are named in spanish around here that they're poetic they're beautiful and for them to name that street what they did it, it's just it's just off it just doesn't make sense to me to be completely honest and the fact that it was named by people who literally had stakes in the land that did not belong to them just doesn't you know justify it at all so councilman it, it was like that you're talking about the name and I'll, it was like, sorry sorry, sorry. I, I, the, the time for questions is done i, I hate to cut okay. you off thanks mr lopez we gotta, we gotta wrap this up i appreciate what you had to say um so and and uh, i i don't know much of the complexities of, of the chumash tribe and and the chumash people um but i i picked up on two years ago when i first got elected council member at the time dominguez and i went to a meeting specifically about this issue and it was a it was a it was a meeting among the Chumash people and people who lived on that street on, and on the east side, and I and I heard some of the rhetoric that I heard today, uh, there, and I saw some of the conflicts within the Chumash people themselves, uh, and, and it was explained to me that this was attempted years ago, and the elders um, decided not to move forward with it. It was explained to me that they were having conflicts with what name to choose to to finally change the name. And here we are two years later, and it's finally gotten enough momentum and backing for it to finally change. And, and I know it's not going to make everyone happy, and I apologize for that, but this is the time. Right now is the time to change it. And the, the name flat out, bottom line, is offensive. The new name is not. Um, so, again, if it is and I'm unaware, I apologize, but it's, it's better than what we have right now. And I will uh, support changing the name and um, 
when Ms. Gutierrez makes the motion, I'd like to second it. Thanks. Ms. Gutierrez, if you're ready, go ahead. We need to unmute Ms. Gutierrez or Ms. Gutierrez, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry okay. about that. Okay, Thank start you. over. Mayor um, Murillo, I just wanna say being like Mr. Um, Gutierrez mentioned being born and raised in Santa Barbara and being in this seat right now to be able to, to make this name change is such an honor. Y quisiera decir lo que acabo de decir en español. El haber crecido en Santa Bárbara, el haber tenido eh, amigos que crecieron en, en la calle de Indio Muerto y todas las experiencias que tuvieron ellos al, al crecer en esa calle. Eh, me acuerdo que muchos de mis amiguitos cuando iba a la escuela Franklin no les gustaba decir el nombre porque había gente que les decía, ustedes pertenecen en esa calle. Entonces, para mí es un gran honor estar en esta posición y poder hacer ese cambio. Y más que nada para los niños y los jóvenes, de ver que cuando uno lucha con pasión para hacer un cambio efectivo, se puede hacer. Así que es un honor para mí to, to make this motion um, to, to do the name change of Indio Muerto. Mr. Gutierrez, are, are you a seconder over there? Yes, I'll second that. Okay. Uh, Ms. Snedden, you've had your light on for a little bit longer than Mr. Jordan. So if you would go ahead, please, with your comments. We have a motion on the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I do want to just take a, a moment to acknowledge it's, it's um, something that's more common now to acknowledge the land that we're on and, and that City Hall, where we're making these decisions, we are on land of indigenous people and, and traditionally Chumash people. And, and just to hold on to that as we're making these decisions, this is long overdue. Um, I think I, I will echo the sentiments of my colleagues that um, growing up here and living here as a young person, it, it just uh, unbelievable that it has taken this long. Um, it's been an offensive name for a long time. And I feel that this is the very least that we could do to just even begin to address um, the sort of historical trauma that we are founded on and moving toward stewardship and, and being more careful with, with the words that matter. Um, I, I'm trying to imagine if the street was named, you know, dead woman or dead child, that, that wouldn't feel like an honor to who died there. And in honor, it's not the same as, as the uh, tomb of an unnamed person. And we could maybe work on how we could commemorate um, the life that was lost there. And, and when we've heard about a, a, a plaque or a boulder or some commemoration, um, not in the street name, but after changing the street name, that we still do a true honor to um, the life that was lost there. Um, I, I fully supportive of the name change. I am a little bit concerned that we're missing an opportunity um, to unify. And I, I'm a little uneasy about if there's debate among Chumash tribes of choosing one tribe over another tribe or one name over another name. And um, I sense the urgency of changing this name, but I'm wondering if it couldn't have just one more round of uh, the, the coastal band, San Inez band, Barbarino band, really trying to to come together and come up with a name that would be suitable for all. Um, in the absence of that, I will support um, the, the name as proposed. Um, it just, it, it, I have a little uneasiness about moving forward with what could be a very healing step with some division in it. So if, if there could be a time for that, uh, or we could facilitate or whatever we could do to support that, I'd be in favor of that, but I, I will support um, the motion and the name change and I'm, I'm uh, very happy to be part of this moment. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, 
I will also support this action. I'm I'm refreshingly um, uh, happy to uh, actually just echo uh, Council Member Oscar Gutierrez's comments that when when it just comes down to a smell test, the name is offensive, and now is the time to change it. And what's proposed is way better than what's there now. It's just as simple as that. Um, I have a great deal of respect for Neil Graffy. Um, his context may not be the correct context in this matter. And that context is simply walking by and knowing what that street sign translates to in today's world. There's no way to escape that context today. Um, so I appreciate his perspective, but um, I think it's just uh, it's time as uh, Mr. Gutierrez says. A couple admonitions for us. One, um, I am, uh, my uneasiness is that we just didn't take the simple step to get out in front of some of the um, adverse comments by doing a mailing to the street addresses and give them a, a participation route early on in the process rather than late in the process. You know, um, a stamp and a note inside um, detailing the process, when they could be where and what's going to happen would have cost us maybe $150 and just seems like an opportunity wasted. And the other is just, um, I find odd that uh, when we talk about um, uh, traditional historical or cultural changes in our um, scape in this city, we have a historian. But here we are changing to a word and we have absolutely zero subject matter, subject matter experts on behalf of the city to help us know if the spelling or application of the new street name is indeed a good choice. We're left to try and uh, pick up the pieces of um, what appears to be an une uneasiness between indigenous groups as to whether they agree with it, don't agree with it, or whether the word is appropriate. And um, I could certainly see that if we're gonna, if we're starting on the path of a broader scope with this type of action, we should have somebody um, within our ranks that assists us also in vetting and looking at those changes as they would occur. So I'm happy to support this, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm ready to give my comments. Ms. Harmon, you go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I will be very brief. I just wanted to go on record echoing my support for this action today. And similar to um, Mr. Jordan, I just want to lift up the comments of Councilmember Gutierrez. He really expressed, I think, very well um, where I am. You know, this action is so long overdue. Um, and it's an important change and um, one that, that should have been made a long time ago. So as all I think my colleagues have said, very proud to be part of this action today. And I agree with Mr. Jordan as well that um, some of the uneasiness and discord we're hearing about the name, you know, I, I think we really need to learn from this moving forward um, and bring all of our resources to bear to make sure that we have all the information available to us to make the best decisions um, for our city, but looking forward to um, being part of this historic historic vote tonight. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Friedman, thank you, Ms. Uh, um, Harmon. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll be brief as well. Just uh, I think all that's been said by my colleagues and appreciate their comments and the, the public discussion tonight. I, I, I wanna thank one of the public commenters um, who uh, kind of framed the, the background of the different um, the different um, the interpretations from uh, all members of the Chumash and put that into perspective. Um, and I understand this is a difficult for to come together, but um, at the end of the day, I, I agree with the comments and that we are we need to try to unify our community. So I will be supporting this. Thank you. Thanks. Since I've been on the city council since 2012, people have asked me, how do we change this name? I must have given out the municipal code to, I don't know, five or six times. And I think what uh, coalesced and happened a couple of years back was the opposition to the Dakota Access Pipeline and our city council uh, supporting the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe uh, in their opposition to something that would harm their water. 
and the Barbarino uh, uh, Chumash uh, Tribal Council was part of that. So was the Tribal uh, Trust uh, Foundation, the, um, the Coastal Band and the San Inez Band. And those are the groups that are um, came today and said, let's, let's make this change. I also need to acknowledge the Lopez family, his sons, Cosmali Lopez, Chimaway Lopez, Marcus Lopez II, um, who stand in this community as, as, as Chumash leaders. And they are the ones who have uh, uh, brought the community together to make this change that a lot of people, even if they don't, they're not here telling us on this call today. It, it is, a, it's, it's uncomfortable for Spanish speaking people when, when they're like, why is the street named that? And it's absolutely time to uh, change the name of this street. I'd also like to thank uh, the children of uh, Rio School District who shared their art and expressed their opinion who, and who are part of this historic uh, moment here today. Um, I acknowledge uh, Chair uh, Marissa uh, Sullivan. I think you're you're new to your to your position. I look forward to getting to know you better. Um, what also came out, what happened to me after the Dakota Access Pipeline? I read Benjamin Madley's book, An American Genocide: The United States and the California Indian Catastrophe. It, and it wasn't just the mission system and the Catholic Church that harmed the Native Americans here. Um, people, maybe people don't realize that the gold rush sent uh, people into those hills and into those areas that were occupied we, you know, with uh, Native people and they were killed and they were slaughtered. And uh, anyone who picks up that book you have to set it down after a couple of chapters because it's just, whoa, uh, very brutal. Um, and the word genocide does apply. So this is the least we can do uh, here today. Um, uh, for Ms. Uh, Snedden, who's concerned about an opportunity to bring the different uh, Chumash groups together, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day is coming up next week. I've been in discussions with uh, Mr. Lopez about um, a, um, a proclamation, a, a, a ceremony out in uh, Delaguerra Plaza. And I would encourage uh, everyone to come together, Mr. Yee, Mr. Navarro, uh, others who, who want to be part of uh, the celebration and the acknowledgement uh, of this terrible time in history and then and honoring what we have now and, and what we have looking into the future. So we have a motion uh, on the floor. Ms. Gorman, are you ready to do a roll call vote? It seemed like a pretty straightforward motion to change the name of this street. Madam Mayor and Council, we have a motion by Councilmember Alejandra Gutierrez, seconded by Councilmember Oscar Gutierrez to approve the staff recommendation. Mayor Pro Tem Snedden? Yes. Councilmember Friedman? Yes. Councilmember Harmon? Yes. Councilmember Oscar Gutierrez? Aye. Councilmember Jordan? Yes. Councilmember Alejandro Gutierrez? Yes. And Mayor Murillo. Aye. That was unanimous. Thank you very much to everyone who participated. I will follow up on my word to contact uh, not just that business owners, but others. I know Mr. Lopez is uh, interested in, in making connections uh, with, uh, with the business community that will be affected by the name change. Wow. <laughs> it's. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little overwhelmed. It's amazing and wonderful. Okay, um, we're gonna close this item. We will do one more. Um, we have two more items. No, we have three more. So let's go ahead to number nine. 
and take a break after that. Ms. Um, Gorman, can you read that into the record, please? Certainly. Item nine, update on city's economic development efforts. Mr. Harris, take it away, please. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and members of the public. I'm Jason Harris, the city's economic development manager, providing the staff presentation. In recognition of the number of items on today's agenda, I will be brief. And I'm, okay, this presentation is for council review and comment on the city's economic development efforts in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and in preparation of the city's economic development strategic plan. I will highlight the immediate relief efforts the city provided to the business community in response to the COVID-19 public health orders. The city's efforts to support businesses reopening and recovery. And lastly, I'll outline the plans to transition to revitalization of the e economy and downtown to be addressed in an economic development strategic plan. As we may all recall, due to COVID-19 pandemic, the governor issued a stay at home order on March 19th, which required the closure of the city's non-essential businesses and all other civic, academic, and cultural activities. This council provided immediate relief on April 7th for the city's lodging businesses by allowing the deferral of transit occupancy tax payments, as well as the suspension and waiver of the first quarter 2020 parking and business improvement area assessments for businesses located in the area. Lastly, the council approved the suspension of all monthly and commuting parking permitting billing of downtown employees until downtown parking was reopened. These actions were meaningful and timely. Next slide, please. So recognizing the breadth and severity of the pandemic's impact to the city's economy and business community, the city initiated a communications campaign to provide businesses a comprehensive listing of business assistance programs and resources. The campaign involved web pages, social media, newsletter notices, and a Spanish language workshop. Additionally, Mayor Murillo convened a business advisory task force comprised of 20 business owners and business organization representatives to provide input and ideas to the city. The task force recommendations led to council action to allow outdoor business activity and initiate oversight of the city's land development process. In two successive meetings on May 19th and on May 27th, council authorized the city administrator to utilize his emergency authority to temporarily close State Street to create a promenade, as well as suspend the rules and regulations to temporarily allow commercial uses within the public right of way and on private property support to support businesses reopening. On August 11th, due to the ongoing public health restrictions on business activity, also authorized the extension of the term of the emergency economic recovery ordinance for three months until December 8th and provided a three month extension until March 8th, 2021, if the public health orders were still in effect, as well as extending the hours of operation of the outdoor dining areas for the central business district, Funk Zone and Coast Village Road commercial districts. Staff is, have issued updates or here shortly uh, updated guidelines for businesses with temporary outdoor dining areas to pre prepare for winter months. Additionally, plans are underway to upgrade the temporary State Street traffic devices. That item will be presented to Council here shortly. This pandemic has created the need for new approaches, efforts, and partnerships to support businesses and economic revitalization efforts. The Council established two subcommittees to oversee the future visioning process for State Street and the other to oversee the implementation of improvements to the city's land development processes. Council also recently approved a partnership with Santa Barbara South Coast Chamber of Commerce to assist in addressing downtown commercial vacancy and business retention efforts. Lastly, Council authorized recently a $5,000 of federal CARES Act money go towards a matching partnership with the Santa Barbara Foundation, the Santa Barbara Better Together Fund, this initial matching grant was for a fund of $100,000 to support small business grants. However, thanks to the Santa Barbara Foundation, they've actually doubled their original commitment to $100,000. There is now $150,000 small business grant program available to provide financial support to small businesses in need. The website for businesses and interested parties is there on the screen, sbfoundation.org. And I thank them for their partnership. 
to guide and prioritize the city's revitalization efforts for the economy and downtown, an economic development strategic plan will be drafted to focus and prioritize work efforts and establish goals and objectives. The strategic plan will build from recent studies and recommendations laid out in the 2019 Cosmot Companies Report, the 2018 Downtown Revitalization Strategies, and the 2017 Downtown Retail Strategy Report. The strategic plan will also further the goals and policies included in the economy and fiscal health section of the, uh, the city's general plan. The strategic plan will provide an action plan with goals and objectives over a three-year period from 2021 to 2024 that the city, stakeholders, community partners can help implement and achieve. I will seek business organizations input as I draft the strategic plan this fall. I will check in with council for the review and comment along the way and look for forward for an adoption later this winter. The following goals will form the foundation of the strategic plan. Cultivating a business friendly city hall, supporting the creation and expansion of businesses and jobs, and revitalizing downtown as a hub of retail, entertainment, and culture. Tactical objectives and performance metrics will be defined for each of these foundational goals and that will be reviewed and updated annually as needed. These efforts will address the basic expectations of economic development, creating and retaining jobs, supporting and growing incomes in the city's tax base. The successful economic development outcomes will produce a number of community benefits, such as job creation, providing better wages, benefits, and opportunities for advancements, increased tax base that will support, maintain, and improve local infrastructure, such as roads, parks, libraries, and public safety services, and enhance the quality of life such as improvements to the city's downtown and public spaces, increases the community's enjoyment of the amenities and attributes so abundant in the central business district. With council support and direction, staff will proceed with the initials, initiatives as highlighted in this presentation and the development of the city's economic development strategic plan. This concludes the staff presentation. And at this point, I'll take any questions or feedback that you may have. Thank you. I think Mr. Casey wants to jump in. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council Members. I, I probably should have introed, but I just uh, I want to thank City Council, this Council, and the prior Council for funding the position of an Economic Development Manager that Mr. Harris has filled. Uh, his first day on the job was when uh, the city started closing down as part of the pandemic. Uh, his leadership and collaborative work effort with the business community, but also city staff with Nina Johnson and Rob Dayton in particular, kind of and Mark Aguilar kind of forming this economic development team uh, has really helped us manage our way through the summer. So thank you council for the foresight of this position. And thank you, Mr. Harris for coming in under extremely challenging conditions and doing a great job on behalf of the city. Thank you. I echo my thanks for your good work, Mr. Harris. You came in at a time when we were really uh, slammed by the pandemic and its economic forces. So, but it looks like there's tons of questions. Mr. Friedman, go ahead, you start. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Harris, for the report and all the work that you've been doing. Um, I, I know this is what, what wasn't what you signed up for when you got here, but we are very grateful to have you here as part of our team. Uh, the, the question I have is uh, with the uh, shift to the red uh, that I think occurred today, and I think the board uh, supervisors heard that today and, and got that report. What does that mean for us in the city, and what are some of the implications uh, going forward in, in terms of our economic plan? Certainly. So um, there's four tiers of reopening. Uh, the city was in the purple tier, the lowest level. Uh, we've moved up a tier that takes effect tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., and that tier. Uh, effectively allows um, various businesses to, uh, to start allowing some levels of indoor business activity. So for instance, restaurants can now uh, have 25% of indoor occupancy. Uh, retail can, can increase to 50% uh, and such. I was actually going to pull it up and, and flip through it. So there's a variety of, of business activity categories that as we move through these tiers, greater levels of business activity are allowed. And just, I guess, in closure in response to the broader question, what does this do for economic revitalization? Well, obviously this allows greater level of business activity. Um, however, that's the kind of overarching uh, commentary I was making in my presentation is, you know, the, I was hired to create an economic development plan for the city. 
I will be pursuing in doing so. We've obviously had to triage and just support uh, recovery and reopening here in the uh, early part of the year as we work through, uh, you know, the full pandemic, which we are still still doing that. Uh, we're still upgrading and, and revising uh, State Street and guidelines for outdoor business activity. And I think just in that context, I would say even though there is greater level of business activity allowed, uh, a, a slow incremental increase of indoor business activity that will be allowed. I uh, will still be advocating for the for the city to retain and allow the outdoor business activity. One, just to acknowledge that uh, small incremental uh, levels of indoor business activity is still not sufficient for many businesses to cover the operating overhead um, that they uh, have, rent, uh, labor, et cetera. Uh, and then secondarily, uh, we just don't know what the consumer is, is going to do. and and if there is probably a preference, most consumers would still prefer to, to uh, dine outdoors uh, or, or have some level of outdoor activity if, if there is a preference and opportunity. So I'll, I'll put a plug in for that. That's um, not necessarily specifically your question, but just in the larger context of kind of the, the range of issues as we go through the stages of reopening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Harris. Those are all the questions I had. Uh, that one was the big one since it just happened today. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm dying just to move right to a comment, so I'll I'll phrase it as a question. This is exactly why I uh, dragged Mr. Harris to lunch, and he doesn't drag me just to pester him with this kind of stuff. So there's a section on page five, middle of the page, that talks about um, drafting the strategic plan, and it'll come back to us in looks like early 2021. And the foundation of that plan is reports that are cumulatively four years old plus, three years old plus, two years old plus. So I'm just channeling what I'm going to hear later in questions or tomorrow. And that is um, why is it gonna take another four to six months building on the foundations of these reports that we've had for multiple years to get to the launch of, of a more formal strategic plan? What, what prevents us from just going with the info we have? And I'll just complicate the question because it's still mutating also. And just, we're gonna be in this constant state of mutate. Is there, what is the benefit of getting to a formal strategic plan? Well, um, you know, a variety of, of questions there. I'll, I'll do yeah. my best to, to respond uh, and, and answer uh, those. A couple of things. One, I think it will be uh, valuable for the city to have a, a standing policy regarding economic development, uh, establish you know overarching goals. Embedded in that would be uh, a bit of a vision uh, established, so that there's collective buy-in from this council, from my colleagues throughout the various city departments, uh, and to a certain extent, the, the greater business community and business organizations that that help further uh, further these collective efforts. The city's not uh, a sole and only um, function in the area uh, initiating and, and supporting business activity and economic growth um, for our area. So that's one question. Second, uh, to the kind of the broad reference of kind of recognizing the various studies, yes, some that are, are very uh, several years old. Um, I was thinking your question was going to be, what, what, where's the relevancy of those, the, you know, the world's changed dramatically, et cetera. But one that I think there was a lot of foundational information just in, in context to, uh, you know, the commercial uh, commercial district, the retail environment, there were some, some really thoughtful um, su suggestions and recommendations. So I plan to go through that uh, with the fine tooth comb, analyze that uh, and seek feedback from a, a variety of stakeholders uh, that, that are both impacted by those strategies, but also uh, have, have great insight. And then just lastly, into to that broader kind of ending comment that you made, kind of concurrently through this process of both drafting, I'm, I'm the drafter uh, of this document. Uh, and so first off, it does just take some time to literally spend time drafting, uh, writing out sections uh, of, of the document, is, is seeking input along the way from a variety of stakeholder organizations, uh, checking in with, with council along the way as well. So I won't be presenting a final draft for adoption that uh, it will be kind of an incremental uh, development of the plan. Uh, but then lastly, obviously taking everything into context of, of uh, the world shifted dramatically uh, with pandemic. That being said, I think there's still expectation that 
will still have downtowns. They will still be centers of activity. It will still be important to, uh, you know, create a vibrant, uh, active, uh, engaging experience for residents and the public alike. Uh, and that we also identify, you know, where we have core industry strengths and where we need to invest time and effort uh, to support those industry and businesses and, and business organizations in our efforts. So hopefully that that answers uh, your fair question. Fair enough. Yep, it's fair enough. I mean, that'll give me some some answers to uh, help address what I know is going to come up. Like we already did this, and then we already did it two years later, and then we already did it a year later after that. Those are constant questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks. Mayor. Yes, Ms. Nedden, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, and and welcome to the job that you're actually <laughs> brought on for, Mr. Harris. I'm very excited for you to be unleashed, to be able to tackle this. We have been waiting for this. I have some questions, um, just a couple questions about pretty much just slide eight and, and maybe some more details. Um, so I, I think I understand about cultivating a business friendly city hall and 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 maybe you already know some of those steps that might be taken. Do you have an idea or an inkling of what some of those might be? Yes. Um, so obviously that this is one recognizing that th there's a need to improve um, business permitting processing, you know, specifically in the building and development area. Uh, but that being said, just the broader context of how can the city broadly uh, improve uh, our working relationship with the business community? So for instance, um, having, uh, you know, kind of frequent and ongoing uh, dialogue and communications, be it a communications effort, uh, be it a consistent, constant newsletter of, of process and information, but then also ongoing dialogue, be it, um, you know, standing, uh, you know, business uh, advisory or development. I do not have the specific recommendations, but what I'm highlighting here on this slide is that this is a key component, or at least cultivating business friendly city hall is improving the access for businesses to engage city hall, to respond to the needs and interest, to understand where process improvements can be made, where we can help advocate, promote uh, businesses through, through our activities. So it's really, you know, expanding upon, and the city's already made, you know, substantive steps forward, the Accelerate program, for instance. Um, but I will also be chatting and, and working with my colleagues throughout the organization to understand where there's some other uh, opportunities that we could either expand current initiatives and programs or add some additional, recognizing no one has additional budget or staffing. So we have to be very uh, thoughtful, uh, very strategic uh, in, in our efforts. But uh, I would be bringing a, a, a host of, of um, experiences, skills, and ideas forward to, uh, you know, put forward. So, for instance, just another example throughout at you, um, you know, a, a bi-local program. Just promoting uh, and communicating to residents the importance of, of supporting local business, um, keeping the tax dollars here locally, try to minimize the amount of Amazon purchases uh, online, that it has a meaningful uh, impact for uh, employees uh, working in, in uh, our local businesses and obviously uh, in, in due course, uh, you know, city tech base. Thank you. And I realize there'll be many more details later. I was just looking for the ballpark there. And then for that, um, and I just have a, a two quick questions on each of these bullet points. Mm -hmm. So on that second one, um, for creating and expanding businesses and jobs, um, Will this involve recruitment of certain types of businesses? And um, will part of the strategic plan address how to recruit or what types of businesses those might be? So um, so a couple of, uh, of ideas and, and thoughts on this. So primarily this is, uh, I would center this on as much retention of businesses and supporting businesses here, but then also in the, in the context of of attraction uh, of looking to help fill vacancies. So this isn't necessarily looking to bring in new large employers to the area. This community is for the most part built out. So it's really fill in the gaps. Uh, and one of the major gaps we have is in the downtown area. We're, you know, riding at a vacancy rate of about 13%. The rest of the city is about a 3% vacancy rate in commercial spaces. So we obviously have a, a very big hole to fill there. 
Uh, the council support with the Santa Barbara Chamber is, is a first step at that effort to, to work with the chamber and their consultants at doing some attraction efforts. But this also involves engaging downtown property owners and envisioning how could they um, you know, reposition those properties? Can they expand the range of uses working with planning? Uh, obviously we have some really large elephants in the room. We have a vacant Nordstrom's and a vacant you know, former Macy's building. Um, those are some really big vacancies. Uh, and imagine the possibility, obviously there's been lots of discussion, who knows where that goes. The city is not directly controlling those, those properties. Uh, but those could be potential uh, locations for, for new business activity. They could also be housing locations. So, so part of my role is also to be a facilitator and a liaison. So I'll augment city staff. So if projects come in, you know, that's a public private partnership, city owns the underlying fee ownership. And so I have a lot of experience in public private partnerships, for instance. So this just gives you a taste of the potential ideas of, of how that, that one goal could, could be extrapolated out into, into objectives. And then, um, thank you. And one more question on that and then to the next bullet point. But so 13% vacancy, two questions on that. One, do you know how that compares to other comparable cities to Santa Barbara? And then two, is that calculated per square foot or per business entity? Like does Nordstrom count as just one vacancy or does that count as a large space of vacancy? Sure. And then how do we compare with other areas? Yes, uh, great, great questions. Uh, I would say that, um, you know, compared to other kind of uh, heavy retail uh, districts, commercial districts, uh, the 13% the is actually probably lower than, than other areas. I, I came from Santa Monica. They, they have a, a smaller retail district, only three, three blocks, uh, three square blocks. Uh, it's not a long arterial, it's more of a square area working off of the promenade. And they're at a much higher uh, vacancy rate, for instance. Uh, and then the vacancy rates are, are in totality. So it's all of the square footage uh, of, of space, and that's what's being represented as far as vacant. Um, I have also spoken to a number of brokerage firms, and, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's estimates, right? So these, it's not scientific. It's in, you know, how you count space, and is the mezzanine, or, uh, and so the range. And so that, that, that it gives a rough range of estimate. Um, but just looking through the data, the rest of the city collectively has been at 3% uh, vacancy for years. And so that just, and that's a kind of a traditional, right? People are moving in and out of spaces as leases come to end and businesses change, sell, et cetera. But as we all have seen, you all have seen uh, through your life and tenure here in Santa Barbara, the downtown vacancy rate in downtown you know, fluctuates, it, you know, it, we, we have an abundance. Uh, it's been identified as, a, as an oversupply of retail. Uh, and over time, we do look to diversify our economy, wean ourselves off a little bit of, of the dependence on retail as it were. But at the same time, downtowns are retail dis districts. And, and so that's more like an ocean liner. We're not gonna turn that on a dime. It's gonna be a slow evolution of slowly diversifying uh, the mix of, of business activities in the downtown. So during that time, we need to support our retail environment to ensure that it's vibrant, uh, you know, because vacancy begets vacancy and, and really have to stop, stop the vacancy before it grows is, is really the important note here. Thank you. And then that brings me to the last bullet point. And so I'm really happy to see on there that we're not just focusing on, on businesses and retail, but also entertainment and culture. So sort of do you have a, a start of your vision for that or how you're doing outreach or or what that will yeah so yeah so this one is um well i think that we, we've laid the beginnings uh which is the closure of state street and um obviously there's a lot of process still to come in in talking through uh that on a permanent longer term basis uh, but that's the beginning uh, and then, you know, there's a whole host of ideas and, and, and approaches. You know, one is, again, we have a very long arterial uh, commercial corridor. It's just naturally uh, ripe to kind of be uh, defined as sub-districts. Um, and so kind of the lower section of State Streets are our entertainment district, and our midsection of, of downtown State Streets are shopping district, and our upper section is the culture and arts district with the live theater and the museums. And so that's just one. We've already seen it with the Presidio, uh, which is those property owners that have a combination of historic buildings and galleries and, and small cafes have already defined that area for themselves. 
So some of this is not necessarily the city formally doing this on behalf of the property owners, it's being a facilitator, right? And bringing ideas and, and efforts and working with our partners, downtown Santa Barbara organization uh, and others to you know, take the ideas and concepts, uh, doing a lot of testing. So downtown Santa Barbara is gonna try a Thursday. I, I think it's on Thursday. They're still looking at the dates, but a locals night of a combination of artisanal vendors in the street, trying to support the local retailers, bringing different activity to, to bring out the residents. And as I have spoken in the past, this is all resident focused. What is good for residents ultimately will be good for visitors, but we don't focus on the visitors, we focus on, on the residents and we reach out to the residents to understand if they haven't been coming to downtown, why not? And what can we do to, to change that uh, behavior and pattern? Because we're, you know, we, we want this to be ultimately the living room for the city. And, and have a host of, of activity uh, to uh, for enjoyment and, and commerce and, and activities. Thank you. So then just beyond um, districts being set or named, there will be outreach to our, not just downtown organization or downtown Santa Barbara, which focuses on businesses, but to arts communities and to Granada, UCSB, or whoever is, is uh, having art installments downtown or Cultural. Most definitely, most definitely bring, bring, bring organization. And so I've already had, for instance, a conversation with uh, Jessica Carante, Ms. Carante, the library director and, and envisioning the future library plaza and how can that add to the cultural space? Uh, it sits right adjacent to the art museum, as we know, and, and just exciting ideas of engaging the opera and could they have some outdoor performances or have community groups do pop-up performances. So just the wide range of possibilities, but to better integrate downtown with the rest of the city uh, as much as feasible and still be respectful of all the city's districts and parks throughout the city, but, but how can the city downtown help support the city and likewise, how can the city support the downtown? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Ms. Gutierrez? Thank you, Madam Mayor. First of all, I want to thank Mr. Harris for all of your support and your great work. But mainly, thank you so much for respecting the work that um, city staff has already started. And you came like a team player. You, so I really, really appreciate that. Um, how you really integrated yourself as a team player. So and thank you um, to Rob Dayton and Nina Johnson for supporting Mr. Harris in his new role. This pandemic, your role is super important and I'm sure there's a lot of pressure. So I'm gonna ask questions. I'm not gonna look back. <laughs> I'm gonna start looking forward. So my first question is on page five, um, you mentioned about the different downtown focus report like the Cosma report and the 2007 retail strategy report mm -hmm. uh, to be used on the development, a strategical economic development plan. Which other neighborhoods will you research and how will you do that um, in order to bring together that important um, information um, into this plan? So basically I'm advocating for the rest of the other districts. I, we have a lot of information for the downtown and downtown is important. I'm not saying it isn't. Um, but now as a district represent, represented, I really would like to see your plan for other districts in the city. Mm -hmm. Well, I, that's, it's a great question. Thank you. Thank you for, for asking. I think it's, it's, it's a, a multiple role. So first off, um, I look to work forward uh, with yourself and your colleagues um, to, to understand what your relationships with the commercial corridors, commercial districts within uh, within your districts to understand, you know, what ideas and perspectives that you have. So I'd like to to start there. Uh, secondarily, uh, also look to you know bring again uh, a wealth of experience. And you know, the part of the idea is that the city really is a supporting partner. Is my my experience uh, in working with businesses is the city cannot come in with the heavy hand. The city comes with an outreach hand, but the businesses need to be coming forward as well. Uh, be it the districts, an upcoming district, a commercial corridor, businesses themselves, and and be seeking some level of of support and direction, um, because if it's the city just coming forward without kind of the invitation or the interest of the businesses, 
And a lot of times I hear from businesses, they just want to be left alone. So the last time they, the last thing they want to see is government knocking on their door a lot of times. So they want to see, you know, red tape eliminated, processes streamlined, and then just they want a consistency in rules and regulations and governance and taxation because they know best how to operate their businesses and how to maximize profit. Now, that being said is if there are initiatives the city has that we um, think would be beneficial to support um, a business corridor and we would like to engage the businesses, then, then that's a different, you know, that's more of a conversational discussion. Um, so for instance, uh, just along those ideas, you know, I could see various, uh, you know, corridors that may not be organized, but the, they have an interest in organizing. So you know, I could bring uh, a forward a suggestion for them and, and work with them uh, from experiential standpoint of that they form a merchants, a, a merchant association where they organize themselves, they, you know, develop a, a common vision of how they want to promote and brand themselves. And then the city, I could say, well, well, how can the city help support that? And we can either help communicate that or we could bring, you know, technical assistance. So that's kind of just a little bit of flavor uh, of context for you to, to give you some. And I think that's less of in the strategic plan, there being a specific goal saying, we're going to do this on Milpas, or we're going to do this, uh, you know, in the funk zone per se. So I think it will be a little broader in our region, overarching in description of saying that we're here to support businesses and business districts uh, commercial corridors, uh, whatnot. And we have a variety of tools and ideas of where we can, uh, but at the same time, we're not necessarily going to be over imposing, um, you know, recommendations or suggestions because ultimately it really needs to be a combination of the property owners, commercial property owners and the businesses themselves that, you know, self-identify where they need assistance or, or what initiatives they, they want the city to, to assist them with. And obviously I work, uh, you know, in direct coordination with the council members who have that direct relationship as well. So hopefully that, that answers your question. My second question um, from the short time that I've been on council, I, I'm a big goal setter. And I think all of these reports that we have looked at for the downtown area and even for the development department, they talked about setting short and long-term goals. Um, my question is for the strategy plan that you have, um, again, going back to page um, five, do you have some short or short term and long term goals for us? Um, you know, actually action steps that you want to take that you're going to come back to council or that you're going to work um, in the meantime? Basically, I think the community members want to see actions. They want to see goals. They want to see the timeline. Um, so if you, have you thought of, you know, a timeline goal setting? Can you please explain? If you do, if not, you know, I would really like to work with my colleagues and you and with you to, to start that. Because I think the money that we've invested in all these reports, that's like one of the number one things timeline, goal setting, short and long-term? Well, it, it, to answer your question, I um, so I do not have any specific short-term, long-term goals identified. That's what I'll be working over the fall. I, I would say uh, broadly in response to your reference to the various studies, uh, it was interesting and I'll, I'll detail this out uh, in due course, but you know, a lot of the recommendations, not a lot, a portion of the recommendations or strategies or goals that were laid out in those various studies the city has already uh, initiated and or uh, uh, initiated process. So for instance, the creation of this position, um, initiating efforts for downtown. So some of the efforts that are already underway uh, are addressing some of these goals. And, and one of those is, is a very substantive one is, is evaluating State Street. And so we have a subcommittee that's evaluating, we're doing uh, direct daily, you know, weekly, uh, you know, updates and modifications to to keep that. That was more so in response to the pandemic, but it has had a dual benefit of doing some of the goals that were in these studies, which is help diversify the activity in downtown, create a vibrant, you know, engaging public um, pedestrian area. So those those are some remarks. 
Uh, the others, just as, as referenced, are also uh, in response to opportunities, for instance. So, um, for instance, there has been interest of some various commercial corridors of organizing themselves and creating special assessment districts, for instance. And so I've been having some conversations and giving some consult to that. And that, you know, whether that gets documented in the strategic plan, those are just efforts where, again, those businesses and property owners want to organize and are willing to tax themselves to invest in their in their buildings and their property, but they need the city to help facilitate. So, so I'm that kind of change agent to help facilitate that. So I, hopefully that just gives you a flavor of, of both context of effort that I will be working to outline in this plan to reassure you that many of the efforts that are already ongoing are addressing a lot of you know, established goals and objectives that were all really thoughtful. And so I wouldn't discount them, even though they might be several years old, they were, they were very consistent to economic development strategy studies uh, that I've seen and, and worked on in other communities. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Ms. Hart. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you so much, Mr. Harris. I, I hope I have what is um, a brief question. I, I almost hesitate to ask it at all because you you clearly are taking on so much with this strategic plan, but um, you know, no area of policy, be it economic development or, or any other area exists in a vacuum, right? It's all interconnected. And so one of the things I can't help but think about as I um, read the staff report and look um, at this presentation as you take us through it is, you know, we as a council have spoken really clearly about our desire for housing in the downtown core in particular. So I'm wondering about this third bullet point that's on the screen, whether you in developing this economic strategic plan are going to be incorporating housing goals, whether you'll be engaging with the housing side of the equation, um, and sort of where that fits in. And, and the answer may be, you know, that's not your purview. So I want you to know that's acceptable, but it's it's something that um, I'm certainly thinking about. And when I personally think about economic development for our downtown core in particular, that's a big, big part of it for me. So I'm hoping you can speak to that for us. Thank you. No, that's, that's a great question, uh, very thoughtful. Interesting enough, that third bullet slide, uh, earlier drafts of the staff report actually had housing in the list of uses, hub of housing, retail, entertainment, and culture. And then, you know, as I was drafting the report and really, you know, conceptualizing and projecting out uh, in relation to the strategic plan in context to the AUD program, a plug and shout out for the housing conference that's coming up. Uh, you're a speaker, I was a tape speaker on that. I spoke, spoke in that conference. You know, I came to the perspective realization that, you know, it, it really will be, it will be substantive. Housing is an economic development tool, but it will, to a certain extent, happen um, happen in, in due course and naturally. I will be a facilitator of that. I'll be an extension and and an addition to the city, the city colleague teams and planning and community development. That when business or property owners have an interest of in conceptualizing, converting their properties into housing or developing a housing project, that I'm familiar and understanding the the nuances of AUD and development, and I can give advisement and, and facilitate. But I, I just see it as kind of almost kind of uh, it is a changing element in the downtown. But in itself, um, I don't necessarily see that needing to be extrapolated as a goal. I see the AUD program being its own goal. And the city and planning staff are laser focused on that program and continuing to monitor that. And so it, it feels that anything I would be establishing in the economic development plan related to housing would really be redundant and, and somewhat out of context of really the singular focus of, of really directly focused on, on downtown on, on these other uses that really isn't a direct advocate or facilitator of, you know, envisioning alternative retail or uh, the change of retail over time, or how do we encourage greater amount of entertainment and, and really promoting the culture uh, cultural assets that we have in downtown. I, I, those seem to be of greater importance of of really uh, establishing and promoting. I think housing is ex extremely important, but I, I think it's getting its own, you know, support within the planning AUD program that doesn't necessarily be called out the strategic plan. Thank you, Mr. Harris. I think that makes good sense. And if I'm reading between the lines a little bit here, I think what I'm hearing is that it's really incumbent on us 
as decision makers to have the ability to understand and appreciate that all of the decisions we make are connected to one another and that um, decisions we make in one area can have impacts in the other. So I really appreciate that. And thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Most, most definitely. Thanks. I don't see anyone else. Let's ask if um, Ms. Gorman has any public commenters. During Vox Populi at the beginning of the meeting, Mr. Uh, Harris, there were some comments about the promenade. Um, if you were listening, it, I'm sure you were. If you weren't, take a listen. Ms. Gorman, are there people, um, people queued up? Yes, Madam Mayor, we have Tim Mahoney, and I believe it's just Mr. Mahoney, uh, Tim Mahoney and Anna Marie Gott. If anyone else would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand within the app or you can send um, me a note within the app. Uh, all right, Mr. Mahoney, please go ahead. Tim Mahoney, please go ahead. You can unmute yourself. All right, we will come back to Mr. Mahoney. Um, Ms. Gott, please go ahead. I think everybody else is left. They're watching the debate. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to follow both the debate and uh, this presentation. So let me just wing it. Uh, I have concerns about our current and continued ongoing um, uh, giveaway of our public land for private benefit. And I really do think that needs to be incorporated into any discussion. Regarding the tax base, we continue to dismantle and demolish um, affordable housing. And when we do that, we actually displace our most vulnerable people in Santa Barbara. And we are bringing in um, higher income um, uh, residents. And we're also you know, increasing our tax base. So is that one of the reasons we are going to me is that one of the results that we actually want out of this plan is to push our residents out of Santa Barbara by continually redeveloping property without ensuring that we have protected our affordable housing because we're not doing that. We really aren't. Um, I understand that by redeveloping, we do get more taxes, but we are harming the very people that we are trying to actually help in many cases in Santa Barbara. Regarding job creation, um, you know, we also need to think about development. We are developing tons and tons of cafes and wine bars and breweries and little restaurants, and they don't provide a wage in which someone could actually live here in Santa Barbara. We often have people saying that they live in Ventura or Goleta or Santa Maria and they come to work here. And it's because we're actually promoting the development of businesses that actually depend upon low wage workers. We need to rethink how we actually are going to move forward with the development. And we need to stop that practice because it is gutting, you know, um, our, our, middle, our, um, our lower wage workers and it's gutting our affordable housing here in Santa Barbara. We are pushing those people out. We are creating more pollution as they come into Santa Barbara. And we are creating an issue with overcrowding when people cannot afford to actually live here in Santa Barbara without multiple roommates or with family. So I, I think that you need to really think about economic justice. And I think that you need to, to really consider some other policies because we seem to be giving away our public resources for private benefit and they are going to the people that have the most and we're hurting the people that don't have anything. We also should look at an overlay for the mobile home and our affordable Thanks. housing and protect it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, Ms. Ms. Gorman, did Mr. Mahoney come back? Let us try Mr. Mahoney one more time. Tim Mahoney, please go ahead.
Tim Mahoney, please go ahead. Madam Mayor, it looks like Mr. Mahoney may not be on, but we do have one additional speaker. Mary O'Connor has raised her hand on this item. Okay, Ms. O'Connor, come on. And um, Hi there, you have to say. Mary O'Connor, please go ahead. I just wanted to follow up um, on the last comment because I am kind of a perfect example of someone who uh, I moved to Santa Barbara over a decade ago. Um, after high school, I got a job at a local restaurant, worked for three years, went to City College. Um, I fell in love with Santa Barbara and I over the years dreamed and hoped and very much planned that I would be able to make Santa Barbara my forever home. And over the years and now this year especially, I have with a broken heart um, had to accept that I will never be able to live in the community that I love so much because I will never be able to afford to own a home um, or even keep up with the raising rent prices with the wages that are being paid to the people who absolutely make Santa Barbara what it is, a tourist destination. Um, and I know this was all spoken on, but all the waiters and the bussers and the dishwashers and every single person who gets paid minimum wage or maybe tips on top of it, it is really sad to think that in, you know, five, 10 years, Santa Barbara will just be a place where rich people live and rich people come to to be served by people who cannot even afford to live in the community. And I'm only speaking from my experience of living in this glorious place for a decade, not even speaking to the people whose families have been here for generations and generations and are being pushed out for the same reasons. So I know that you know, this is important to the council as well, and you care about this stuff. So just uh, as a personal anecdote, um, I just really felt like it's important to make it clear that it's really heartbreaking um, to know that somewhere that you thought could be your home forever won't be simply because financially it is too expensive for anyone who makes less than a million dollars a year. Thank you. Anyone else on the call for um, public comment on this one, Ms. Gorman? Item Madam, number Madam nine. Mayor and Council, no further speakers. Okay. Well, Mr. Harris, if you would come on back, I, I guess the closing comments that I would make reflect on the lot what the last speaker had to say we talk a lot about the maybe we used to talk a lot about the jobs housing imbalance and um we do have a lot of um i wouldn't say low paying jobs though there is that and so diversifying our economy bringing in uh, businesses and opportunities for people to get paid a little bit better uh, than the service industry and i hear great ideas it's easy to have ideas and some of them are like well why don't we bring a satellite of one of the universities downtown you know they might occupy some of the the empty spaces and housing occupying those those spaces we're we're changing commercial real estate is changing and i i know you know that and um it's a good point that uh, ms o'connor brought up that that we are looking to help people, you know, create a life for themselves here, and um, and find opportunities, uh, education, and and employment. So um, we we will stay on top of you, and support you in your work. Ms. Gutierrez, closing comments on this item. Yes, um, my closing comments are: I would like to ask my colleagues if they would support me in asking. Mr. Harris uh, to provide us a detailed timeline, you know, from 
what from 20, you know, from 2020 to 2024 of um, measurable outcomes, goals, um, and also having this a strategic um, economic development plan for a whole for the whole city and not just the downtown. Um, I really believe that not just my district with having Milpas and the Fun Zone in Haley, but also Upper State where Mr. Friedman, Friedman is, um, he represents, there's La Cumbre Plaza as well and um, the Mesa area. So I would like to see if my colleagues would um, support me in that. Well, I'm certainly supportive of that. Mr. Harris, if you would come back, I'm reading page five of your report. You're talking about providing an action plan for the period 21 to 24. Yes. Um, would, how would you respond to Ms. Gutierrez? The, the next time you come back, maybe you could have something with a little more detail on the calendar? This, yeah, the strategic plan will will lay out, um, you know, annual objectives. Um, and you know, I think just in, in follow up to the council member Alejandra Gutierrez's comments is, you know, I'd like to meet with her and, and gather her ideas and thoughts. And, and again, as I was uh, re remarking earlier, you know, I think this is, is, you know, each district, each commercial district is slightly unique and, and onto itself and, and, you know, start with gathering information from the council members as to their ideas and, and perspectives. Again, I've got a wide range of programs, you know, ultimately if, if we're looking at, at, at data, ultimately, it really, what are the goals uh, that we want to achieve? So, you know, reading the data and the analysis coming into this position as it was recruited, the number one function and focus of the council and creation of this position and all the studies and efforts and investments that have been made have, have been focused on downtown. The vacancy was great. It was deteriorating. It was historically the commercial center of the city. Uh, so a lot of focus and effort uh, went into that. And so in, in establishing the goals uh, that I laid out, that's obviously one of one of those primary goals. However, those other elements of cultivating a business friendly city that benefits all of businesses and all commercial property owners throughout the city. If we can streamline our processes, make doing business with the city uh, more efficient, easier to do. Uh, that means businesses are able to, uh, you know, make investment, hire more employees, um, ultimately pay better wages through, through their efforts. And so I see that as you know a collective uh, benefit. But if there's uh, specific ideas of how we might want to promote uh, specific commercial corridors uh, throughout the city or support, um, you know, various commercial property owners in, in various parts of the city, you know, that's a little bit more of, of strategic uh, efforts and investment. And, and a lot of times you have to think of the functions, how government operates. And so we, we operate the civic civil services, right? The, the maintenance of roads, water infrastructure. And so we, you know, always look to, well, is, is there upgrades needed to be made to, to the rights of way or infrastructure? And if it's not that, if businesses are saying, no, it's, it's uh, access to capital, then we have a discussion with the financial, uh, financial lenders in the community to say, you know, what are their lending practices and are they supporting local businesses and their, their lending efforts? And if, and if the businesses tell us, no, no, it's access to, to trained workforce, we can't hire the people we need, then, then we engage the local education systems, the uh, K through 12 systems, the community college, the universities to say, hey, we've got businesses that have needs, let's to match training. So I think part of it is getting an understanding of what are the roles that local government, city government can do to facilitate business investment. Because when we say economic development, again, it breaks out, it was highlighted in the staff report. This is to support job growth, to support income growth. Uh, so to speak to, to the comments of the speakers, I completely agreed with the public comments is Long term, we do want to grow and increase uh, wages throughout the city for our residents. Uh, is that going to happen in year one? Um, probably not. You know, I think some of these strategic plans and, and goals are incremental over time. And part of that's, you know, expanding and growing and diversifying our economy. So we look to where our natural strengths, doing that SWOT analysis of where we invest time, effort, and money, and, and really addressing the greatest needs to, to have the greatest impacts. That being said, I, I work under the full discretion of the council. And so if there's, you know, other goals or priorities that the council wants me to focus on, happy to do so. 
and more than happy uh, to engage and work, uh, you know, with the commercial businesses uh, and the business property owners throughout the city and in all districts to understand what the, the needs are uh, to help support those. And I do that also in coordination with, you know, a number of business organizations and and, and neighborhood groups that are also very engaged and and, and knowledgeable of, of their um, of their business districts. Does that answer the question, Council Member? Um, thank you, Mr. Harris, but not quite. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot. I, I do want to make it clear. Sometimes when I ask questions, um, staff might feel like I'm putting them on the spot. But really, when I ask questions, um, are questions that have brought up that have been brought up to my attention from business, um, local business owners, from community members. The community wants to see something visual, you know. Um, if, so if you can come back maybe when we come back in January with specific um, goals, um, measurable outcomes, not so much goals, but measurable outcomes um, that really focus on the whole city and not just downtown. I think with downtown, we have enough information and it's just really being visionaries and thinking out of the box and really looking at what we what we um, already have, what's been working and what ha has not. Um, I would actually would like to see some measurable outcomes, a, a timeline in January when we come back. Um, so I'll give you time to talk to myself and to my colleagues and to a couple you know business owners I'm not a, an economic um, expert I'm not a business expert but what I am is I'm a local and I can tell you that the businesses here are super important and they're dear to local or the hearts of the locals and the reason for that is that not only do they make our economy, it's, they're an important uh, resource to our economy, but they're the ones that during crisis, they step up to the plate and help others. You know, they help the schools, um, especially in my district when somebody passes away and the family can't pay for their, you know, their funeral services, the, they go out to the businesses and the businesses are the ones helping the families. At the same time, um, the public, uh, the person who called in public comment mentioned it. In my district, a lot of the local Mexican real retail stores and the restaurants, the owners started to, they were workers at one point for a local restaurant or a business in town. And they learned um, how to be business owners. And they had this dream of making Santa Barbara the home. And then they started their own business. Um, and I'm giving you this feedback so you can understand that in Santa Barbara, business owners are, um, they're very dear to our hearts for, for the locals. And, and that's why you might have a lot of angry folks out there. <laughs> and believe me, like you came in a time that's super hard and I really appreciate everything you're doing. Um, so when I'm really pushing for you to look at the city as a whole, or I wanna see some measurable outcomes, it's not just, this specific council member that's saying it's the larger community. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that. We'll look forward to your next report, Mr. Harris. Thanks. Anyone else uh, before we close this item? And we do need a break. I know it's gonna be a long evening. Uh, we have two more items. I don't see anyone else popping on. You know that Mr. Harris is available to you anytime you want to ask questions or give him information. We'll close this item and we'll take a 10 minute break. This meeting is in recess.
2020. If you would read the next item <clears throat> into the record, please, number 10. Certainly. Number 10, Climate Action Plan Update and Resolution to Adopt Greenhouse Gas Emissions Reduction Target. Recommendation to Council A, receive an update on the City's Climate Action Plan and B, adopt by reading of title only. A resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara adopting a goal of carbon neutrality for the Santa Barbara community by 2035. Thanks. Is staff ready to give a report? Ms. Parento, welcome. Thanks for staying up late with us. Go ahead, please. Thank you so much for having us. Um, we're really excited this evening to be speaking to you about our updates to our climate action plan and some, setting some ambitious carbon emissions goals. Uh, so very first, next slide, I'd like to run you through a little back, uh, outline of the presentation. We're gonna go through some background, uh, not only on climate change developments, but also what the city has done up to this point. Then we're going to talk about our climate action plan update and some highlights of the new plan. We're gonna discuss setting an emissions goal and some timeline and next steps and conclude with our recommendation. Next slide, please. We are taking a team approach to this presentation. So I wanted to make sure we got to introduce everyone. Uh, covering the background segment is going to be Timmy Bolton from the planning division. I'll be providing the climate action plan update. And then Ms. Rosie Dicey will be also from planning. We'll be talking about setting a goal timeline and then the recommendation. Next slide. So with that, Mr. Bolton, if you provide some background. All right, thanks, Ms. Parento. So to kick things off, I'm gonna set the stage for why it is we are here in front of you today and provide a snapshot of where we are as a community with greenhouse gas emissions. So first and foremost, as is becoming increasingly apparent, we are in a state of climate emergency. There is overwhelming scientific consensus that climate change is real, that greenhouse gases are warming the earth, and that humans are the primary drivers of climate change. The recent report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change laid out a stark choice. We must make rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society to prevent global temperatures from rising more than one and a half degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels to hold off some of the worst climate impacts. Otherwise, we will face irreversible damage to our societies, to our economies, and to the natural world. As I heard in Governor Newsom's Climate Day discussions last week, all other issues pale in comparison to the climate change issue. Next slide. If we transition from the global scale to hone in on Santa Barbara, we find that climate change is not some futuristic issue, but one that is already impacting our community today. While this slide is by no means an exhaustive list, we've seen a rise in temperature both on land and in the ocean. And in fact, Santa Barbara has seen one of the highest increases in temperature over the last century in California, as we see in the graphic on the right. We've also experienced an increase in the frequency and severity of wildfire, drought, and extreme weather events. Without intervention, there is a long list of anticipated future impacts, such as sea level rise, infrastructure stresses, and economic impacts. Next slide, please. So what can we do about it? On a high level, there are two ways we can address the climate emergency. We can reduce emissions and we can adapt to the changing climate. The Climate Action Plan is our primary tool as a local jurisdiction for the emissions reduction side of things. From a nuts and bolts standpoint, it is the document that sets local emission reduction targets, it establishes a roadmap to reduce emissions and achieve those targets, and it provides an ancillary benefit of permit streamlining for certain projects. While adaptation is clearly related, that type of work is currently being done for hazard specific topics like sea level rise and wildfire, and is not something that is typically included in the climate action plans of today. However, I do want to note that we are very interested in looking at adaptation with a comprehensive lens as part of a future follow on effort. Next slide, please. Back in 2012, we were one of the first communities in the state to develop our first and current climate action plan. That plan represents the city's first comprehensive look at how we as a community can respond to climate change and was truly state of the art back in 2012. The plan adopted state and regional targets as they existed at the time and establish 100 strategies to both reduce greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to climate change. Next slide, please. And before we get too deep into where we are as a community with greenhouse gas emissions, it is important to know that there is no magical widget that we as staff can simply hold up into the air and wham, have the number of greenhouse gases that our community emitted for the year. Instead, we rely on advanced computer models, numerous assumptions, and industry best practices 
to estimate this information and develop so-called greenhouse gas inventories. What this slide shows here is the result of those estimates relative to a 1990 baseline. For this discussion, I'll be highlighting trends relative to this 1990 baseline because the current 2012 Climate Action Plan set a target to keep emissions below that level through 2020. The dark blue lines on this chart indicate years that we have greenhouse gas inventories, and the light blue lines simply represent the average annual change between those years, just to give you an indication of the rate of change over time. As we see on the chart, we have made tremendous strides in reducing our greenhouse gases over the years. In total, by 2015, which is our most recent inventory year, our community has reduced emissions by 28% from 1990 levels, which is something we should be truly proud of. To provide a bit of context, this reduction is roughly equal to taking 45,000 passenger cars off the road for an entire year. This reduction is also faster and greater than what was anticipated in the existing 2012 Climate Action Plan, which forecasted that we would achieve about a 25% reduction five years later in 2020. Next slide, please. So um, you may be wondering what's causing these reductions, and this slide here shows just that. In Santa Barbara, we have three broad categories of emissions. We have energy emissions, we have waste emissions, and we have transportation emissions. The colored bars represent the years that we have greenhouse gas inventories, with 1990 on the left in green and 2015 on the right in yellow. As we see in the left-hand portion of this slide, we've reduced energy emissions by 34% from 1990 levels due to our community using less natural gas and SCE providing cleaner electricity. In the middle, we see that there has been a tremendous reduction in waste emissions from 1990 levels due to successes in our waste aversion programs, which has resulted in less trash sent to the Sahigas landfill, as well as the installation of a gas flare at that facility. On the right, we see a bit of a different trend with transportation emissions, which increased 7% from 1990 baseline. This is primarily driven by a 20% increase in automobile emissions over this time period, which are the single largest source of emissions in Santa Barbara, and in total comprise about 40% of the community's total emissions. Next slide, please. When we take all of these trends into consideration, one interesting shift is in the composition of our community's emissions. If we look at the left part of the um, page here of the pie chart for 1990, we see that transportation and energy emissions were roughly proportional to one another, roughly accounting for about 40% of the community's emissions and waste accounted for about 20%. If we look on the right here at 2015 emissions, we see that uh, waste emissions have significantly dwindled in size, energy emissions are slightly smaller, and transportation emissions have grown to be a significantly higher proportion of the community's emissions. One of the takeaways here is that we've picked a lot of the low-hanging fruit to achieve our current reductions, and moving forward, transportation emissions, which have increased over time, and as a reminder, are our largest source of emissions, are going to be the hardest nut to crack. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Ms. Parento to cover the highlights of our new Climate Action Plan. Thank you. Next slide. And we'll just keep going. Next slide. So as uh, Mr. Bolton laid out, we've already done a climate action plan. We were one of the uh, pioneers of the California Climate Action Plan after Assembly Bill 32 was passed. Um, but there, there were some gaps that we wanted to fill in our new climate plan updates. We wanted to highlight a few of those uh, new opportunities. One is that we want to set a new ambitious goal. As Mr. Bolton pointed out, we have already exceeded the goal that was set in the 2012 Climate Action Plan, and it's time to, to really set our sights a little bit further. Uh, next, we have an opportunity to be a leader, not only through the setting of an ambitious goal, but also by leading by example, uh, implementing some of our strategies in our city organization, and being bold and ambitious in terms of, of our targets. Next, we want to uh, come up with a list of focused and impactful strategies. As Mr. Bolton mentioned, the previous iteration of the Climate Action Plan had 100 strategies. We found this to be a little bit overwhelming uh, in retrospect and actually wanted to hone this next list of strategies and make sure they were highly impactful and gave us the, the most progress toward the goal in the next few years. Additionally, the last Climate Action Plan did not really define accountability, didn't assign responsibility for certain strategies to, to particular uh, departments or divisions in the city organization or even to the public. 
Um, so we want to change that in this iteration. We want to make sure that there's a responsibility associated with, with moving forward on the climate action plan. We want to lay out some implementation pathways, how we could actually get this done, possibly some funding pathways. Additionally, we want to revisit the plan more frequently. It's been since 2012 that we've revisited it. And so we want to set up uh, you know, more frequent check-ins, if you will, with the strategies, make sure they're working for our city and getting us the results that we need. And lastly, uh, another major highlight is that we want to have a really robust public engagement process. The 2012 Climate Action Plan did have some public engagement, but it was fairly limited. And we really want to capitalize on the Santa Barbara Brain Trust to come up with some innovative and compelling strategies that our community feels a sense of ownership about. On that note, next slide. So we call it our revised outreach plan. We presented to the Sustainability Council Committee a, a long list of outreach events that were going to be interactive and in-person and really fun and get us some innovative uh, conversations going. And then the pandemic happened. So we had to pivot and conceive of a new virtual engagement strategy. We were fortunate that we were able to work with a Bren School capstone group on a, an outreach plan that really took a thoughtful approach to how we can make sure we engage every member of our community, or at least as many as we possibly can, to get all of the voices considered. So on that note, we've uh, developed a list of ways that we will engage our community, including kicking it off with a background video that will set context and really assess the community's level of understanding and knowledge around climate action and climate issues, and a survey. And then we'll do some climate chats, which are really two different types of approaches. One is one-on-one -on -one interviews, which will be offered in both English and Spanish, where we will both um, let the community schedule during set blocks of time, or the climate action plan team will actually solicit interviews from stakeholders we absolutely want to hear from. Next, we'll host some open forum office hours, if you will, where we will host just an open public virtual meeting that will discuss uh, specific themes around our climate action planning work. We will still have workshops, albeit virtual. One will be an open to the public idea exposition where we're really looking to design think our way into some innovative solutions and identification of opportunities and challenges in our community. We're really excited about this event. And then we'll whittle that down into some more uh, theme-based stakeholder uh, workshops where we'll get subject matter experts to compile all of the feedback we've received from the community and come up with some really innovative strategies. And lastly, we did get feedback from the, uh, the Council Sustainability Committee that they really wanted us to engage the youth in this process. And so we've come up with a number of ways to do the, that, but one that we're really excited about is the Sustainable Stories Program, where we'll solicit uh, a visioning exercise, if you will, from our community's youth, where they tell us what a sustainable Santa Barbara looks like to them 10 years from now. And we're really excited about these compelling stories. Next step. Next slide. Another new thing about this climate action plan update is the amount of collaborative partners that we have going into this process. This is a really uh, new and rapidly evolving uh, set of relationships for us, um, including the recently developed Santa Barbara County Regional Climate Collaborative, of which the city is a steering member, steering committee member, um, and the Central Coast Climate Justice Network, Justice Network, which has really given us access to um, a lot of, of voices that represent different parts of our community that we've had trouble accessing in the past. So that's really exciting for us. The city is also a member of the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, um, which is a treasure trove of information of other cities that are also undertaking not only carbon neutrality goals, but also the tough nuts to crack, as Mr. Bolton said, the transportation planning and the multimodal um, strategy approaches. And so that's a great one. And then also through our membership of the Santa Barbara County Climate Collaborative, we're a de facto member of the Central Coast Climate Collaborative, which spans from Monterey County down to here. So these are just great resources for us to interface with. Lastly, the city has been a member of the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy for some time now. And the, the thing that we really like about this uh, Global Covenant is that it sometimes feels like Santa Barbara is so small that our, our progress doesn't have a, a impact on a global scale. But when you uh, convene with this global covenant, you see that the cumulative impact is actually massive and that really helps um, support our goals. Next slide. 
Another big uh, topic of focus that we want to emphasize in this climate action plan update is climate justice. We've heard a lot about this this evening, and um, it is it remains true in the climate planning process. So climate justice is a focal point for this update. Frontline communities are often the most affected by climate change, and so we really want to develop strategies that represent and don't do unnecessary harm to those groups. We want to make sure they're considered in all of the the plans of action that we have. And so we're going to leverage those existing networks that I just mentioned and make sure we're getting as many voices to the table as possible. We're working on designing a climate ambassador program that will, uh, that will recruit volunteers from around the community to represent diverse uh, communities around within our community. And we will really focus on multilingual outreach to make sure that not anyone's voice is left out. Next slide. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Dicey to discuss uh, possible goals. Thank you, Ms. Taranto. And now we're going to pivot to um, the recommendation that was specifically included in your resolution and council agenda report of setting an emissions goal. So one of the first steps in preparing or updating a climate action plan is to determine what we're trying to achieve as a city and a community, both in the near and long term with climate action. So this means setting greenhouse gas emission reduction goals to establish that direction. And from there, we can work with the community to develop strategies to meet the goal. Having the end goal helps us determine the timing and extent of the strategies that we're going to be working on and also gives us a benchmark for measuring progress. Next slide, please. So there are different types of goals and targets that can be used to measure progress. One is a percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by a certain date, which shows some incremental change. And that's what um, was adopted for the 2012 cap. Another is to commit to a more transformational change by adopting an aspirational goal of carbon neutrality at a future date. And what this means is that carbon emissions are balanced with carbon removal or eliminated altogether. And finally, the most far reaching type of goal is carbon negative, where more carbon is removed from the atmosphere than actually added to it. Um, Microsoft Corporation is an example of one um, corporation that has committed to carbon negative by 2030, and they plan to do that by driving down their own emissions and using existing and new technology to capture carbon and remove it from the atmosphere. Next slide. Um, California was the first state in the nation to adopt a carbon neutral goal with an executive order of Governor Brown, which also requires 100% renewable energy from zero carbon sources by 2045. The state also has some specific greenhouse gas emission reduction targets and regional vehicle emission targets, and those are relative to 1990 and 2005, respectively. These targets are updated occasionally since they were first adopted in the early 2000s. And the California Air Resources Board, the Public Utilities Commission, and the California Energy Commission are all responsible for the policies and programs to meet these targets. Next slide, please. So in July, we presented the Climate Action Plan update to the Council Sustainability Committee and requested a target recommendation for the full council. The sustainability committee did recommend a carbon neutral goal by 2035 for several reasons. Um, the most compelling of which were covered by Mr. Bolton and that's that this action is necessary to limit irreversible climate um, change impacts. This goal is consistent with the state's goal and by aiming to get there before mid-century, we can show that Santa Barbara is a leader and can play a role in developing strategies for other cities to follow. Just like we were one of the first cities to have a climate action plan in 2012. So we'd like to show that we can be innovative and um, replicable. Next slide. And um, this slide is just a summary of some of the other um, either entities, cities, countries, institutions that have already committed to carbon neutrality. And uh, this is not a complete list, but it's a partial list of those that are moving in that direction. Next slide. 
Uh, so next, actually, if you need to go to the very next slide. So the next steps include um, that wonderful community engagement process and outreach campaign that Ms. Parento um, discussed earlier. And first, we would like to get started and set a calendar of events. And in the background, we would be collecting data to do an updated greenhouse gas emissions inventory and start working on those strategies to reach our goal. And of course, we'd be continuing to engage with our collaborative partners throughout this process. Next slide. So as you can see on the timeline, um, we're hoping today to set this um, emissions reduction goal and really start very soon on that stakeholder engagement process. Um, in the meantime, and in, into next year, we'd be working on all these strategies and opportunity analysis and, and doing that updated greenhouse gas emissions inventory, followed by um, peer review and environmental review and um, coming back to your council in late 2021 with a climate action plan update. Next slide. Um, actually, you can go to the, yeah, with that, um, I'll recommend that council adopt a resolution to adopt a goal of carbon neutrality for the Santa Barbara community by 2035. Thank you. Are, are you all ready for questions at this point? Thank, thanks for that um, presentation. Ms. Snedden, questions before we go to public comment questions? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just a, a quick question really. Um, well, first, I just want to acknowledge what rock stars you are as a team, um, Ms. Parento, Mr. Bolton, Ms. Dicey. I mean, it, it's amazing what you bring to the Sustainability Committee and the aggressive goals that you're allowing us and and um, supporting us and pursuing. My, my question is, I know when you originally came to the Sustainability Committee, the goal was a little bit different. And then I think we asked you to make it step up the timeline a little bit more or a lot more. And I guess my question is, how much of a hardship is that? Or are we being as aggressive as we can be with this? And then looking at the other communities, it looks like there really aren't any other communities that are setting an earlier goal. So if you could just put that timing of that goal in context for us is my only question. Okay, Mayor Pro Tem Sten, I'll start with this and my colleagues can jump in if they wanna to add to it. But um, as you recall, when we did come to your committee, um, you're right, the, you sort of um, saw a presentation for us, we gave you some options and you chose um, this goal. One of the reasons why um, we think we can get there, or at least um, I like to call it instead of aggressive, more aspirational, but um, this is the same goal that the city of San Luis Obispo also adopted. And we felt like um, they're a sister city in, in a sense. And with, in talking with them and seeing where they're going and where we can go, it's something we could achieve potentially together. It, it is not going to be easy. I will be very honest with that. And um, in order to achieve a goal like this, we will probably, um, well, we will need some other aspirational or even more aggressive actions by the state and the federal government to help us get there. And I'll see if my colleagues want to add to that. Madam Mayor and uh, Mayor Pro Tem Snedden, I think Ms. Dysdy hit it on the head. You know, it's going to be very challenging if, if at all possible without the federal government and state government really stepping up. But we do see that type of leadership happening at the state level. Um, and I think that really Santa Barbara has always been an environmental pioneer and we like to set these types of aspirational goals and we really like to meet them. And so uh, it's challenging to say whether we can in today's technological setting. That being said, advances are being made in technology and climate strategy at the speed of light. And so uh, I think that we have a very good set of starting instructions if this goal is passed and we, we could do it. Well, you're the team who could do it. So uh, thank you for answering that. Questions for Mr. Jordan? Thanks. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So I think I kind of think the question was as, answered for me, and it was nice to hear the word aspirational, because really my question was more about process than philosophy, and that is, how do you set a goal like that without knowing if you can get to it because you haven't done the work yet? And so I think you 
the answer to the question is that it's aspirational. It relies upon a bunch of other players. Uh, we know it's going to be a slog, and that's just where we're starting. Is that does that sound right? Council Member Jordan, yes, that is right. I think you know having an aspirational goal really helps us get a whole lot closer to where we want to be, regardless. But yes. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thanks, Mr. Friedman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, it's a kind of a two-part question here, and it focuses on uh, with Governor Newsom's um, directive to phase out com combustion engines and vehicles by 2035. How are we looking at that, being that vehicle emissions are one of our greatest contributors right now, the largest source, and also in terms of um, electric cars, but also community choice energy, because that if we had more electric cars, then and we have community choice energy, we have more renewables. So are we planning for that? Is that a part of our strategy? Or is that something you'll be looking at through the process going forward um, relating to kind of meeting the governor's order early and the role of community choice energy? If you could speak to that. Uh, Mayor Murillo and Council Member Friedman, I'd say that's definitely something we will be looking at moving forward. Um, one of the exercises, as was mentioned in the presentation, is updating our inventory, but we also need to then forecast forward where we're going to be in the future to achieve those targets. So changes in the composition of the cars on the road will definitely be a part of that forecast. Um, you know, the changes in the state level are definitely they need to be a, a partner in this if we're going to achieve such an aggressive um, aspirational goal. Um, so I think that would definitely be something we would be considering and looking at pursuing moving forward with this plan. Building off of what Mr. Bolton just said, the city's already very actively looking to expand electric vehicle infrastructure and access to electric vehicles. We're working with our nonprofit partners to expand the access. Um, and it's a, it's a multi-pronged approach. So one part, you're absolutely right, is getting people into electric vehicles, especially when covered or coupled with community choice energy, and we have 100% carbon free energy. But additionally, we need to look at, at ways to get people into active transportation methods. Um, you know, how can they walk into the downtown core or bike through it and improve those experiences for them? Uh, thank you very much. I'm glad we're looking at that. And that's part of the, um, the components that we're going to be studying. Thank you. <laughs> I don't see any other questions. Um, we did get a lot of emails um, support for this goal. Just to let you know, it was maybe I counted 25 of them. So people are tuned in. Ms. Gorman, are there folks on the line that look like they want to do some public comment at this point? Yes, Madam Mayor, we have a couple of people who have raised their hand or otherwise indicated they would like to speak. Okay, we're going to go to public comment and my council members can come on the screen and thank you. Very good. Our first speakers are Tim Mahoney, Michael Chiakos, and Anna Marie Gott. Tim Mahoney, please go ahead. Yeah, hello. Um, I just unmuted my phone. Hope you can hear me. So these are these are great goals, and uh, SoCal Gas, my company, and myself want you to help achieve these. One of the ways it's going to happen is we're going to bring out renewable natural gas. Renewable natural gas comes from the landfills, the dumps, the wastewater treatment plants, the sewer plants, and agricultural areas and dairies. Now I know after me, a bunch of people are going to come up, the naysayers, and they're going to say, "Oh no, renewable natural gas, man, it ain't nothing. It's it's some boutique fuel." That's not true. Anheuser Busch is converting 30% of their fleet to renewable natural gas. That means 66,000 cars a year equivalent are going off the road. Last month, Cal Farms in the San Joaquin Valley converted six farms agriculture into renewable natural gas. It's happening. Uh, you want to be a leader. Santa Barbara wants to be a leader. Look what Visalia UPS is doing. They convert, they're converting a whole bunch of their fleets to renewable natural gas. Because if you don't capture renewable natural gas, those emissions go into the air and then they fill up all those pie charts you guys been looking at. You have to capture renewable natural gas. It's essential. And if you don't believe me, call up the San Joaquin Valley 
Air Pollution Control District. They just got a deal going with uh, uh, Millings Trucking. There's 30 new trucks out there going with natural gas, renewable natural gas, and the Cummings engine. It's a reality. So, and also don't be afraid of new technology when you're direct staff to talk about new technology. Uh, fuel cells, micro turbines, you've got a whole bunch of things that can really help out. Uh, renewable uh, power to gas, renewable hydrogen, all these are ways to decarbonize the pipeline, which we work on today. The infrastructure is there. This just makes sense to do so. Lastly, let me just conclude on the idea, you know, you want reliability, sustainability, and affordability. Look at all these people that have been talking to you before on this meeting. Uh, this one lady got up there, I can't afford to live in Santa Barbara. You don't have natural gas, you're not going to uh, be able to afford a lot of things. <clears throat> and let me close on this note. After me, there's going to be a bunch of speakers coming up. These are the folks that are the coastal elites, the green elites, not my term, <clears throat> coined by uh, California State Assemblyman Jim Cooper. I'll send you a letter that he talks about. These people promote ideas. There was an article, a piece in the Santa Barbara News Press about this as well, promoting so-called environmental pro uh, projects, which hurt the, the poor, the least that are of, able to afford this. Thanks. So remember affordability when you're doing this. I know my time's up. Thank you yeah, very thanks. much. I'll send you thanks. some more information. Please, please do. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Michael Chiakos, then Anna Marie Gott, then Gregory Young, Katie Davis, and Paul Poirier. Michael Chiakos, please go ahead. Good evening. My name is Michael Chiakos. I'm Director of Energy and Climate Programs at the Community Environmental Council. And we strongly support and applaud the city of Santa Barbara for setting uh, a goal of carbon neutrality by 2035. We're really excited to see staff working on a visionary climate action plan that will lead us there. And we stand ready to assist the city and rally the community towards this crucial effort. Since the 2007 release of our blueprint for a new energy direction, which was one of the first carbon neutrality plans in the whole country, uh, we detailed how Santa Barbara County could become, and we had a catchy slogan, fossil free by 33. So it's really amazing to see this vision um, becoming real. And we've been working urgently ever since then. Our programs have helped nearly a thousand homeowners and nonprofits to go solar. Uh, we've uh, helped to support utility scale renewable energy projects. We've led electric vehicle readiness efforts and partnered with air districts um, through the Electric Drive 805 coalition. And um, we just uh, passed a thousand public charging stations throughout uh, Santa Barbara, Ventura, San Luis Obispo counties. Um, We've also been supporting policies to make it easier to drive less. Our newer programs, which you may have read about uh, on the front page of the independent, are reducing food waste, piloting carbon sequestration and regenerative agriculture strategies, and building climate resilience. In short, we know that these strategies are doable and that our community is embracing them. The impacts we've all seen of the climate crisis are hitting our region faster and stronger than predicted. We've all been impacted in some personal and tangible way by more extreme heat, increased wildfires, more powerful storms, and the most vulnerable members of our community often feel the effects the most. We simply have no choice but to quickly reduce emissions, sequester carbon, and prepare our communities to be more climate resilient. You heard that the city of San Luis Obispo adopted a similar carbon neutrality by 2035 goal back in September 2018. And last month, their council approved their visionary climate action plan. Let's join them and show that the Central Coast can pilot and further inform strategies for California, a state that is leading the nation and the world on climate issues. Thank you. Thanks. More speakers? Our next speaker is Anna Marie Gott, then Gregory Young, Katie Davis, and Paul Poyer. Anna Marie Gott, please go ahead. 
Good evening. Well, if you want an update on the debate, it was a train wreck. But now to climate a a cl a change, it's also a train wreck right now. And we're trying to do everything that we can to actually reverse what we have done to our planet. Uh, one of the things that I saw recently was that the city of San Francisco has decided that they are going to have a mandate that large Bay Area employers keep 60% of their workforce home each workday. It's going to not only help reduce greenhouse gases, but it's going to actually help with gas emissions and traffic jams. So I want to know what the city of Santa Barbara is willing to do. Are you willing to mandate that employers keep 60% of their workforce home, working from home, so that we can actually reduce our greenhouse gases and reduce traffic congestion? Look at what we've done to Highway 101. Even with the widening, we are going to substantially increase traffic congestion and traffic to Santa Barbara because of our housing imbalance. But what if instead we decided that we wanted to make sure that the employees that might be working for some of the companies here in Santa Barbara were actually working from home 60% of the time. You are asking about strategies. You're going to be implementing this. This should be part of the strategy. We should not be having people travel on Highway 101 to a job here in Santa Barbara when they cannot afford to live here. And we should not be keeping as much commercial space as we have in the city of Santa Barbara when commercial space is not what we need. We need housing. Thank you. Great. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Gregory Young. Gregory Young, please go ahead. Good evening, uh, City Council and, and Honorable Mayor. Um, this evening, my name is Gregory Young and I am the program manager with the Clean, Clean Coalition. Um, we greatly support the Climate Action Plan and we urge you at full speed um, you know, to approve and, and with a resolution to adopt the, the goal of carbon neutrality um, by 2035. Um, we believe that, you know, in order to reach carbon neutrality by 2035, the transition to renewable energy and a modern electrical grid within the city of Santa Barbara will need to accelerate. Um, while doing so, we strongly encourage sourcing more renewable energy resources locally in order to help provide energy resilience, which is something the Santa Barbara community is greatly lacking. Um, with the help of the Clean Coalition, actually recently um, some exciting progress towards this goal occurred on September 22nd um, when the Santa Barbara Unified School District Board unanimously approved the Santa Barbara Unified Solar Plus Energy Resiliency Project. This project consists of a 28-year fixed rate power purchase agreement for the, for the solar at 14 sites with full solar microgrids at six of those sites. The solar microgrids will provide indefinite resili resilience to the most critical electrical loads in addition to millions of dollars in guaranteed bill savings through the fixed power purchase for this through this fixed power purchase agreement and additional market opportunities that might arise from dispatchable solar energy. Uh, the Santa Barbara Unified School District will also enjoy millions of dollars in value from resilience benefits for free. Um, further progress actually recently includes some, some um, um, comments that the Clean Coalition and myself provided um, during a uh, planning commission, the of Santa Barbara Planning Commission meeting um, about the Quarantina Battery Energy Storage Project, um, which they approved. Um, this, uh, this project is ideally suited or situated for providing resilience to a poor area within the Galileo Load Pocket our vulnerable region in Southern Santa Barbara County and could be configured to anchor a Santa Barbara community microgrid that serves critical community facilities like the El Estero Wastewater Treatment Center, uh, Santa Barbara's main police station and multiple fire stations, the Metropolitan Transit District, and all of Southern California electrical loads in Montecito and the Mesa. So for this project, like the, for many projects like the Quarantino Battery Energy Storage Project and future renewable energy projects, we strongly encourage the city council to apply significant pressure on Southern County Edison in order to, for these projects to be brought online successfully. 
um, the Quarantina battery energy storage project could potentially be a fantastic, great first step towards a car for this carbon uh, towards this carbon neutrality goal. Thanks again for for your time and um, have a wonderful evening. Thank, thanks for staying with us. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Katie Davis, then Paul Poyer. Katie Davis, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. This is Katie Davis. I'm chair of the Santa Barbara Sierra Club and just want to thank you for ha having this hearing late at night on this subject. Um, I very much, we very much support the recommendation of the, um, of your staff and of the sustainability committee to move forward with this um, carbon neutral goal. Um, we're expecting another heat wave tomorrow and it's scary times because we know we've started to associate these extreme heat waves with more fires, uh, another record breaking fire season to over 2 million acres burned in California this year, six of the, of the 20 largest wildfires in California history, all burning this month. So it really is a crisis. Um, and this goal is really supported by the science. Um, Christiana Figueres, who is the head of the uh, 2015 Paris Climate Accord in her book, The Future We Chose, writes, this is the decade and we are the generation. So this is the time to act. So I really appreciate your, your doing this. Um, briefly, um, with do, do, all due respect to SoCal gas um, and renewable natural gas being a great solution for the natural gas we cannot eliminate, it is a fossil fuel. 90% um, of our natural gas is imported from other states. Most of it's fracked in Texas and New Mexico. Leakage along the route's a, a huge problem. Uh, methane is a potent greenhouse gas. Um, and buildings are a big source of, of emissions in the city too. So it is something that we will need to deal with. The good news is um, if you build buildings without <laughs> natural gas uh, hookups, you save a lot of money um, because you're not having to build this infrastructure and efficient electric appliances are actually um, less expensive. Your the utility bills will go down and um, are, they're healthier too because you won't have the indoor pollution you get from, from actually burning these, these gases in our houses. So it, it would actually be a win-win if we start moving away from, from gas as, a, as an option. So we can do it. Um, setting a goal is the first step, and um, we we've achieved every renewable portfolio standard we've we've set in in California. Overachieved it, um, so I'm very optimistic that this can be done. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. Another speaker. Our final speaker is Paul Poyer. Paul Poyer, please go ahead. Hello, Mayor Marillo and City Council. Paul Poirier, local architect, member of the Central Coast Green Building Council and past president of AIA Santa Barbara and currently part of AIA California's Committee on the Environment. And I'm proud to say that a year ago, the American Institute of Architects, which is the national architects organization, voted at our um, annual convention in Las Vegas of all places to make climate change the top priority for the whole organization across the entire country. Um, very unheard of, the resolution was brought up by 100 people who sponsored that resolution. I was proud to sponsor that and it almost unanimously passed there in, in the voting of all the representatives from all of the AIA chapters across the country. We realize we deal with a little bit of science and architecture and math and we know that climate change is headed our way. And fortunately or unfortunately, this year it's manifested itself in California in almost every county except for Santa Barbara. Um, we've had our fair share in the last 20 years anyway, but we realize that, you know, we really need to do something about climate change. And I'd like to take my hat off to Alalia, Tim, and Rosie for the great work that they've done. And regarding Kristen Sneddon's comment about 2030 maybe not being far enough of a reach, it seems like the local community has stepped up and beat the goals that we've set in the past. And I don't think that having a goal that's maybe realistic will hold us back from accomplishing that. The local architectural community is behind going with this and making these things zero net energy, zero net carbon. That's where all of the new tools we're working with are sending us toward because we realize that what we do has a direct impact on climate change. So um, I'd like to see the city continue to step up to Ed Masria's challenge. Back in 2008, we set a goal of exceeding the energy compliance required by Title 24 for all residential projects. 
and there was not one complaint to the building department about it. Everyone just said, yeah, that's what we should be doing. Let's do it. And you know what? We're The architects are up for the challenge. The technology is coming along. And when someone sets a goal like this, just like with the electric cars, they'll start building the units when there's demand in California for different types of chillers and HVAC equipment. We currently have many split systems that use all electric, no, no fossil fuels. So it's possible to do zero net carbon buildings. Even the induction cooking has advanced to the point where there's some commercial restaurants in San Luis Obispo um, using it in their commercial restaurants to cook the food. So in closing, I'd just like to say thank you and please support this because it's the right thing to do for us. And it's the right thing for doing to show other people how to do it as well who don't have the resources that we have to pull it off. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, was that our final speaker, Ms. Gorman? Yes, Madam Mayor and Council, that was our final speaker. We'll close public comment and it's to the council. We were receiving this report and what's ahead of us is uh, if we like this um, goal, then we have to um, adopt a resolution. So do I hear a motion or commentary? Ms. Snedden, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I would heartily like to make the motion to recommend that council adopt this resolution with the carbon neutrality goal for 2035 and um, with very much gratitude to staff for all the creativity that it will take to make this happen. A second from someone? Second. From Ms. Gutierrez, commentary from you or commentary from Mr. Friedman? I, I also just wanted to thank staff for all their hard work. Thank you. Thanks. Friedman? Uh, thanks, Madam Mayor. I, I also want to thank our staff for the great work and effort they're doing and for what they're preparing to do as well. They're going into this knowing it's going to be a, a, a big lift, but it's um, much needed. And um, this reminds me of back in 2004 when I was volunteering for Surfrider. We had the 20th anniversary uh, conference. And one of the main themes was back then it was more mitigation. Adaptation still wasn't on the tips of everyone's tongue, we weren't implementing like we are now. And, and it said in the decade from 2004 to 2014, the science was saying that if we didn't curb our emissions, that the decade that we're currently in now was going to start seeing the impacts. And I think um, that's where we were in 2004. We've seen that's where it's going. So we need to do everything we can to reduce our emissions. I'm pleased to, to see we're gonna be looking at all kinds of different strategies. And I'll finally just say that um, from the report we are in with the 2035, we are in company with Finland and San Luis Obispo. So those are two great places to be in uh, company with. So we're keeping good company. Thank you. you. You come back with a song recommendation on that one. Thanks, Mr. Jordan. I have to work on that. Um, Madam Mayor too, I will support this. Just because um, I'm a nuts and bolts guy, so there's, there's gonna undoubtedly be losers in this. There's gonna be winners and losers. There's going to be some losers and I heard staff say all the right things. They use the word ownership. Um, the process has to be a bottom up ownership driven process, not a top down process. It has to be a collaboration, not an imposition. And I, I think staff knows that and has a good handle on that. But I just want to emphasize that again, that, um, you know, when you're talking about vehicles being the number one source, but the but we have to figure out a way to address how to get me from here to there when I want to go or when I need to go going to be the greatest challenge and um, I think we're up to the task but uh, we we should we should not be willing to leave people behind in this process. Thank you. Okay, and I assume you'll be voting for the motion and you know it's incumbent on all of us to to lend a hand. We. Uh, we've started on the Modoc um, Las Positas bikeway, so we want to get people out of those cars. We just heard transportation is one of the biggest contributors. Um, I was at an event and someone had an induction cooking. Oh, that was before the pandemic. So there, there's a lot of things we can do as council members to, to um, set an example. Ms. Clerk, would you uh, uh, state the motion and take a roll call vote, please? Yes, this well, is, is a this is a motion by Mayor Pratham Sneddon, seconded by Council Member Alejandra Gutierrez for the staff recommendation. And Council Member Friedman. Yes. 
Council Member Harmon? Yes. Council Member Oscar Gutierrez? Yes. Council Member Jordan? Yes. Council Member Alejandro Gutierrez? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sned? Yes. And Mayor Maria? Aye. Okay. That passes unanimously. Thank you. We close this item with thanks to uh, Ms. Deisty, Ms. Parento, Mr. Bolton. And our final um, item tonight is number 11. If you would read that into the record, Ms. Clerk. Certainly. Item 11, automated license plate recognition policy for city operated off-street parking facilities. What lucky staff member got to wait until eight o'clock to start there, Mr. Dayton. <laughs> Take it away, sir. And, and Madam Mr. Mayor and oh. Council Members, uh, just thank you so much uh, this evening. And thank you for your patience in, in waiting for this item. Uh, we're excited. I'm excited to in, uh, introduce Ms. Clark, but I also want to tell you that this particular policy is uh, relevant to three departments, the airport and the waterfront, and they're available. Ms. Clark is going to introduce them. Uh, we've all... Uh, hopefully uh, driven on places where there has, there's no more toll booth. One of those places is, is the uh, Golden Gate Bridge. And uh, we go, go across it and get a bill in the mail. And the way that happened was uh, automated license plate recognition that uh, picked up our plate and, and charged for the trip across the bridge uh, without us stopping. Um, we get compliments all the time for saying a Wavos uh, system that they have, uh, even though it's not ours. So this is about the, the automated license plate recognition and the policy that we need before we can actually implement that in the three departments we're talking about. We need this policy because we wanna protect uh, our customers' information. So Ms. Clark, would you please uh, explain and present this policy to the council? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dayton. And good evening, Madam Mayor and council members. Uh, my name is Sarah Clark. I'm the parking program supervisor here in downtown parking. Uh, and I'm here today along with Brian Bossi and Cesar Barrios from the Waterfront Department and Deanna Zacherson from the airport, as well as John Doimas from the city attorney's office to present a policy that go on governing the use of automated license plate recognition technology in city parking facilities. So automated license plate recognition or ALPR is a system that uses specialized cameras to capture images of vehicle license plates and then convert those images into computer readable data. This data can be used for many different things, uh, but the policy we're discussing today specifically addresses the use of ALPR in parking operations and management. So in parking, ALPR can be used in addition to or in place of the traditional entrance ticket to manage access to parking lots and calculate fees due. Um, it can also be used, used in place of a uh, traditional license plate or hang tag permit for permit management. And it can be used to ensure uh, that vehicles comply with rules and regulations for your parking facility. So you, like Mr. Dayton said, you've probably already encountered ALPR uh, right here in town. The Paseo Nuevo parking garage that is located underneath the mall uh, uses an ALPR equipped access control system, which is why you see the gate go up automatically if you don't own anything when you exit. Um, ALPR, like you mentioned, is also commonly used in traffic metering, like the toll system on the Golden Gate Bridge or other toll, toll road systems. So the use of ALPR for parking management has really exploded in recent years, and most newer parking access and revenue control systems either use ALPR technology or they're ALPR compatible. And this is because ALPR can help a parking operator improve customer service. Uh, it does this by enabling contactless transactions, especially important these days with the virus, uh, and mobile payment options. It can reduce customer wait times at entrance and exit. You're not fumbling with your ticket or fumbling for payment. Um, and uh, it can reduce or eliminate those lost ticket penalties. So when you accidentally mistake, misplace your ticket and you don't have it to present upon exit. ALPR also helps parking operators improve revenue collection by preventing the abuse of, for example, complimentary parking periods and simplifying the revenue recovery process for individuals who don't have uh, money to pay upon exit. Um, ALPR also simplifies the management of permit programs by allowing customers license plates to serve as their permit rather than having to have you know, a hang tag or a sticker or a card that you have to keep track of. Next slide, please. So what we brought to you today is a policy that governs ALPR 
uh, for city parking operations in the airport, waterfront, and public works departments. We developed this policy to protect the privacy, security, and civil liberties of our customers uh, if we incorporate ALPR technology into our parking systems. And the policy does that by having a detailed data management plan and accountability procedures that we'll all have to follow. Uh, this is this policy is required of us by the California Civil Code uh, if we want to be an ALPR operator um, and to make this policy available to the public. So how will this policy pr pr uh, excuse me, <laughs> protect user privacy? It creates a firewall between the ALPR system and ALPR data and any unauthorized user or anybody else uh, who requests that data. The policy protects user privacy by establishing secure data management processes. It clearly defines which staff are authorized to access the data, and it requires that they be trained before they be given access to that system and then yearly thereafter. It also requires that the system or that any system that we adopt have the ability to log each and every time somebody accesses that data so that we can then go back at regular intervals and audit those records to be sure that ALPR data is being used only for authorized purposes by authorized persons. Um, and it prohibits the city from distributing ALPR data without a court order, and it requires us to erase all data after 30 days. So the data would not be stored for a long period of time. The policy limits access to ALPR data uh, only to designated parking operations staff in the airport, public works, and waterfront departments, and to any contractors or vendors that the city might be using for parking operations. For example, I believe the airport contracts out some of their parking uh, operations. Um, these contractors are also bound by the privacy policy uh, that applies to city staff, and each department will have a designated program manager who will be the official custodian of both the ALPR system and uh, making sure that the, uh, the policy is implemented correctly in their department. The policy we propose prohibits any law enforcement agency from accessing ALPR data unless they present a valid warrant or subpoena. And it prohibits the city or its contractors from selling, publishing, exchanging, or disclosing ALPR data for any purpose without a court order. It prohibits staff from disclosing data to anybody except the people who that are specifically listed in the policy as people who can be designated to, to access the system. And this does include other city staff. So for example, if somebody else in my department who didn't have that authority came to me and asked like, hey, was my buddy's car in the lot this day? That would be not something that we could disclose. That'd be a violation of the policy. So it really just is, access is exclusive to parking operations staff. And we can't give it out unless we have, again, that court order to do so. So today our recommendation is that council approve a policy that governs the use of automated license plate recognition tech systems for the management of parking operations in city facilities. That's all we have today. Ms. Harmon, are you ready with the question? Okay, question time. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, and apologies in advance. I have quite a few questions, but I'm really gonna try to um, cut them down and, and be as, as quick as possible. I know it's late. Um, and, and thanks so much, Mr. Dayton. I know you've taken me through this before and I've, I've heard this presentation. So really appreciate the time and effort you've spent with me in particular taking me through. Um, my first question, are, are there already cameras in place in these parking lots? Are people already um, being recorded in some capacity now? Uh, so, Madam Mayor and Councilmember Harmon, Brian Boss, you can answer that from the water department, or excuse me, waterfront. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Councilmember Harmon. Uh, we originally installed uh, a camera system, the license plate, automatic license plate recognition program back in 2014. And it is at our Harbor Main entrance and exit. It's used for ingress and egress only. And then we also have a third camera at our Los Banos exit in the same parking lot, Harbor Main, um, that is just for um, exiting uh, the Harbor Main parking lot. So uh, we have been in use, but a number of months ago, uh, we realized that um, along with uh, other departments that we need to get a citywide policy together. And so we shut that program down until we get this policy Approved. Great. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate knowing that. You're welcome. Um, okay. Great.
great. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page. So that that's perfect. The second question I have is related to the retention policy. I think that's probably also for Mr. Dayton or for Mr. Dayton rather. Um, I, I know that we plan to um, scrub the data after 30 days, but I keep coming back to this question. Why are we holding on to it for any length of time at all? And I'm wondering, do we have well, I certainly I know for a fact that there is the capacity, right, to only hold on to that information connected to the folks that don't have the ability to pay when they're exiting. So I guess my question is, why are we holding on to everyone's data for 30 days? Wouldn't it be more protective to maybe only hold on to those who don't pay? Uh, yeah, Madam Mayor, Councilmember Harmon. Yeah, I think the the departments came up with 30 days as a standard from other policies. Uh, and you're right, the, the exact, we have to keep the data, of course, the people who, who are charging the information. And I will also mention that uh, Mr. Bossi's uh, clients, if you will, for, for mm -hmm. license plate recognition are the permit holders. So the permit holder information, like if, for instance, if you have a permit in a particular facility and we have your plate to enter the, to have to make the day go up when you go up on enter, of course we'd be keeping that in, indefinitely, and you would you would have surrendered that information voluntarily anyway. But yeah, the the the, the policy. I, I would like to hear from Mr. Bossy and and whoever's from the airport. I'm sorry, I don't have their name at hand, but uh, downtown parking uh, would be open if council wishes to to have a shorter period of time. Um, I think when when for our purposes in working with Skedata, <laughs> our operator, we were down to something like. Uh, 72 hours is, is all we would need. Um, but uh, perhaps the airport has a different system with a different operator. And then uh, Mr. Bossy also might have a, a different way that they're intending to operate. So we'd love to hear from them. Ms. Ackerson, go ahead, then Mr. Bossy. Um, yes, good evening, uh, Mayor Murillo, uh, Councilwoman uh, Harmon. Uh, the airport uh, currently does not have a license plate recognition system. Uh, however, it is something that potentially in the future with airport growth, we might want to consider as an add-on to our SCADATA system. Uh, currently, our, our parking lots are just uh, a bit too small to justify the uh, investment in the technology. But for the airport, and it's typical for airports, um, the time that some cars remain in our lots is actually uh, fairly extensive. We do have cars that can remain in our lots up to three weeks. So um, in the future, you know, that that you know might be an appropriate time frame to hold on to information just because of the length of stay. I hope uh, that Madam that. Mayor, Council Member Harmon, uh, with the waterfront department, similar in, in ways to the airport, we do have liveaboards. We have about 105 liveaboards who live on their boats and they obviously their vehicles are there overnight. We have uh, commercial fishermen who go on multi-week uh, commercial fishing ventures. Um, we came up with, we previously had a 28-day program. We also, and part of that too, is we do get requests uh, on a somewhat regular basis from federal agencies and local law enforcement agencies um, for vehicle license plate information to see if a vehicle is coming in and out, people tracking human trafficking, um, Honga boats and things of that nature. So we do on occasion get requests. Um, this policy, obviously they would have to have a court warrant and and we would, and we have forwarded that information to these entities. But 30 days seems like a, a pretty industry standard for this type of issue. And it allows us if needed, again, with the court order to help additional agencies fight crime, find people, find missing people, Amber Alerts, things of that nature. Okay, thank you. Um, I personally would like to see that 30 day number changed maybe to something um, along the lines of as short as is practically practicably possible for your department. I understand it's different in the different areas, but it doesn't really make sense to me for downtown parking to be maintaining bulk data for 30 days when it's, it, it could be scrubbed every 72 hours. That's just my thought on that. Um, but I really appreciate the insight. Um, my next question touches um, a little bit on where you were going, Mr. Bossi. Um, using the ALPR program, will there be an opportunity to flag certain license plates? Um, I guess my question is, 
are we going to be searching for people who come into the parking lot um, or is that prohibited under this policy? I was a little bit confused by that. And it seems like you're saying law enforcement can search our data in real time. Madam Mayor, Council Member Harmon, um, we don't flag license plate. What we use it for now is strictly for our permit holders. So when you come in and fill out your card with your your license plate, the type of vehicle, your phone number, your address, all that information, um, we put that into our system. And when you show up within you know 24 hours, we input that data. That gate, when you pull up, the license ALPR recognizes your your license plate, opens the gate. Same way on the way out. So. We do not flag, nor have we flagged in the past um, for, for um, law enforcement agencies. It's usually an after the fact. Um, uh, law enforcement agencies, hey, there was a Ponga boat that we spotted off the coast. Um, did you, it, it has this license plate number, did it leave the facility? So it's things of that nature. So we don't flag it ahead of time. It's usually, it's always been after the fact. And, Matt, and Madam uh, Mayor, Council Member Harmon, this policy, should you approve this policy tonight, uh, there's there's no flagging for law enforcement. There's a, a firewall between the data and law enforcement. However, if they do have a court uh, warrant or no court order, uh, then then we will be we'll have to give it over. But aside from that, no, they cannot go in and look at the data. Great, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, and another great segue to my next question. You know, not all subpoenas and warrants are the same. Um, some certainly are related to imminent community health and safety issues. Others are not. And I can imagine a scenario where a judge might grant a subpoena in an employment case, for example, to provide data about where an employee potentially was or wasn't during a day. And, you know, we don't have to, as a matter of law, automatically grant every subpoena. You can fight a subpoena. And I'm wondering if we've considered um, and fight, I shouldn't have used that word, um, maybe something a little more pleasant than that. Um, but, but we can decline to provide information and go forward with that process. So have we thought about whether we want to have just a blanket policy saying we will comply with every subpoena, no matter you know what type of case and no matter what information they're looking for? And is that something that we might want to consider? Because you know, I'm not sure that I really want this data to be used in an employment law case or in a, a divorce matter, for example. Certainly, I understand the efficacy in a public health and safety issue, but there are subpoenas that can be granted in any number of issues. So I'm wondering, uh, I see Mr. Doimus, maybe you can yes. answer that. Madam, Ma Madam Mayor, Council Member Harmon, um, the policy is written as such as here's the instance that we would give the data. It doesn't necessarily mean definite, right? So. We would give it if we had a, a, a warrant or subpoena issued. Uh, the police department, a lot of times for their records, for example, get uh, you know uh, subpoenas for, for for their records. And a lot of times, if we feel it's uh, overbroad or unclear, um, you know we have pushed back. Uh, to fight it in court would require obviously a motion to quash. Um, it's very unusual to take those standards, uh, but uh, we you know there are times where at least you know subpoenas are unclear, so we do that. But the policy is written is to explain. Here are the situations where we would turn it over. We're not turning it over for commercial activities. It's when we have a court order to do that, to do so. In a warrant, you would normally see it a lot of times um, for, for criminal type cases. That'd be the, the, the mechanism, um, you know, um, under civil would be a subpoena. And like I said, we can at least push back we have for the police department if the subpoena is broad and vague. And do you expect that we would push back similarly in civil matters were we to be subpoenaed for parking data in these departments as well. I guess I'm just trying to make sure that we, we would take that same approach because it's not clear to me. I think we'd be consistent with the with in terms of subpoena if they're very vague or unclear or broad. We would have that same same approach. And then if we push back what we say to them instead of actually us fighting it, then get a court order. Tell a judge to tell us to give it to us then if we think it's really fought vague or, or, or broad. Awesome. Thank you very much. And I'm coming to the end of my questions. Um, two more quick ones. Does this mean, I think this one's for Mr. Dayton. Does this, um, if we if we approve this policy and move forward to put in ALPR technology into our various, various parking lots, does this mean that we'll be um, phasing out our hourly parking attendance? And how, what's that, the relationship between this program and 
those hourly workers. Uh, Madam Mayor, Councilmember Harmon, yeah, that is a, is a sad truth. Um, the, the bottom line is that the, the, the parking industry, the way we're running it with people and the rise of minimum wage, and then the challenges now of COVID and whether we will have the right customer uh, base to, uh, to carry on is that we, we, we need to change our financial model. And uh, an LPR does afford that. If, if we were going to keep someone in the booth uh, indefinitely, then we, we would probably not uh, make that expenditure. Uh, that is for the purpose and it keeps the customer service while uh, higher and probably not going to be as good. Um, and it's kind of unfortunate. Those kiosketeers are amazing at what they do and, and they do much more than just take people's money. Um, and so it's kind of a sad truth. Um, but uh, if, if, if the only reason to have L LPR is to, is to make that financial change. Okay, great. Well, I appreciate everyone's patience and the information. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Any other questions from council members? We'll see if Ms. Gorman has anyone waiting in the wings to make public comment on this item. Madam Mayor and council, we do have three public speakers on this item. So okay. we'll hear from Anna Marie Gott then Trey Pinner, then Richard Solomon. Thanks. Anna Marie Gott, please go ahead. Good evening. I just want to point out that the waterfront has been operating an automatic license plate uh, recognition system uh, for a number of years, and they really shouldn't have been without a policy since 2016. This is when this meeting should have occurred. Um, I, wanted to point out that this is not actually explained if we are going to have an entire database downloaded uh, if someone sends a subpoena. Uh, the ACLU has determined and documented automatic license plate readers as being used for, for deportation um, under ICE. They simply got a subpoena and they were able to access at the automatic license plates read a data and was, was able to target people for deportation. So I, I don't believe that the wording is strong enough regarding subpoenas. And we should strictly prohibit any uh, release of the data if it is not for criminal activity only. Um, regarding the amount of time that we're keeping the data, that really needs to be rethought. We can certainly dump most of the data after 72 hours, but maybe we need a separate policy um, for the waterfront and the, uh, the um, airport because of the duration that some people leave their vehicles. Um, you know, this also does not provide us with really good information on how the city uses the data because, or accesses the data because the public has no information. You can easily run a report that does not have someone's uh, license number or even the state in which their license was issued. And you can see the number of attempts that people actually uh, looked at on a daily and a weekly and a monthly and a yearly basis to see if staff is trained when they're accessing the information, how often they access the information. You know, this is information that should be posted automatically, but we seem in this particular policy have to put it in a black box. Even though individuals whose uh, liberties have been um, abused by the, by the city are able to sue, well, how would they know if there was a problem if we're not posting any, any information about how the city accesses the information? It would be really great for us to give some comments tonight, not pass this particular um, policy tonight, but keep this and bring back to um, another council meeting when we actually can get people to the meeting. Right now we're, we're on a, a nine, almost nine o'clock at night on the night of the debate and we are still do not have great access to our Hispanic community. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Trey Pinner. Trey Pinner, please go ahead.
Trey Pinner, uh, please. There you go. Yes, thank you. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Uh, appreciate having the opportunity to speak with you tonight. I know it's been a long night for you. Um, uh, I am the chair of the downtown parking committee, and I want to just first of all thank staff for their excellent pre presentation and the amount of work they put into this process. I know um, as far as downtown um, parking it goes, we've been looking at uh, automatic license plate recognition for quite some time, learning all the new technologies that, that are out there that might be able to help our parking system uh, ultimately do better for our community. So that's what we are excited about. And we're excited that this uh, policy is before you. And um, we did want to note that this policy was brought forth to the downtown parking committee at our last meeting. And we did unanimously agree to forward it or request that you approve it. We feel the policy has been well thought out and that staff has taken the appropriate measures. We did uh, question uh, many of the things that Ms. Hartman spoke about and actually had the language uh, increased to stronger language regarding the requirement for a subpoena for any release of information. So we feel that this has been uh, thoroughly vetted uh, with the city's attorney's office. Uh, and we are just excited to look towards the opportunities that uh, license plate recognition might afford us as we deal with lots of issues of parking. We've talked a lot about residential needs and parking areas and how can our lots be used more effectively? Um, I too am uh, sad by the idea that maybe someday we would not have the kiosk folks working for us. They are fabulous part of our city, but uh, we do also get very good comments, as Mr. Dayton said, positive remarks about the great parking operations that they think we run at Paseo Nuevo. And uh, that's pretty much uh, based on the license plate recognition system. So we ask that you uh, move forward with at least approving this uh, policy, which would be a first step to someday maybe looking at the idea of LPR in our lots. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Pinner, um, our final speaker, Ms. Quick. Our final speaker is Richard Solomon. Richard Solomon, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, oh, thank you. Okay, I'm not, without seeing myself on the chair, on the monitor, I don't know. I have three concerns. I'm not sure you got my letter I sent in last night. Um, I'm coming from a civil liberties perspective and I'm concerned, first of all, in terms of privacy. It's already been touched on. One of the key ingredients uh, to, to, to protect privacy is the requirement in the legislative uh, scheme of regular audits. In section um, 1798.90.53, um, subdivision th uh, C, 2C, um, it requires, you have to have a process for periodic system audits. It doesn't say what periodic is, I would say it should be quarterly, at least once a year. There's nothing in the report about that. It just says we will do them. There's nothing in detail. That's a serious omission and it doesn't comply with the law. Um, the second issue is the cashless system. Uh, I know it, it makes sense. I know you wanna automate this process, but there's a lot of people that don't have credit cards. They don't have bank accounts. They live in a cash economy by choice or by force. And, and it's, a, it's a good 10% nationally of, of house, US households. My guess is it's probably larger here, uh, but that's a guess, but it's, it's, it's gotta be at least around 10% of our population. These are our neighbors. They have a right to use our parking lot just like everybody else does. And if you don't provide a way for them to pay without using a credit card, uh, there's a serious civil liberties violation there. So. It doesn't necessarily have to be a person in a kiosk. That's the best way, probably, uh, at least the easiest way for them. But uh, maybe a debit card or some machine, like there's, like if you see on the waiver, there's a machine you put your parking card in, you pay it. If it can take cash and give right the right change, well, maybe that's a maybe that's a solution. But if you, it's not in this report. You're not addressing it. And yes, this only deals with the installation of the machine. But we know which way it's going. So why wouldn't you wanna put in there now a finding or a conclusion or a requirement that the cashless system be dealt with now? In some way, it becomes part of the eventual plan that gets to you when they propose a cashless system. Why wait 
why not get them, force them to start dealing with it now because it's going to become inevitable. So that's what I've got to say. Thank you very, very much for uh, this, the, your, your, your uh, deliberation on this. Thank you. Is that the final person, Ms. Clerk? Yes, Madam Mayor, that's our final public speaker. Okay, we'll close public comment and let's start with the question of using cash or not. Um, who's who's still out there, Mr. Mr. Dayton? Anything Thank about you, that? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, uh, the cash uh, system and taking cash is a very big deal. We we're up to seventy percent credit card, and we're increasing all the time. Uh, we've really uh, pushed the. Uh, the public to be contactless with our, our folks. And when we're exchanging cash, there's a lot more contact uh, and, and potential spread of the virus. Uh, you know, that this season will end, uh, we're hopeful. The cash machines that we would buy, uh, and that we could do at, uh, and buy those that are at Pasena Huevo are very expensive. They're, they're $50,000 each around. And then you have to buy quite a few of them because our system is pretty big. So that, if we did go that route, it would be a, a, a very uh, high expenditure. We could come and work with the council on that at this time. Uh, however, the options are really good. So for instance, um, people who want to deal in cash can come in and load their uh, load a card in our offices uh, and or send in a check and load a card in increments of uh, 10 and $20 and they can have a card and use that card upon exit. Uh, so there is a way of paying cash and then alternatively and this is might be a question in the council's mind because what happens when someone you get you get to the uh, end of the system and should we have lpr in the future and there's no kiosketeer and you don't have a credit card or your credit card actually fails to operate well that's the that's the same instance with the, that golden gate bridge analogy and there's uh, because what will happen is the office will notice that the queue is backed up. They will speak with the motorists from the column and ask them uh, what their issue is. And they say they don't have cash. Then we immediately just open the gate and let them out. The uh, LPR has their uh, license plate and we send them a bill and they can, uh, they can pay that with check or PayPal or other, other they could even do it with Venmo. So um, there are ways to do, uh, do, to do cash uh, prior to and after the experience. Okay, and I know that's not what's ahead of us, but I'm glad that we had that discussion. I was gonna move on to a different question, but Mr. Doimus, Mr. Bossi, did you have something to add on that topic? Yes, I would add at least, there were two issues. One in terms of at least the, a period, the policy calls for periodic audits. If council so chooses, we can be, actually really specific in the policy, for example, doing quarterly. Uh, and the second issue in terms of uh, Council Member Harmon's concern about uh, subpoena issues, we can also be more restrictive and just limit it to the word order. And, and that would be it. So if someone issued a subpoena, we'd say you'd have to get a court order on that. So we can also address those two changes of council wishes to, to do that. Thanks, Mr. Bossi. Madam Mayor, uh, just to address the, the idea of uh, fewer kiosketeers. As I mentioned in my original comments, we are, would only use this at one lot currently, and that's our Harbor main parking lot. That parking lot is has a person in the kiosk 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So it's a, it's a significant, significantly different operation in that sense than downtown parking um, where those lots uh, close in the evening, late in the evening. So we don't anticipate any employee loss. Um, we would retain um, our folks to work in that space. Again, 24 seven, 365 days a year. Uh, as part of that, <clears throat> I don't anticipate us moving towards a cashless program. Uh, again, different operation, different clientele. And that's why we have a person there to accommodate our customers. So I just wanted okay. to clarify that for the council. Thank you, these, these are good. These are good points. Let me ask one last thing before I go to Mr. Jordan, and that is if we, it seems like you've made the argument, um, Harbor and airport, that you need to retain the information longer than 72 hours. So can we do that where this ordinance would say yes to airport and, and Harbor, but the downtown parking lots, the information would have to be erased after 
72 hours. Can we split it up like that? You're there, um, Mr. Bossy. Can you answer? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Here I go. Um, I think that would be acceptable. You know, the, the way we started this policy was to come up with one overarching policy. We do have three different departments, three similar, but yet somewhat different operations. Um, but I think little caveats uh, such as retention um, would suffice, at least as far as the waterfront's concerned. I can speak for Mr. Dayton or, or Ms. Ackerson. Maybe they can answer that for their, their departments. Ms. Ackerson, please. Uh, yes, good evening, Mayor Murillo. Uh, this would really be a, an eventuality for the future because, as I said, we don't yet have such a system in place. Um, but uh, thinking to the future uh, when we might have such a system, um, that, that seems like a, a reasonable accommodation. Okay. Mr. Dayton, would that work to allow airport in the future, harbor uh, to retain the information for a month or 30 days? and you all get 72 hours worth of retention? That works for us, Madam Mayor. Okay. Well, I mean, this seems to be, and I'm getting ahead of you a little bit, Mr. Jordan, if we were to say yes to quarterly audits, making it that it had to be an order, not just a subpoena, and then the differentiation and the retention of information, would that be acceptable to the council? Just a thought. Okay, Mr. Jordan, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just wanted to go backwards on that question on some of the only deals with cash. Um, Rob, Mr. Dayton, if you'd come back on, you know, the, the way you answered the question wasn't really a person who deals in cash either. In Venmo, you have to have a bank account. PayPal, you have to have a bank account. I think the crux of the question was a guy who's just dealing with a life of cash, you know, and that kind of thing. So would the system allow for you to sell a prepaid card that then so if you didn't have a credit card you could just slide the thing in and go out and you'd realize you have to rebuy re restock the credit card the card now and then okay that's the answer then to the question on what does a guy do only with cash thank you thank you madam mayor any other um response from the um council Ms. Harmon, would you be uh, accepting of the um, recommend of the policy if we made those changes that I suggested? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, I think those are really great changes. And are we making comments now? Yep. Okay. Yes. I just, you know, thank you. I'll, I'll be brief. I think my concerns were clear with my questions. You know, I I am extremely uncomfortable as a general matter. Um, not specifically related to this, uh, though this is included, with the sort of general erosion of our privacy rights um, via mass data collection. And I, this is a movement toward bulk data collection. And in some ways that makes us feel safe, right? That because it's bulk, it's anonymous or that we're not being tracked. We're just you know one data point amongst many, but it's really not anonymous. It's not anonymous at all. And I think it's really important that we do the work that we've done here tonight to think about how legislation actually limits our ability to move through the world with any privacy um, and to do so without the monitoring of our comings and goings. So, you know, this was a challenging topic for me. It's one that I feel really strongly about um, the importance of our privacy and protection of our data. But I also do want to point out that we're talking about government property here. These um, parking lots are, are government property and people make the choice to come on them. So it's a little bit different, right, than if we were instituting this policy in a neighborhood or in a place where you don't have a choice or you have some expectation of heightened privacy. So I do want to point that out. People are actively making the choice to come into these parking lots. And I, I do think that's important for us to keep in mind. Um, but I think those three points that Mayor Mario, you pointed out, making it an order, quarterly audits, and then specifying um, the changes to the time frame for scrubbing the data um, as short as is practical or as often as is practicably possible, uh, no, not to exceed 30 days or however it works. I think those are really important changes and go a long way. Um, to making me feel more comfortable in in um, 
in regards to the privacy concerns. So um, with that, I would be happy to make the motion to approve this policy, incorporating the changes that we've discussed here today. Um, appreciate the work of, of everyone on this. Uh, Mr. Friedman, is that a second from you? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, I'll second it and just wanted to echo the comments of Council Member Harmon. Um, you know, the privacy concerns and those members of the public are of great concern. As an example, I don't think a lot of people know this, but out at UCSB at Campus Point, they recently changed that you now have to put your license plate in to park there to go to the beach or else you get a ticket. And we don't know what's going on with that data. It was never announced to anybody. So I can, it is unnerving to a lot of people out there now to go to the beach, you have to put in your license plate. So I think based on council member Harmon's comment, these are uh, very reasonable and accommodations to address some of those concerns um, with the, the amendments that, that were just put forward. So I will um, support it and second the motion. Okay. Very good, but let's clarify that part about the data retention. Ms. Clerk, are you taking notes so you can read it all back? My my suggestion was airport and harbor, 30 days, and then the downtown parking lot, 72 hour scrub. Does anybody have any objection to that? Mr. Dayton, does that sound right? Okay, getting a thumbs up. Ms. Gorman, are, are you there? And a thumbs up from the airport. Thanks. Okay. Yes, Ma Madam Mayor and Council, I have the motion by Council Member Harmon, seconded by Council Member Friedman for the staff recommendation with the modification of a 30 day retention for airport and harbor um, and a 72 hour scrub, I'm sorry. Yes, 30 day retention for airport and harbor and a 72 hour scrub for downtown parking lots. Were there further additions to the motion? There, there were two, I think, um, Madam Mayor. Um, the first was in terms of access and audits. Uh, language right now in there is periodic, but we make it more specific. Uh, and in that regard, and we would do it quarterly. And the other part, instead of taking over subpoena, just strictly court order. I think those are the other two changes you wanted. Uh, thanks, Mr. Dormus. I was muted. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. So, right. oh, oh, so, so is is quarterly too often? Would 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 two times a year be better? Or, like, I mean, I just pulled quarterly out. Or no, maybe you were the one who suggested quarterly, Mr. Dormus. I did. I I was the one that threw that out there, Madam Mayor. But. Okay, so quarterly audits and then the word order instead of subpoena. So if, the, if so, if we get a subpoena, we tell them to go back and get an order. Is that how it works, Mr. It would just, the, the policy would just say an order, and if someone filed a subpoena, we would say we can't do that. You would need a court order, and we would show, let's say, a law firm, here's the policy. We just don't would respond to a subpoena on the issue. Okay. Ms. Gorman, is that all clear? Thanks. Thank you. So I have um, the motion for a uh, staff recommendation with modifications of a 30 day retention for the airport and harbor departments, a 72 hour scrub for the downtown parking lots, quarterly audits, and to have the policy refer to orders as opposed to responses to subpoenas. Very good. One moment. There we go. Councilmember Harmon. Yes. Councilmember Oscar Gutierrez. Yes. Councilmember Jordan. Yes. Councilmember Alejandro Gutierrez. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sneddon? Yes. Council, uh, Council Member Friedman? Yes. And Mayor Maria? Aye. Okay. I think we're good with that. Um, it will close this item. We'll go to Council Member assignments. It's awfully late. If you can hold it until next time, 
Okay. We'll, we'll go ahead and uh, adjourn this meeting. Thank you. Meeting oh. adjourned. Oh. Hallelujah. <laughs>